Rejected by the Pack. Written by J. Lynn Wolf. Digitally narrated by Eleven Labs. One. Come on, Ember, maybe it won't be so bad, Darby said. An unimpressed snort escaped my control as I strolled along the well-worn dirt path with my best friend at my side. We were discussing my upcoming wolf birth ceremony. And despite her comforting tone, Darby still seemed almost as nervous about it as I was. I breathed in the scent of trees and decaying leaf litter. A weak late afternoon sun cast pale, heatless rays down on the Greystalker lands, a region of dense forests and majestic mountains tucked far away from any of the human cities near the coast. It was usually rainy at this time of year, although today, the blue sky was only marred by a few fluffy white clouds that held no obvious threat of even a light drizzle. Why? Do you think the elders have been lying to us all these years about how painful this is going to be? I shot back. Darby grimaced and shrugged. I mean, maybe? You know how these wolf tales get spun out of control. It could just be one of those rite of passage things, couldn't it? They get you so freaked out that when it's over, you end up torturing the next generation of wolves with the same bullshit stories just to get a bit of revenge. I glanced at her skeptically, not sure if I found her optimism refreshing or infuriating. I somehow doubt that, I answered. My 21st birthday was looming, which meant that my days of puphood were well and truly coming to an end. Not that I'd been able to enjoy my adolescence like most of my peers had done. Oh no, the carefree camping trips in the mountains, the long nights of swimming in crystal clear river waters, the cozy sheltered dens filled with affectionate parents and siblings. Those were for the legitimate, accepted pups in the pack. Not for me, not for an orphaned outcast. I was, not to put too fine a point on it, as low in the pack hierarchy as it was possible to be. I'd never been adopted by another family once I lost my parents, as was customary for orphaned pups. Instead, the pack had forced me to live on the fringes of their society from the time I was ten years old. They kept me alive, but barely. Mostly, I'd been expected to survive on my own. I set the bitter memories aside as Darby and I wound around the corner of the low dens on the eastern side of the path. The rough-hewn wood that made up the walls and pillars blended so naturally into the landscape that the buildings pressed deep into the side of the mountain weren't immediately noticeable to a casual observer. They were there, though, an entire town hidden among the forests and hills. The Greystalker Packlands might have been the only home that I'd ever known, but I felt little attachment to the place. If it hadn't been for Geneva Padfoot, the eccentric woman who kept a curio shop on the outskirts of the town, I probably would have ended up sleeping under trees or bare, rocky overhangs for most of my young life. Even years later, the thought made me angry. But there was no use obsessing over it. Not now. For years I'd agonized over why I was so hated within my own pack. When I'd been little, I'd worried that maybe I'd done something to incur the wrath of everyone around me. My sensitive, childish heart had broken every time a pack member turned their back on me in disgust. It wasn't until I'd grown older that I'd managed to shake off the grief that came with perpetual rejection. In the end, the why of it really didn't matter. And besides, the eve of my first shift wasn't exactly an ideal time to rehash all of this in my mind. You're obsessing over the past, aren't you? Darby asked, breaking into my dark thoughts. I shot her a sidelong glance, aware that my musings must have been showing on my face. With practiced ease, I smoothed away the tightness around my mouth and eyes, firmly pressing down the emotions that had, for a moment, bubbled too near the surface. Of course not, I said. Anyway, the wolf birth ceremony can't be any worse than the rest of this, can it? My best friend stared hard at me clearly not buying into my attempt at bravado. Darby only shook her head at my sarcasm. You know, in a way, I'm jealous of you. Taken by surprise, I let out a bark of laughter. Jealous? Of me? Have you lost your mind? No, Darby insisted, 
shooting me a quelling look as we passed a dense clump of evergreen trees. It's just, your ceremony is in two days and then it will be out of the way. I frowned. Out of the way? What's that supposed to mean? Darby let out a frustrated sigh. I have to wait another eleven months until my wolf birth, and right now that feels like forever. I want to get out of here, Ember. My pace slowed, pine needles crunching softly beneath my feet. What? Darby asked, looking back at me. You're still stuck on that, huh? I asked, coming fully to a halt. Darby turned to face me, a faint flush coloring her pale cheeks. You sound like you disapprove. I shook my head at her and resumed the trek toward Geneva's shop, where I had an informal job tracking inventory and keeping the books in exchange for room and board. She huffed and fell into step with me once more. It's not that I disapprove, I explained, for possibly the hundredth time. It's just that I don't think the plan will work. Darby sighed wistfully. It could work. Just picture it. We'll both have our wolf births and transform into gorgeous tawny wolves, beautiful and with undeniable grace. We'll leave this pack and join another one, where we can find mates that are somewhere in the middle of the pecking order. Mates that are honest and not cruel. It will be a fresh start and a way to climb up from the bottom rung of this pack. I met her eyes with regret. I wish it were that easy. And, I don't know, maybe you should try it. But there's low in the pecking order. And then there's whatever I am. I don't think that kind of fresh start is in the cards for me. News traveled, even between packs. With my background, I was pretty sure my only shot at salvation would be to get away from wolves completely. And that, unfortunately, was something far easier said than done. Darby grimaced and offered, Well, on the positive side, at least there's nowhere for you to go but up, right? That gives you some freedom in a way. You think so? I asked tartly. Darby snorted in dark amusement and gestured at me. Well, look at you. Who else could pull off hair dyed half black and half platinum blonde? Who else in the pack is covered in tattoos? I'm not covered, I pointed out. They're just on my arms. With a laugh, Darby shook her head at me. Still, you disappear and come back with tattoos and no one bats an eye. If I tried that... Your family would kill you, I finished for her. While Darby was quite low in the pack, she still had a place. Her family might be poorly regarded, but her parents wouldn't tolerate a sin like sneaking off to get tattoos or a human dye job. And she had a point. I could do those things. I could steal away in the night hitchhike to the nearest city, panhandle for human money, and do the kind of stuff that would drag another shifter's reputation through the mud. After all, what else was the pack going to do to me at this point? I was already paying the price for my mother's unforgivable crime. Adding a few minor crimes of my own was no big deal by comparison. Raucous laughter drifted down the trail from the direction we'd just come, cutting into my thoughts. Darby and I both froze, turning to look with a sinking sense of inevitability. Oh, no. Darby let out a low groan. I set my jaw and said nothing. We both knew those voices. They'd haunted nearly every step of our lives for years now. The gang approaching us was a bunch of pack bullies with hardly any brains to share between them. Unfortunately, being well-fed and cared for within the pack meant that despite their disgusting lack of intelligence, they were all well-muscled and fast. God knew I'd personally tried time and time again to outrun them without any luck. The group rounded the corner, their attention focusing on us with all the intensity that wolves could muster, even when in human form. But there was one saving grace. Darby might be a target, but I was a much better one. Darby curled in on herself, her shoulder pressing against mine. She was trembling nervously licking her lips in unconscious reaction to the coming confrontation with more dominant pack members. Go, I told her, not wanting my only friend in the world to get hurt when it could be avoided. I'll be fine. Just get out of here. Unfortunately, while Darby might be terrified, she was also intensely loyal. 
I can't leave you here alone, she said, a tiny quaver audible beneath the words. The group was getting closer, their pupils blown wide with the exhilaration and glee of the hunt. I recognized that expression and knew it didn't bode well. De-escalation wasn't in the cards today. This was going to get physical. You can't do anything, I said, setting my feet shoulder-width apart as I faced the approaching gang. Or rather, you can. Go get Geneva and bring her here. Please, Darby. My best friend bit her lip, obviously conflicted. I gave her a pleading look, and she finally broke, herring off toward the shop where my ancient and wrinkled boss would be found. Of course, by the time she got back, it would all be over. But if it got Darby away from here safely... She darted off the road and deeper into the woods before disappearing from view. Smart girl. I watched her go, resignation flooding me. The gang descended, and just as I'd hoped, they didn't spare a glance after Darby, who was already long gone. What are you doing out here? Thelen, the boldest of the group, spat, stalking closer to me. I thought I told you to keep your ugly carcass off the public roads. I stared up at him, my expression cool and emotionless. Of course, my lack of reaction only served to infuriate my attackers. Thelen stormed up and grabbed my jaw, jerking my head to the side so that my eyes were pointed away. Don't presume to look at me, you filthy mutt. He snarled, his foul breath puffing against the side of my face. I will strip your sorry hide of every piece of skin you have. I doubt you could figure out how, I ground out my voice distorted by his vice-like grip. Have you ever so much as caught a rabbit, you useless sack of shit? The blow that hit the side of my face seemed to come out of nowhere, and I landed in a heap on the ground at the feet of my attacker. A moment later, I was surrounded by angry shifters kicking and pummeling me, even as I curled into a ball to protect my vulnerable stomach. I couldn't draw breath. Time to teach this mutt a lesson! said a shrill female voice. It was Star, a particular nemesis of mine in recent years. I bared my teeth, a low growl boiling up from my chest even as more blows rained down. I don't know why they're even bothering with a wolf birth ceremony, someone taunted. You're going to end up the runt of the pack. You'll be half starved with patches of fur missing. Assuming she can even shift at all, Star added gleefully. For all we know, her bitch mother fucked a human. I shuddered as the taunt hit home. Don't listen, I told myself firmly. None of this matters. It's just one more shitty day like any other. I could feel rivulets of blood flowing down my face. More filled my mouth, where my teeth had cut into my cheek. I spat it out, taking advantage of a sudden lull in the attack. At first, I didn't understand why they'd stopped. Then I felt the wind rise. A strong scent of rain swirled across the roadway. The trees creaked and swayed above us. It felt like electricity was crackling through the air, making the hair on my neck stand up. Where the hell did that come from? One of the bullies demanded, looking at the trees bending and swaying around them. The sky's still clear. Through my ringing head, I was aware of the confused murmurs around me but I only cared that they'd stopped hitting me. The breeze seemed to clear my head, the inexplicable storm scent strange, but also strangely familiar. I breathed carefully around bruised ribs. It was only a brief reprieve, though. Star crouched beside me, grabbing me by the hair. I yelped, unable to stifle the noise. Stop gawping at the sky and come hold her down, she snapped. Hands closed on my arms and legs, even as I struggled. Star grinned maliciously and pulled a knife from her belt. My stomach turned over. But Star still had a handful of my hair, and she had something else in mind other than gutting me, apparently. This black and white rat's nest is disgusting, she said, lifting the blade. It's coming off in chunks. How do you like that, bitch? I snarled and jerked helplessly, poised to spit in her face. What are you doing? An authoritative voice cut through the sound of wind and mocking laughter. 
The odd atmosphere grew even heavier, this time with alpha power. Everyone froze, me included. No one answered the barked question, but the hands holding me down fell away. I rolled onto my back, intending to get up, but instead I just stayed there. The newcomer approached, striding confidently down the road to stop just a step or two shy of me. I dropped my gaze, aware of the others doing the same. It was Kai. Kai fucking Greystalker, the Alpha's son, heir to the Greystalker Packlands. Because of course he would be the one to see me like this. Anger at the unfairness of it all warred with a desire to sink straight into the ground and disappear. I looked up at him, almost despite myself. He was tall with dark, tousled hair that fell almost to his shoulders. His sharp, dominating gaze swept over each of the bullies, who all seemed to wilt beneath those piercing, amber-colored eyes. He stared them down, not saying a word. Two of my tormentors began to whimper softly and back away. The rest shifted uncomfortably and lowered their gazes in respect. With my attackers held at bay for the moment, I pushed myself ungracefully to my feet, staggering a little as dizziness threatened to engulf me. Darkness grew at the edges of my vision, making me think this might not have been such a good plan after all. A hand gripped my elbow, tugging me to the right. That was when I realized I'd started to fall over. My bleary gaze followed the hand to a wrist, an arm, and finally up to its owner's face. It was Kai. His calloused fingers were warm against my arm. My skin tingled where he touched me. A shiver skittered down my spine, my pulse picking up. Liquid heaviness settled low in my belly, ridiculous and unwelcome. With difficulty, I ignored my body's betrayal and shook off his touch, looking down to avoid meeting his deep amber eyes. My obvious embarrassment must have convinced Kai that I'd recovered enough to stand on my own. He turned back to the bullies, who were all looking deeply uncomfortable beneath his piercing alpha glare. Movement drew my attention to the side of the road. Two of Kai's friends lounged nearby, leaning against the trunks of the largest trees. They looked simultaneously bored and amused by the spectacle. I assumed they didn't think I was worth all this trouble. Still, Kai was the Alpha's son. If he wanted to involve himself in the affairs of the pack outcast, it was his right to do so, and neither of them was likely to contradict him. The silence on the road deepened to truly uncomfortable levels. Finally, Kai dismissed the gang of bullies with a small jerk of his chin, which sent them all scurrying away. Are you all right? He asked in that low, resonant voice of his. I swallowed, trying to raise some moisture in my mouth. Uh, yeah. You're bleeding. Kai observed. I swiped at the rivulets of blood on my face. The bleeding was already starting to slow, although the stinging was growing to a deep burn. It'll heal. Kai nodded, and I saw the barriers go up, as though my lowly status had suddenly occurred to him. He started to move away, back to his friends and whatever they'd been doing before they'd gotten drawn into my shit show. But then, he paused. Good luck on your wolf birth. I suppose I'll see you there. He threw over his shoulder. Wait, you're coming to my wolf birth ceremony? I asked stupidly. Kai turned back to me. Sure, it's my family duty to attend all wolf births. I blinked, irrationally disappointed by the answer. Oh. Honestly, I didn't know what else to say. I should probably thank him for saving me, or at least saving my hair, but somehow the words wouldn't form. And then it was too late. They were gone. Ember. Darby's voice distracted me as my friend hurried up and took me by the arm. Did you bring Kai here? I asked in a dull tone. Yeah. I ran into them before I got to Geneva's place. She looked me up and down, a sad expression sliding across her pretty features. Come on, let's get you cleaned up. I let myself be chivvied toward Geneva's shop. You were right, I told her faintly, my body stiff and aching. Maybe we should both leave. Nothing could be worse than this. Two, 
After a few dozen strides of being frog-marched, I set my heels and balked. Darby, let me go. I'm fine, I promise, I insisted, brushing off my best friend's clinging fingers. You're all bashed up, Darby said. Her eyes were wide and sad. I'm sorry I ran away like that. I shrugged my indifference, hiding a wince as I tried to wipe the sticky blood off of my hands. No use us both getting beaten into a pulp. I thought you were going to get Geneva. Face growing red, Darby chewed on her lip for a moment. I was, but I, uh, ran into Kai instead. My glare was accusatory. So, you told him what was going on? He made me. Darby's voice was awestruck, and a dreamy look slid across her face. I snorted and started walking again, a bit disgusted by the whole thing. Still, I dropped the issue. Of course Darby had told Kai everything he wanted to know. You didn't say no to an alpha. We reached Geneva's shop. Unlike most of the dwellings in the Greystalker lands, it was a freestanding building made of logs from the forests, rather than being built partially underground. The roof, instead of the ferns and grasses growing over the other homes in the area, was made of crumbling shingles. The windows were mostly dark in the growing shadows as afternoon gave way to evening, but a few of them were lit from within by insubstantial, flickering candlelight. Geneva bustled through the door leading to the back of the building as soon as we stepped inside. What happened, child? She demanded, taking in my many gashes and bruises. Even though the bleeding had already slowed, I could feel that dirt and blood caked my face, despite my best efforts to clean up. Nothing important, I answered in a curt voice. Geneva's expression hardened, but she asked no more questions. Within moments, she had a warm bowl of water and a wash rag in her hands, and she was leading me to the stool that always stood in the front corner of the shop. Was it the same group as before? She asked as she wiped my face. The cuts stung and burned, making me wince and try to pull away. Geneva's kind, wrinkled face was close to me, her expression reproachful. I refused to answer, not wanting to talk about it, so Darby muttered the story under her breath into Geneva's ear. Well, it's a good thing shifters heal so quickly, Geneva stated, wringing out the now red and brown washcloth. A few of those gashes are deep, but they should close up soon. Thanks, Geneva, I answered, standing up and stretching. I could feel my muddy clothes cooling against my skin. I looked around the shop at all the trinkets, the potions standing in dusty bottles, and the tightly wrapped bags of tea and coffee. It looked like everything was fairly well stocked, which meant I would have an easy evening at least. I was grateful, since I didn't feel up to doing much. Did anything odd happen while this group was attacking you? Geneva asked. I looked around at her, startled. No? Wait, what do you mean, odd? Geneva seemed to hover on the edge of speech, her expression turning wary. After a moment, she waved the words away. What a strange question, I thought. But as much as I wanted to dismiss it, there was something. There was the wind. A storm that wasn't a storm. Still, that was nothing to do with me, or what had happened with the bullies. Pushing those thoughts to the back of my mind, I shook my head and slouched behind the counter. Geneva narrowed her eyes at me, but said no more on the subject. Well, just think. Things will be better after your ceremony. She offered. I'm sorry this has happened to you, but it will be over soon. Perhaps you'll even find a mate. I smiled and agreed mechanically. The truth was, I didn't believe the Greystalker pack would like me much better as a shifted wolf than they had as a pup. Still, it might be useful to have the power to transform. Even though my wounds were knitting themselves back together fairly quickly, I knew I'd heal even faster and more completely as a wolf. At least I had that to look forward to. As for finding a mate, though, I'd rather stab my eyes out with a rusty spoon than mate anyone in this godforsaken pack. The morning of my wolf birth arrived before I really felt ready for it, with howling wind and cold sheets of rain falling in the forest. 
I'd been awake most of the night, dreading the part of the following day when I'd be forced to stand exposed before the pack alpha and anyone else who wanted to gawp at me. There was a long tradition that the one experiencing the birth would be escorted to the ceremony by people dear to them, family or close friends. I had asked both Darby and Geneva to attend my wolf birth, since there really wasn't anyone else. Darby was ecstatic. She'd never been to a wolf birth before, being the youngest in her family, and she was eager to learn what she could expect from her own ceremony. Geneva had seen many, many wolf births over the years, I was sure. Her ancient eyes held none of the curiosity and enthusiasm that Darby had from the moment she hurried through the door, dripping wet. Is this part really necessary? I grumbled as Geneva and Darby stripped the clothes off of my lean frame. It's traditional, Geneva replied, shrugging one shoulder. It's part of the process. No one will think twice of your nakedness. I pressed my lips together. I had never felt as comfortable with my own nudity as other members of the pack. As everyone over 21 had the power to transform their human form into a wolf form, it wasn't unusual to see someone coming out of the woods naked. It was normal. So why did I always feel so awkward? Geneva's fingers traced down my tattooed skin, a strange expression on her face. What? I asked defensively. After a brief pause, Geneva answered, Nothing. Are you ready? It sounds like the rain has stopped. I took a shuddering breath and then let it out with a nod. Yeah, might as well get on with it. We stepped out of Geneva's small den. It was located right next to her shop, and it was where I had lived for the last ten years. I used to think the cluttered halls and musty air were stifling, and I often dreamed of the spacious, bright den that I might have had with my parents. Not today, though. Even as we all stepped out onto the trail, the cold, wet earth seeping between my bare toes, I wished heartily that we could return to the comfort of the humble den that had become my home. Wrapping my arms around my naked torso, I shivered as I hurried towards the ceremonial hall, my escorts in tow. Like Geneva's shop, this hall was a freestanding structure, a long roof on poles, mostly open on all four sides. There was a roaring fire burning in the stone fireplace at the center. The smoke wafted out of a hole in the ceiling. I hesitated just outside, feeling the sudden urge to bolt into the trees rising up from my core. It was like a scream that I could barely contain. Geneva seemed to sense my thoughts and gave me a firm push towards the center of the ceremonial hall. I took a tentative step forward, then glanced back to make sure that Geneva and Darby were following me. They were. We all sat down on one of the benches near the fire, its warmth radiating over my skin. I shivered, pressing my arms against Darby and Geneva, who were sitting close on either side of me. I kept my eyes locked on my feet ignoring the babble of voices that surrounded me. It felt like half of the pack had turned up to watch my wolf birth. I stole a look around, trying not to be obvious about it. Forget half. Practically everyone was here. Great. But what could I do? Other pack members were always invited to wolf births, although it was traditional to only attend the ceremonies of your close friends and relatives. None of these people were my friends, except the two sitting as still as stone on either side of me. And the hard faces of the other onlookers reminded me of that fact in no uncertain terms. They're here hoping for a show, I realized. They're not here to support me. They just think something gossip-worthy is going to happen. Anger bubbled inside my stomach. Are you okay, Ember? Darby whispered, leaning her head close to mine. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. After several minutes, the crowd stopped growing and most were making their way towards seats on the benches behind us. A man walked forward, dressed in ceremonial robes. He had a necklace of stone beads draped around his neck, resting over his breastbone. He wore a ceremonial headdress as well, with shiny black feathers and braided strips of shiny material mixing artistically with his hair. He was tall, with broad shoulders, 
a powerful man who had passed on his piercing intensity to his son, Kai. This was our Alpha, Bardolf Greystalker. Even though I had not yet been forced to take my wolf form, I could feel the instinctual desire in me to drop my gaze and shy away from him. To distract myself, I glanced around at the other spectators. The members of the bully gang were in the crowd. Of course they were. When they saw me watching them, they pulled grotesque faces and laughed uproariously. Good luck shifting, one of them called. There's a betting pool, you know. I'd say you won't be able to manage it, mutt. I threw the guy a flat look over my shoulder and turned back towards the ceremony. Kai had arrived. He'd kept his promise to attend my wolf birth. I nodded cautiously to him in acknowledgement. It didn't exactly make up for the fact that my gang of tormentors had shown up to ogle me like a hunk of meat, but it was something. The tempo of the ceremonial drums was picking up now. It felt like they were counting down to the end of my old life, the life that was about to be pushed away forever. I'd left my black and platinum blonde dyed hair loose, instead of tying it up in a bun the way I usually did. Crossing my legs and wrapping my arms tighter around myself, I let it fall over my chest, serving as an additional cover over my exposed breasts. Out of the corner of my eye, I felt Kai watching me. Something about his eyes on me made me feel hyper-aware. I didn't like it. That was ridiculous, though. He'd been to tons of wolf births. He must know the ceremony inside and out. Why would my naked body be of any more interest to him than someone else's? Yet, I could feel his gaze lingering on me. A flush of embarrassment stole over my skin. For one wild second, I imagined pulling my hair back to expose myself further, just to shock him. Before I could make any bad life choices, Bardolf stood up and raised one commanding hand. The gathered crowd fell silent immediately. We begin, he said in a deep voice. Despite the gravel of advancing age, it was still powerful. I didn't know what to do, so I sat motionless between Geneva and Darby. When Bardolf turned and faced me, he gestured with one finger for me to get up. Before I could consciously make the decision to obey, my legs lifted me to a standing position and were carrying me to his side. Embarrassment flooded me. It looked like I was in a huge hurry to kowtow to this leader who'd never raised a hand to make my life easier. I was the rebel not some simpering pup hoping for scraps from the Alpha's table. I resented the power that had sent me scrambling to his side. The ceremonial hall was quiet as I looked up into Bardolph's face. It was lined and craggy, but not nearly as wrinkled as Geneva's. Yet, in some ways, they looked alike. Maybe it was the eyes. Both of them had dark brown irises, almost black. Bardolf placed his hands on my shoulders and pressed me towards the ground. I couldn't help but tremble in fear, knowing what he was about to force me to do. Every one of us was born with the wolf deep in our spirits. It was innate, nothing that we could control. During every wolf birth ceremony, the Alpha would reach within himself and, using his own wolf's power, call the pup's wolf forward. As Darby had discovered the day the bullies had attacked me, you didn't simply refuse a command from an alpha. The ceremony I was about to undergo was a rite of passage into adulthood. It was terrifying and exhilarating and painful. And it was happening. Now. I squeezed my eyes tightly closed, my breathing shallow as I felt Bardolph's large hands on my shoulders, holding me steady. Frantically, I scanned my body, wondering what I was about to experience. What would it feel like? How would I know it had happened the right way? All the worries that I'd tried so hard to ignore for the last few weeks came spilling out of me, almost making me vomit on the floor. A cold sweat broke out across my forehead. And then, as though there were another presence inside of me, I heard Bardolph's deep voice calling to me. There weren't any words, precisely, but I knew without a shadow of a doubt that it was my time to join him. My body convulsed as a ripping sensation tore down my chest. I brought my hands up, wanting to squeeze myself back together, like I could somehow press my very soul back into my ribcage. My spine contorted and I fell to the ground, unable to control my arms or legs. I face-planted in the dirt, 
screaming in agony as my entire body twisted, wringing my soul out like a dish rag. That part was expected, though still unwelcome. What I didn't expect was to rise on four powerful, lean legs. A scream burst from my throat, but it wasn't a human sound that filled the hall. It was a hair-raising howl. As the sound rose and fell, I became aware of all the other voices of my pack. I could feel their presences, bound to me now that I was wolf as well as woman. Something buried deep inside me sighed in satisfaction. It felt good to belong. I'd never felt anything like it in my life, even under Geneva's occasionally maternal care. This, I realized. This is what I'm meant to be. I will never be alone again. The bullies who had tormented me for so long were looking decidedly surprised. Maybe they were disappointed I'd been able to shift. No doubt they'd hoped for a more exciting show than I'd given them. I glanced down. How odd it was to see myself standing on four feet. I'd thought the shift from only having two legs would be uncomfortable, but it felt as natural as breathing. I shook my body, feeling every muscle tense and relax under my skin and fur. Ember. Bardolph called to me, using his human voice. Ember, come back. A thread of panic shot through me. What? How am I supposed to do that? I don't even know how. Yet the command in Bardolph's voice was unmistakable. As a wolf, I felt my legs start to buckle beneath his dominance. As I'd transformed from my human form to the wolf, I'd felt like everything was expanding inside me, expanding to the point of exploding. Now, as I fought to obey his demand, I imagined pulling myself inward, it felt like I was trying to shrink my soul back into the boundaries of my human body. It didn't work. I could feel my heart racing with the strain. There was a slightly derisive snicker and I bared my teeth in the direction of one of my tormentors. I'd make him pay. Ember. Bardolph said again, his voice more insistent. Come back. At his words, I sucked in a huge breath and collapsed onto the ground before him. I'd managed to turn myself back into a human, but I was panting and sweating from the effort. It was almost as painful to transform back as it had been to shift in the first place. Shaking, I pushed myself to a sitting position and found Geneva's eyes. She gave me a knowing look, seemingly pleased. A moment later, Darby was next to me, helping me into a sitting position. Ember? Her voice dropped to a whisper with the crowd watching us. Your wolf? There's something... different about it. Of course there is, I thought, resigned. Why am I not surprised? What's wrong with her? I asked, dreading the answer. She's half dark gray and half white, Darby continued excitedly, oblivious to my less than enthusiastic response. It's like your hair, kind of. I've never seen anything like it. Now that I'd recovered somewhat, I scanned the crowd that had come to watch my ceremony. They were looking at me, most with their eyebrows drawn together in surprise. There were looks of open hostility on some faces. I tried to shrug it off. It wasn't like I had any control over my wolf's color. A flash of pain burned across my chest as I moved my shoulders. I yelped, putting my hand over the puckered scar that had suddenly appeared on my breastbone. No. A mark? I have a fate mark? Oh, shit. I glanced down and sure enough, a dark red symbol had etched itself over my heart. The objective side of me was curious. Or maybe I was just in shock. The new scar was roughly triangular, but with each side extending beyond the triangle's corners, ending in a stylized curl. I blinked. This had always been a possibility, but not one I'd taken very seriously. Some people developed a fate mark at the time of their wolf birth, a sign that their fated mate was out there, somewhere, waiting for them with an identical mark. I'd seen several marks over the course of my life. For whatever reason, some people manifested a mark, and it would take them years, if not decades, to discover their soulmate. If they ever found them at all. Darby gasped as I moved my hand away from the aching scar, it's a fate mark, she all but shouted. 
I winced. There was absolute silence for the space of a handful of heartbeats. Then voices broke out, much louder than the muttering from earlier. My hand clapped protectively over the mark again, trying to hide it even though it was too late. Bardolph moved to stand in front of me. Show me. He commanded in a soft voice. I wanted to disobey, suddenly and irrationally convinced that letting him see would lead to disaster. I couldn't resist his command, though. As I lowered my hand, Bardolph's eyes widened. His mouth fell open, and a choked noise came out. It sounded a bit like he was being strangled. A Triskelion? That is your mark, he demanded, his eyes boring holes into me as I cast my gaze submissively downward. I lifted one shoulder and let it fall, confused. Of course it was my mark. It wasn't exactly the kind of thing you could fake, right? It was just suddenly there. He'd seen it happen. Why would he start interrogating me like this when I was huddled naked and shaking at his feet? He stepped closer and reached down, his fingertip brushing the tender skin. Maybe he actually thought I'd faked it after all? I didn't pull away, determined to show him that I was not a cowering runt. Yet the touch on my bare skin unnerved me. I shivered involuntarily, and he pulled his hand back. This cannot be, he muttered. He turned towards Kai abruptly. Kai stared past his father, his burning gaze fixed on my chest, his face expressionless. Slowly, his hands rose to his shirt, unbuttoning the top of the garment. His amber eyes never left me. As my gaze trailed down his beautiful, smooth skin, I realized in a rush why Bardolph had suddenly started acting like I'd sprouted a second head. A triangular fate mark identical to mine sat over Kai's heart, etched into his chest. Three. This was obviously a bad joke. And yet, the evidence was right before my eyes. I was staring at Kai's exposed chest, the twin of my mark visible between the edges of his shirt. We were... fated to be mates? How could that possibly be? The wolf inside me, newly freed, was wild with excitement. I could feel her instinct to leap about, letting her uncomplicated joy spill out into movement. That part of me wanted to race to Kai's side, but my legs and arms were still weak and shaking from my first transformation. I couldn't even muster a smile in response to that upwelling of wolfish glee as I crouched on the ground, looking up at the Alpha's sun for some kind of reassurance, for answers. The sweat of my recent exertion ran down my sides in chilly rivulets. Kai stared into my beseeching face for a long moment, his expression conflicted. He took a tentative step towards me, as though unaware of the movement. He raised one hand, only to pause when he realized what he was doing. He looked at me like I was some kind of dangerous temptation, his breath coming fast and hard. Then he clenched his fist and dropped his hand to his side. A thrill of horrible dread flashed through me. My breath caught. I reject the bond, he said hoarsely. The words held no meaning to my overwhelmed mind. I stared with utter incomprehension at Kai's pale face, his square shoulders. Now that I fully recognized him as my mate, I could feel the emotional war inside of him. His thoughts were roiling. I could sense his conflict as though it were my own. The wolf inside me cocked her head to one side, confused by his reaction. But the human part of me knew. I felt myself wilting as reality returned. The Alpha's son could never be my mate. I was an outcast. A freak. I wasn't good enough in his eyes. Bardolph's face was impassive, though I could read the relief in his body language. He could never have allowed such a mating to go unchallenged. But if Kai had fought him over me, it might have torn the pack apart at the seams. Little danger of that, it appeared. I tried to be relieved as well reminding myself that I'd vowed not to mate any of the assholes in this pack after the way I'd been treated growing up. The logic rang true, yet the wolf inside me refused to be tamed by this knowledge. I could still feel her desperate need to be close to Kai, to rush to her mate. The Alpha straightened, addressing the murmuring onlookers. 
Let all here bear witness this bond. Bardolph gestured between myself and Kai. Is tainted. I order the marks removed at once to put an end to this unfortunate mistake of nature. My wolf snarled, her anger curling my upper lip in defiance of the Alpha Command. As far as she was concerned, this wasn't putting things right. This was an assault to nature itself. I knew the politics of the pack would never allow Kai to be paired with me. But my wolf was enraged by the interference. Around us, the wind rose as though echoing my stormy mood. My eyes found Geneva. She looked thoughtful as she gazed back at me, but she didn't rise or draw breath to speak. At a sharp word from Bardolf, Kai's two friends, who had witnessed my rescue from the bully gang, stepped towards me. Their expressions, too, were conflicted. While it wasn't unheard of to reject one's mate and have the fate marks burned away, it was not a common practice. In general, the pack held the spiritual connection between mates as a nearly holy bond. Apparently, that didn't hold true for pack misfits, though. As soon as Jason Finn stepped toward me, Darby, who had been crouched motionless by my side in shock, jumped to her feet. Don't you touch her! She snarled at the far more dominant males. Stay the hell away! Dimly, through the growing distress clouding my mind and making everything around me feel hazy, I was surprised by her boldness. My sweet, timid friend was standing protectively over me. Her hands balled into fists as though she might take a swing at the first shifter to lay a hand on me. Darby hadn't gone through her wolf birth yet. The two males approaching me vastly outranked her in the pack hierarchy. Yesterday must have had a bigger impact on her than I thought, I mused in a dazed, distant sort of way. The pair of males glanced at each other, just as surprised as I was, and then turned towards Bardolph for guidance. You do not get to touch her! Darby shouted, not backing down even as tears streamed down her face. I sighed, feeling a great weariness slide over me. Maybe it was the weight of inevitability, but I felt like I could sleep for a week and still not be fully recovered from this day. My wolf whimpered, begging me to fight for this. There was no point. Using the last of my strength, I struggled to my feet, swaying. I grasped Darby's shoulder tightly, grateful beyond words to her for being brave enough to defend me. Darby, I murmured in her ear, my eyes never leaving Kai's face. Don't. It's better this way. It'll be all right. No, it won't, she raged, looking up to meet my eyes. How will this ever be all right? You're Kai's mate. You can't let them do this to you. I clenched my jaw, willing her to understand without making me say the words. I'm nothing to them. There's no way they can allow this mating bond to exist. I have to accept this. Just like I've accepted every other damned thing in my messed up life. I couldn't say any of it aloud. The spectators were all watching the exchange with gleaming eyes, waiting for more drama. Clearly, they hoped to see Jason Finn tear Darby to shreds for her insolence. Regardless, this shit show would fuel the pack gossip for years to come. That much was crystal clear. Something in my expression seemed to convince Darby to let it go. She lowered her gaze in reluctant acceptance, biting her lip as she stared at her feet. At my urging, she backed away from me as Jace and Finn continued forward, flanking me. Jace proffered a length of soft cloth. I stared at it for a long moment before accepting what turned out to be a simple robe. Relieved to finally be able to cover myself, I slipped my arms in and pulled the fabric tight around me. Without a word, Finn jerked his head. I followed them away from the ceremonial hall without protest. They walked on either side of me like bodyguards or maybe prison guards. I felt trapped, even as the cool wind wafted across my face, smelling of rain. Around us, the moss dangling from the branches of the trees blew softly in the breeze. The sun peeked through the canopy in fits and starts, lighting random patches of ground. In an area usually shrouded in clouds, any glimpses of the sun felt special. It was comforting, as much as anything could be under the circumstances, as though the weather sensed my despair and was determined to prove that light and life lay beyond my present darkness. The day had started stormy, I reflected, 
looking up at the sky. Inside me, my wolf rumbled her discontent and confusion. I hadn't noticed that my feet had stilled until Jace cleared his throat. I glanced between him and Finn. Their expressions were stony, not angry or aggressive, but definitely full of resolve. Are we in a hurry? I asked quietly, wanting just a bit more time to take in the beauty of our surroundings before what was to come. They glanced at each other before Finn grunted. We have orders from the Alpha. I know, I told him. I just didn't think he'd given a timeline. They didn't answer. Jace laid his hand on my shoulder. The grip wasn't rough, but he turned me towards the dirt path and guided me along it. Thoughts of escape flashed through my mind, courtesy of my unhappy wolf, but I knew that it was useless to try. I wouldn't make it a hundred yards before they caught me. The dirt path was well-worn and wide enough that we could walk comfortably abreast, not touching. We wound our way around the base of the mountain, which served as the backdrop for our little town. The natural landscape was sharply different than the harsh cities of the human world, with their angular metal, glass, and polished stone. Our structures were low and organic, most dug deep into the side of the mountain. We had kept with the tradition of our ancestors, first building dark dens that were no more than holes. As we progressed as a society, however, the dens became more elaborate with bright lanterns, fireplaces, and many rooms along the outer wall, where windows brought in the natural light. Tall wood pillars framed the doorways. As space decreased, our kind also started building houses similar to that of men, but few chose to live that lifestyle. It felt too much like a betrayal of our history. The air smelled fresh and clean. I breathed deeply, never having truly appreciated the soft fragrance until now. How many times had I plodded along this path, my head down and mind occupied with the many injustices of my life? I'd never stopped to take it all in. Was it the wolf inside me that made me more aware? Or was it the approach of the end? Because that's what this was. The end of something nebulous that never even had a proper beginning. Unaccustomed tears pricked at the back of my eyes, and I studied my feet so that Jace and Finn wouldn't see my emotions welling up. I was holding it together, but barely. I'd tried to tell Darby that this would be for the best, and I repeated the argument to myself. It'll be over soon, Ember, Finn said in a soft voice. My head jerked up, causing the tears to spill over. Finn was looking down at me, obviously uncomfortable. I had no response. Sure, he was probably right, but my inner wolf whimpered in distress. I longed to let out a piercing howl of misery and isolation on her behalf. We were about to be torn from our mate forever. He'd already chosen, and apparently in his mind, a burning iron brand to the chest was more desirable than I was. Where are you taking me? I asked. The smithy. Jace answered in a clipped tone his pace quickening. He was obviously eager for this journey to be over. I didn't blame him. I didn't understand how it all worked. But I'm sure with the pack psyche, the two stoic figures walking alongside me were at least peripherally aware of the agony my wolf was feeling. We rounded a sharp bend, and I saw the familiar shop in the midst of a clearing of trees. The blacksmith, Gerard, maintained the shop and offered services to all of the Grey Stalker pack. He and his extensive family did not live in the hut, but in one of the larger dens nearby. As we came into view, I could see him standing out front, drinking from his cupped hands over a basin of water. Sweat plastered his gray-brown hair to his forehead. The muscles on his right arm stood out more defined than the left, giving him a slightly lopsided appearance. We walked toward him, my every step more hesitant, until I felt Finn press me forward with his hand at the small of my back. The Alpha has need of your service. Jace explained in a low voice, his eyes intent on the blacksmith's face. My near nakedness and the fresh fate mark on my chest must have been a giveaway as to what was going on, because he gave a wordless nod before he turned and walked towards the back of his hut. He walked through a wide door to where his forge stood empty. 
No fire burned inside it, but he pulled a burning brand from a nearby fire pit, his hand wrapped in a thick leather glove. The kindling inside the forge burst into flame. It'll need to heat up for a bit, Girard said gruffly, leaning back against a table that stood nearby. Only then did he allow his curious gaze to play over me. I felt faintly sick, and my hands were trembling. I wrapped my arms around myself, trying to block out the world around me and hide the betraying tremor of fear. I have to be strong, I thought, squeezing my eyes shut. But I wasn't strong. I was just me, and this was just another blot on the landscape of my life. I would never escape my position in the pack, and wishing so would just make things more difficult for me. My wolf rumbled her disagreement, the feeling resonating through my chest. My head snapped up at the sound of approaching footsteps. I knew who it was without looking. That presence felt like it had a thread running straight to my heart. Kai. He looked pale, with dark circles under his eyes. Had those always been there? His jaw was clenched. A muscle at the corner ticked convulsively, but I doubted anyone but me noticed. My eyes followed his every move, hungry for him, longing for him despite myself. I could feel the emotion boiling inside him again, our connection growing stronger by the second. For a fleeting instant, I got the strangest feeling he might stride forward and stop all of this. That was a ridiculous thing to think, though. From what I knew about Kai, his sense of duty was stronger than almost anything else. He knew he would be Alpha one day. That future could not include me, and the idea that he might refuse his birthright for me was a ludicrous notion. Bardolph followed Kai around the corner, his face grim. The beefy blacksmith dropped his eyes respectfully, dipping his chin as though he wanted to bow before his Alpha. Gerard, we require your services as a blacksmith. Bardolph's deep voice rang out. A fate mark has appeared upon this woman's chest, a twin of my son's mark. He rejects it. They must both be burned away at once. Gerard blinked and nodded, still not meeting the Alpha's gaze. He turned away from the group and grasped a dusty branding tool hanging up behind the table. He fingered the end of it thoughtfully before proffering it to Bardolph. This has been passed down through my family, father to son, he said. For years it has been used to remove tainted fate marks. Bardolph spared a swift glance at it and nodded. I got the feeling that he'd have let Gerard use a flaming stick to burn away the marks, if that's what it took. He was obviously desperate to rid himself of this inconvenience. That's all I was to him. An inconvenience to be dealt with and forgotten. Idly, I wondered if the same branding iron had been used on my mother, I dropped my chin to my chest and closed my eyes, focusing on the breath rasping in and out of my lungs. My fear was nothing compared to the wretched emptiness I felt in the pit of my stomach. Suddenly, I could feel Kai's eyes on me. I was deeply in tune with him even though I didn't want to be, and my eyes snapped up to his face. Our gazes locked. All at once, I wanted to run to his side to fall to my knees in front of him and beg him not to reject me. I wanted to make any promise I could think of to save our bond. He was mine and I was his. Couldn't he sense that? Did I mean nothing to him? I hated those thoughts. I hated myself for thinking them. My wolf whimpered piteously. As though he heard my desperate thoughts, Kai turned away, looking at his father instead of at me. Gerard placed the brand in the now roaring fire. After many long moments, he pulled it out and studied the square tip. It glowed red. I will wield it, Bardolph said in a dark voice, taking the handle from the blacksmith. Gerard surrendered it and stepped back, his face hidden in the dark shadow of the corner. I wondered if he wanted to flee the scene as badly as I did. Kai pulled open his shirt, revealing the raised scar over his heart. It looked exactly like mine and I ached to run my fingers along it. I wanted to press my lips to it. My pulse quickened, before anger and disgust at myself snapped me free of the pathetic thought. My son, Bardolph said in a somber voice. Speak your purpose. I reject the mark. 
You, my Alpha, will burn its traces from me. Time slowed to a crawl. I could see Bardolph's lips move, but the roaring in my ears made it impossible to hear what he said. My unblinking gaze locked on Kai. He stared grimly into his father's face, his expression frozen with tension. I watched dazedly as Bardolph pressed the hot brand to Kai's chest. He did not move or flinch, and it was as though my senses turned back on after being far removed from my body. I could hear the sizzle as the flesh smoldered away. I could smell the burning skin, and it nearly made me wretch. A searing pain erupted in my chest, growing and growing until it felt as though Bardolph were pressing the scorching metal to my skin, rather than his son's. The pain was inside me too, flowing along our bond. My very soul was on fire. The wolf inside of me pointed her muzzle to the sky and howled out our agony. The noise rose up my throat and burst free as an unearthly scream, neither human nor animal. I doubled over, clutching at my chest, and kept screaming. Four. This was insanity. I could feel myself coming apart at the seams, fighting both physically and spiritually for my mate, Kai, who stood as still as stone, his flesh blistering beneath the heat of the brand. The tightness in his eyes told everyone present that he was in pain, but I could feel his pain. I shrieked in agony and felt my control of my human body slip. I crouched down between Jace and Finn, their hands still grasping my shoulders, trying to fling myself forward to defend Kai. No matter how hard I launched myself off the ground, Kai's two friends were bigger and stronger than me. They slammed me back down to the ground, each time with more force. Don't be stupid, Finn hissed in my ear, leaning down so that no one else could catch his words. Bardolph, always proper and formal, turned away from his son to find another brand to finish the job eyeing me as Gerard pressed another red-hot tool into his waiting hands. You need to develop some self-control, he observed, leaning towards me slightly as he adjusted the thick glove on his hand. I sprang forward again, still half-wolf, half-crazed woman, and my teeth snapped an inch from his face. Bardolph's dark expression would have turned me to mush if I hadn't been wild with desperation, trying desperately to reach Kai. A blow impacted my cheekbone, the simple cuff by the pack's alpha causing me to spin away from Jason Finn beneath its force. I landed on the dirt floor, flat on my stomach. A quiet, indrawn breath reached my ears. It had been Kai. He'd reacted when his father hit me. I panted against the pain coming from both within and without, inhaling dirt in my mouth and nose. Spitting out blood, I felt my teeth with my tongue. Nothing seemed to be broken. Well, that was one good thing I had going for me today, I supposed. At least I wouldn't have to learn to hunt with only half my damn teeth still attached. I clambered around, struggling to rise to my feet. My legs were still mostly in wolf form, not meant to stretch as tall and straight as an upright human. I wanted to get control of myself, but my emotions were seesawing wildly, and my head spun from the recent blow. Bardolph stared at me coldly, his voice steady. Be still. It was an alpha bark, and I felt myself freeze, obeying against my will. Everything inside me was screaming in agony. I was terrified and enraged. My breath hissed out of my teeth, flecks of blood spraying down my naked chest. I thought I told you to hold her, Bardolph said, his gaze pinning Jace and Finn. Immediately, I felt two pairs of strong hands gripping me tightly. Each of them had one hand above and one hand below my elbows. I knew I could kick and fight, and they'd simply hold me away from everything, even the ground if they had to do so. I turned my burning, hate-filled eyes to Bardolph, wishing I could sink my teeth into his throat, rip it away with one smooth motion. My wolf had taken control, and she loathed him for destroying our one chance at a happy life. I'd never done anything wrong, and he'd treated me like trash in the road ever since I was a child. I knew I had never really been a part of the pack. It was just a delusion to think that I'd ever had a place here. 
When the hot brand met my skin, I didn't scream, determined not to give him the satisfaction. But I did kick wildly, my body finally turning all the way back to human beneath the searing agony. As soon as it was done, my captors let go of my arms at a nod from Bardolf. I was shaking so badly that I immediately collapsed to the ground again, one hand hovering over the wound bubbling on my chest. It was pain like I had never felt, but I clenched my teeth and remained silent. To distract myself from the searing burn of it, I searched deep in my heart and mind. The bond with Kai was still there. I was sure of it. It was tattered, almost completely shredded, but it was there. I could feel the pull of his mind and my wolf longed to rush to his side, even after all of this. I said nothing. I didn't want them to know that it hadn't worked. For one thing, who knew what they'd do next to try and break it? The thought made me shudder. My wolf had other ideas, though we were in accord when it came to protecting this secret. I could feel her hope that the bond might regrow somehow that our mate might realize he'd made a mistake and magically decide to accept us. I stared at the dirt floor in front of me, shivering. My son. Bardolf's strong voice called. I looked up quickly to discover that Kai had backed away from me while Bardolf burned out my fate mark. He was as pale as I was, and his deep amber eyes were sparkling with a strange light. He stared at me and I didn't look away, my wolf hoping against hope. I knew better. Kai. Bardolf called again, breaking into the moment. Yes, Alpha. He replied, his voice even despite how pale and sick he looked. What do you want to do with her now that the tainted mark has been removed? Something flickered deep inside Kai's eyes. Through the connection that still existed between us, I could sense the flow of his thoughts. It was extremely confusing for me as I was so full of my own terrible emotions. Yet, I could clearly sense that Kai was conflicted, angry, and in pain. A surge of strong, protective feelings filled him, and for a moment, Geneva's face flashed into both of our minds. He shook his head, obviously trying to clear the mental images. Exile her from the pack, he said in an absolutely flat tone. I never want to see her again. I blinked, not certain I'd heard correctly. Surely he couldn't mean to exile me. Exile was for criminals in the pack. Criminals? Like my mother. My stomach churned. Banishment from the Packlands was a vanishingly rare sentence. Despite our wild ways, shifters had always been able to coexist more functionally than our human counterparts. Normally, punishments were meted out within the pack. Only a few people had managed to put themselves into such poor graces with the Alpha that they'd been forced completely out of the Greystalker lands. Of those who had, no one knew or cared if they'd lived or died afterward. But I hadn't done anything wrong. What possible crime could I have committed that would justify this response? All I'd done was shift and gain a fate mark. My internal voice was rising in hysterics. Frustrated tears of pain and confusion burned behind my eyes. I looked desperately into Kai's face, yet he refused to meet my gaze. Without a word, he turned and stalked away from the smithy, disappearing into the trees. Bardolf hesitated. He was quite clearly relieved that the mark had been burned away, yet it was obvious he thought Kai was going a bit too far. After a moment, though, he turned towards Jason Finn, barking out the order. You heard my son. Take her to the holding den. She will be exiled tomorrow. So, that was it. My life in the pack was over, worth no more to this great alpha than a shrug of his shoulders as he indulged his son's whim. Anger burned inside me, and I found myself growling, even though I was still in my human form. My inner wolf was baring her teeth and clawing for freedom. Jace and Finn gripped my arms tightly this time as they marched me away from Gerard's smithy. I was a prisoner, soon to be exiled. They had no room in their loyal hearts for pity or mercy, and I wasn't stupid enough to ask it of them. The holding dens that served as a jail for the pack's few troublemakers stood far away from the rest of the town, nestled in a dense bunch of trees that almost entirely blocked out the light. 
Jason Finn walked me inside, where they were met by a shifter on guard duty. At his direction, they led me into the depths of the damp subterranean structure. I could hear the guard following us, practically vibrating with curiosity. Without a word of explanation, I was placed in a dark cell, dirt walls all around me. There was a wooden bench in the corner that smelled of urine. I wrinkled my nose and crossed my arms, but I couldn't stop the beseeching look on my face as my two captors backed away. Why? I croaked. Neither answered, but it was clear that they were unhappy with what was happening. Just answer me, I pleaded. I'm nothing to you. Please, just tell me why. Jace shook his head and turned away. The guard waylaid him, and they moved out of hearing range, speaking in soft tones that I couldn't make out. Finn, I tried, raising my sad, tear-streaked face to his. He chewed on his lip, looking horribly uncomfortable. You don't understand, he finally said. It's complicated. I waited a minute, but he didn't continue. What don't I understand, I demanded. Finn seemed to hesitate, as though choosing his words with care. Kai has always been drawn to you. Always. I don't believe he really wanted this. But you can't be his and he can't be yours. And it was just that simple, wasn't it? I nodded darkly in understanding, already painfully aware of the difference in social position between the two of us. It would be too much for him to see you every day, Finn insisted. But maybe this is for your own good, as well as his. The feeble question wasn't even worth answering, so I turned towards the wall studying the cracks that had grown through the dirt foundation. I stepped closer, wondering just how many people had fantasized about escape through one of these cracks. Despite the sickening smell, I sat on the edge of the bench, feeling the rank dampness of the wood against my still-naked legs. I wrapped my arms more tightly around myself as the chill crept deep into my bones. I knew that it was no use to beg for mercy or a second chance. My thoughts drifted to Darby. She had wanted to leave the pack. I'd been afraid to. I snorted derisively. That was irony for you. I was getting what she wanted most in life. A chance to leave. Of course, she'd wanted a fresh start somewhere else with a new pack. It was an open question whether that option would be available to me. It had been a long time since I'd studied the Packlands in school. I'd never dreamed that I would be separated from the Greystalker clan. Not permanently. Not like this. Whenever I'd snuck off, it had been to the human towns, my curiosity about their strange ways and seeming freedom drawing me to risk the ire of a pack that already hated me. Contact with humans was discouraged. Allowing humans to learn about the supernatural world was forbidden, on pain of death. And that was one line I'd never even come close to crossing. Could I flee to the human world, rather than to some other pack that might treat me just as badly as this one had? An exiled wolf would not be welcome anywhere, and even between far-flung packs, gossip traveled. I stared unseeingly at the wall as my thoughts drifted further and further. The hours melded into one long, shapeless stretch, but it felt like it had been a very long time when a low burn of discomfort in my chest shook me out of my trance. Kai. My wolf whined in distress and I jumped to my feet. Something was wrong. I could feel pain along our bond. Instinct pressed me to go to him, the wolf heedless of the torture he'd already subjected us to. Pulled along for the ride behind her emotions, I walked to the door of my cell and rattled the bars. They were made of heavy iron, no doubt the work of Gerard. Hey, you can't keep me here, I yelled. I'm not a criminal. Let me out. My words fell on deaf ears, as I'd known they would. It was so frustrating to be locked up for the simple sin of existing, because that was sure as hell what this felt like to me. If they wanted me gone so badly, they shouldn't have locked me up in this cell, I thought. The irony really was too much for me, and I started laughing. My giggles began to turn hysterical, and I wondered if I was losing my mind. Could a person go crazy from having their fate mark burned away? Right on cue, I could feel the ghost of the pain flare again, deep in my chest. 
I looked down and studied the blistering raw skin. Maybe it was just residual pain from the burn? Then pain started flashing across other areas of my body, first on my shoulders, moving up towards my neck. Heat pooled in my stomach, causing me to break out in a sweat despite the dampness of the cellar jail. My heart rate quickened, and it was a long moment before I realized what was happening to me. Desire. That strange heat in my belly was sexual desire. But that was ridiculous. i just experienced a major psychological trauma, being wrenched away from and rejected by my mate, then thrown in jail for no reason, and facing banishment from the pack. How could I possibly be turned on right now? I shook my head sharply, trying to clear it. I wasn't turned on. There was no way I could be as sad, miserable, and scared as I was feeling in that moment. Kai could have been standing naked in front of me, pleasuring himself, and I doubted I'd be able to muster any great enthusiasm under the circumstances. Yet the aching, tingling sensation was growing, filling my body. There were parts of me that throbbed more insistently, and slick heat formed between my legs. What was happening to me? Would Kai be able to feel this? Would he know? I froze. I couldn't have said how long I stood there, my mouth open in horror as realization dawned on me. I still didn't understand how, but just as I had known Kai was in pain earlier, I knew now that Kai was mating. Mating someone else. Someone who was not me. In that instant, my mind fractured, separating the analytical part of me from the emotional one the part of me that contained the wolf. The wolf's emotions were whirling and collapsing, her pain and rage so overwhelming that I couldn't stand it. I had to escape, but I couldn't escape. She was me. I was her. We were the same. I clung to human reason, trying to remain calm in the face of her madness. What I was feeling proved that the severing of the bond hadn't been successful. Not entirely, anyway. I glanced down at the wound over my heart. I couldn't tell if there was any trace of the mark, which had formed a similar whirl in the fur of my wolf's coat. Maybe there were little pieces of skin left, I thought, trying to see through the darkness, which was only broken by a single, flickering torch on the wall beyond the bars. I fought to ignore the burning ache between my legs, the soft sensation of pleasure that was rising in me, a counterpoint to the wolf's fury. But it wasn't in me, I reminded myself, over and over. Kai was the one experiencing pleasure, not me. The wolf needed to accept this terrible, horrific fact. Otherwise, I was afraid I'd be stuck here, frozen in place forever, as the two halves of me fought each other. Yet, I could feel the raw animal emotions inside me overflowing, taking over my human rationality. He's destroying the last of our bond, I realized numbly. I gritted my teeth at my body's weakness in the face of this last and final insult. The wolf inside of me growled, snarling and cowering as if I had struck her physically by even thinking the words. When Kai's climax rocked my body, leaving me kneeling in the middle of the floor and panting as if I'd just run several miles, the sense of pain and betrayal took over. My wolf form was nearly hysterical, biting at herself and running in circles from the agony of it. I was enraged on her behalf, and, to my own disgust, also deeply jealous. He cheated on us, I thought. Tears welled in my eyes as my emotions synced with the wolf's. He's our mate, and he cheated. I shook my head, trying to clear it. He must have been trying to burn out the remnants of the bond. Why else would he do something like this? You didn't cheat on your mate. You just didn't. It was pack taboo. Bad things happened if you broke that taboo. I had more cause than most to know that. After all, I was the product of cheating, and I knew bitterly well what it was like to be at the bottom of the pack. My very presence was a curse. A physical representation of that terrible act between bonded mates. My mother had been with her mate for years, but as sometimes happened when one partner or the other was infertile, they had been pupless. 
I had no idea what prompted my mother to break her sacred vow of fidelity to her mate. But as the story was told, he'd sensed her betrayal through their bond, and it had sent him mad. When he found out later that my mother was pregnant with me, he'd left our village and climbed the mountain alone. That night, he threw himself from a precipice. Pack members found his body the next day, shattered and broken on the rocks below. Because of her part in his death, my mother had been exiled as soon as I was considered old enough to fend for myself, at the ripe old age of ten years. The pack elders removed me from her care, and the Alpha cast her out. Like mother, like daughter. When it became clear that the pack wasn't going to lift a finger to help me, Geneva had stepped in to make sure I at least had food and a roof over my head. But she wasn't family. She'd always been eccentric and hard to pin down. Despite living with her for almost 11 years, I still felt like I barely knew her. I wondered if she'd miss me when I was gone. The wolf howled her outrage, still circling restlessly inside of me. This pain is what my mother's mate experienced, I realized. Only his was even worse, because they'd been bonded for years. I'd never given much thought to him growing up. He wasn't my father, just an unknown, faceless figure. Now I felt my heart go out to him, my punishment coming full circle, yet again. My mother broke her bond, so my mate broke ours, rather than be saddled with the bastard offspring of a pariah. My evil thoughts swam in tighter and tighter spirals as tears streamed silently down my face. Unable to stand it anymore, I wrapped my arms around my naked torso and collapsed into angry sobbing. Five. Six months later, I sighed, staring at the depressingly small stack of paper money being pressed into my hand. I'd hoped for nearly double that amount. Triple would have been nice. Is that all? I grumbled to Frank, the slimy owner of the rundown home for old and mentally ill humans. He grunted at me, which was his usual response for nearly everything. Closing my fingers over my pathetic pay, I left his cramped office with its old, mismatched furniture covering almost every available inch of the floor. I'd often wondered if he had so much junk in his office to hide the suspicious stains soaked into the carpet. I wrinkled my nose more out of habit than the actual distress as I passed into the common area of the house. There were twelve residents, all with blank, pale faces. The smell of highly processed food crept out of the kitchen, despite my best efforts to keep the area clean and sanitary. Having been literally raised among wolves, the average human would doubtless assume that I'd be a slob. The reality was quite the opposite. Humans really were disgusting, and the burning smell of the bleach and cleaning products at least helped to mask the odor of stale urine that seemed to permeate everything in this building. It was after eight o'clock in the evening, with the residents' dinner and cleanup already completed. Everyone was settled in front of the television, ready for the night crew to come on duty. I yawned widely, eager to get home. Home. It was hard for me to think the word when there was nothing homelike about my rundown studio apartment in the slums of Rockville. Not for the first time, I shook my head and marveled at how I'd ended up here at all. The last six months sometimes felt like one long blur. The morning after I'd been exiled, I woke up in the dark, underground cell. Bardolph had crouched awkwardly as he thumped down the stairs towards me so tall that his head would have smacked the ceiling had he stretched to his full height. I'd had a different guard that morning, one who'd never spoken to me once, or even bothered to check on me and see if I was still alive. Despite my frustrated yelling, he'd ignored me, until I'd eventually been forced to relieve myself in the corner of the cell. Now, however, he tagged along at the Alpha's heels with a sycophantic expression on his face. At a swift word from Bardolph, he'd released me from my cell. Bardolph's face was grim. He held a dark cloth bag in his hands. Your belongings, he said in a gruff voice, thrusting them at me. Freezing cold after my night in the cell, I opened the brown sack with numb fingers and pulled out boots, socks, underwear, one of my old shirts, and a long pair of hiking pants. 
Bardolph looked disgusted as he eyed my attire. The clothing had been purchased in a human secondhand store after I'd spent the day panhandling for money in the city. It was clear enough he'd realized that, and didn't approve. I followed him up the steps, out of the holding den, and into the bright sunshine. It was another unusually nice day, but my soul felt like it was muffled in fog. As I stumbled through the door, I caught sight of Geneva and Darby standing silently outside. Darby's father stood a few steps removed, watching. They were the only ones who'd come to say goodbye, it seemed. Geneva's face was grave, almost calculating, as she appraised me. Survive, she murmured, touching my elbow as I passed her. Make sure you survive. I looked at her, wishing somewhere deep inside for a more affectionate parting. She was the closest thing to a real mother I'd ever known, and the best advice she could give me was to survive. I shook my head in disgust. Darby, however, had tears streaming down her face. She threw her arms around my neck, her face buried in the black side of my hair. I tried to sneak away so I could join you. She choked out between sobs. But my parents caught me packing to leave. I'm so sorry, Ember. None of this should have happened. Knowing well her desire to leave the Greystalker lands and start her life over, I clutched her tight. I'm sorry, too. Find me when you can. I whispered against her ear. I let her go reluctantly as Bardolph, now in the form of his wolf, let out an impatient growl. In this guise, he was a giant, black beast with a graying muzzle. He herded me away from the only two people I'd ever called friends, a low rumble of warning in his throat as he drove me relentlessly south, out of the gray stalker lands. I remained in my human form the entire time, my bag of possessions slung over my shoulders. When we reached the border of the Pax territory, Bardolph slowed. This wasn't the farthest from home I had ever traveled by any means, but I knew this time there would be no coming back. All those times that I had snuck away, getting tattoos, dyeing my hair, it seemed like a lifetime ago. What I'd thought of as a grand adventure had been nothing more than childish rebellion. Bardolph bared his teeth at me in a fierce snarl. I left him behind without a word, wandering through the dense forest until I found the road that would take me south, towards the human city of Seattle. Afterward, I hitchhiked my way farther south, passing by the large, bustling city. The man I was riding with chatted idly, telling me about how all the tourists insisted on visiting a building he'd called the Space Needle, while he'd never actually been inside despite being a native. I glanced at him surreptitiously, taking in his long, dirty blonde hair and the soft fuzz of beard around his jawline. I knew I wasn't doing a very good job of keeping up my side of the conversation. You seem kind of lost. He observed in a soft voice. I'd only been able to shrug, not sure what to say to this human. When I didn't answer, he nodded sagely and continued. Eh, uh, don't take things too hard, okay? Life can be like that sometimes. You just gotta roll a fresh joint and go with the flow. Speaking of which, do you care if I smoke? Smoke? I blinked in confusion, but then comprehension dawned. Oh. No. Go right ahead, I replied. I'd forgotten that some humans liked to wreath themselves in the sweet-smelling smoke that dulled their senses and made them sleep, while others liked the sharp-smelling smoke that made them jittery. As long as it didn't make him crash the car, it didn't bother me. Besides, the man seemed to be in a good enough mood to start with. He continued to talk during the entire drive, though I never really answered beyond vague noises of agreement. Apparently, he didn't need any reciprocation from me to keep up his steady flow of words. He dropped me in a smaller city about an hour and a half south of Seattle. I wasn't sure why I decided to stop there, rather than continuing on. The city seemed good enough, I suppose. What was the point of going any farther? I wandered the streets, listening to humans talking to one another. This had always been how I'd gathered information, trying to take in as much of my surroundings as possible so I'd know what I needed to survive. It wasn't a long list. Shelter, food, and water. I could get all of those things easily enough as a wolf. 
but it would be risky spending time in my wolf form when I was still so near to the places where shifters lived. I didn't think they'd go out of their way to hunt me down just because I'd been cast out of my pack. It wasn't a sure thing, though. Lone wolves were vulnerable, and anyone caught shifting where humans might see would definitely be a target for pack retribution. All in all, it was best if I spent most of my time human. Once I'd seen the lie of the land, I spoke with a few people, until someone finally pointed me in the direction of a homeless shelter. Part of me wanted to roll my eyes at the very idea. Finding a den wouldn't be hard, even in a place like this. But I stopped myself. In reality, I was an outcast now. I did not, in fact, have a home. I needed to leave that kind of pack-based shifter mentality behind me. Once I found the shelter, having scraped together a few dollars begged from strangers along the way, I walked up to the front desk, nervously clutching the straps of my bag. Swallowing my pride, I told the pretty young woman with blonde hair and a pert nose that I needed a place to stay. She'd taken a long look at me and asked a few pointed questions. Is there a chance that someone might come looking for you? She asked. Biting my lip, I cast my eyes to the floor. Surely no one would come look for me as long as I didn't start trouble with the humans. That was, after all, the whole point of being banished. Wasn't it? A terrible thought occurred to me, clenching my stomach in a frozen grip. Killing me would be a surefire way to completely eliminate the bond between two mates. Kai had wanted me gone. I never want to see her again, he'd said. Was there a chance he'd send someone after me to finish the job? Shit. It's possible, I whispered, my voice hoarse, and tugged my neckline down far enough to reveal the top of the ugly burn scar over my heart. After that, I was redirected to a domestic violence shelter. I didn't challenge the decision. For one thing, it seemed like this place was smaller and quieter, much more to my liking than the noisy shelter where I'd first sought a place to stay. In the end, I'd stayed at the women's shelter for about three months, slowly building up a stash of clothing and supplies. Some of the human women staying there knew about employers and landlords who would be willing to accept cash and look the other way regarding my lack of any ID or background documentation in their world. From what I'd seen so far, humans placed an unnecessary emphasis on a strange concept called credit history. Anyway, that was how I got connected with the seedy nursing home on the outskirts of town. The man who ran the place didn't care if I had three heads, let alone a legal ID. He just needed someone who could cook large amounts of cheap, low-quality food without burning down the building in the process. I sort of met those requirements. After much trial and error, I'd gotten the hang of cooking for the dozen people that called the place home. And while there might have been a bit of smoke in the beginning, nothing had required a visit from the fire department. I'd even managed to mix in some more nutritious options from time to time, when the local food pantry was giving away vegetables. After saving enough cash, I moved out of the women's shelter and got myself a tiny apartment in a rundown building a couple of miles from the nursing home. Objectively, I could tell that it was in what the humans would call a bad part of town, with drug dealers and prostitutes prowling the streets as soon as the sun started to set. Yet I was not afraid. I probably should have been. But in my heart, I knew that my wolf form could tear the head off anyone who tried to bother me. Of course, actually doing that was a terrible plan that would likely lead to discovery by the humans. But that same aura of self-confidence seemed to dissuade problems before they even started. Human predators didn't like difficult prey. As it was, my inner wolf was utterly miserable living within the noisy city limits. I had to get out of town every now and then so I could shift, simply to ease the strain on my mind and soul. That part was bad enough. Even worse, I could sense things through the bond between myself and Kai, mostly intense emotions and strong physical sensations. It seemed like he was spending more and more time miserable and conflicted. His infrequent nights spent with other female wolves burned dully inside me, bringing tears to my eyes in the darkness. 
but his affairs were always followed by an empty, sick sensation through the bond that was almost worse. That feeling was grief, I thought. Horrible, pervasive, never-ending grief. Still, I was learning how to manage it, and I could make it through the day most of the time without problems, which was an improvement. During my weeks at the shelter, I'd been prone to crying spells, both from the terrible agony deep in my soul at the cruelty of the world and the searing pain I occasionally experienced through the bond with Kai. I couldn't tell if it was fading or if I was just getting used to it. A cheerful voice interrupted my thoughts. Hey, Ember, are you ready to go? I flinched in surprise, realizing too late that I'd been staring vacantly through the window while my mind whirled around in the same, familiar circles. Sorry, Anna, I said quickly, trying to play it off. I was zoning out a bit there. Yes, we can go. Anna was my only friend in the human world. A tiny, sweet girl a year older than me who had been on her own for a while. She had left the domestic violence shelter a few weeks after I arrived, and she was the one who'd helped me most with finding a job and a place of my own. I know a landlord that never asks too many questions, she'd assured me. We often walked home together when our shifts coincided, striding through the dark streets side by side. I got the impression she appreciated the sense of increased safety that came from traveling together in a pack, even a pack of two. This night was particularly dark, with the moon hidden behind heavy clouds that threatened rain at any moment. There was also a cold chill in the air, making us clutch our ragged jackets around our shoulders more tightly and hurry quickly towards home. We usually saw pedestrians along the way, but it seemed like no one wanted to venture out in the unseasonably cold weather. I glanced around warily. Something was off. My wolf could sense it. She paced nervously, her hackles raised and her teeth showing. As a human, I was only slightly larger than my companion. I knew I appeared gaunt and frail from infrequent meals. Appearances weren't everything, however. Even in this form, I was stronger and faster than the average human, my body able to adapt to the strength of a wolf easily. In this world, I had to be careful not to draw attention to myself by running too fast or lifting something too heavy. A quiet noise broke into my thoughts, and I realized that Anna's teeth were chattering as she walked beside me. I don't like this, I finally muttered, quickening my pace. Something feels off. What's wrong? She asked. I could see the glow from the nearest streetlight reflecting in her wide eyes. Part of me wanted to tell her the truth. I could almost hear my voice in my mind, explaining my heightened senses, my connection with the earth. I'm not human, at least not fully. I'm part wolf, and I can feel that something is brewing tonight. Even by my somewhat crazy standards, I could tell that the words sounded ridiculous. Anna would probably think I was off my meds. Rather than answer directly, I grabbed her hand, dragging her along behind me. Come on, I said tightly. We need to hurry. It's not safe here. She stumbled as I increased our speed and tried to twist her hand free. Ember! Before she could protest further, a dark figure stepped out from an alley just behind us, matching our pace. Too late, I breathed. Before I could decide what to do, two others stepped out from a doorway just in front of us. We came to an abrupt halt. The men closed in around us on both sides of the sidewalk. I glanced around the area, trying to find a way to escape, but one of the men in front of us broke into a harsh laugh and veered into the street. We were boxed in on all sides, trapped against the wall of an abandoned warehouse. I took a deep breath, tasting the human scents on the air. Over the past six months, I'd worked hard to develop my wolf's senses. It seemed to ease her anxiety when I was more vigilant about my surroundings. The smell was like an assault. All three had recently smoked cigarettes. Their clothes reeked with the foul fragrance of tobacco, strong enough that even Anna would notice it. My nose was much more sensitive than hers, and to me it was almost overpowering. The one on our left also had the lingering scent of cheap perfume clinging to his skin, along with the musky odor of sex. Prostitute, 
I identified, mentally noting that if his base desires were satiated, he might be more sluggish in an attack. The one that had come up behind us had recently vomited. I studied him closely and noticed that his hands were shaking, and he looked at us with an expression of sheer desperation. A trickle of sweat dripped from his hairline despite the chill in the air. The last man, the one who had laughed at us, was obviously the leader. Nice night for a stroll, ladies? He asked, giving us a cheeky wink. Now what would two fine young things like you be doing out so late at night? Anna squeaked in fear, pressing herself against my side. Going home, I snapped, barely able to keep my wolf's snarl under control. So, if you'll excuse us, please? Not so fast, pretty girl, the man replied, ignoring my statement. I want your money, now. I planted my feet shoulder-width apart, bending my knees so that I could spring at him in an instant, if I needed to. No, I told him without hesitation. I lived from paycheck to paycheck, barely able to keep up with my utilities. Too often I had to go hungry when the money ran out early. There was no way that I was handing two weeks worth of my earnings over to these junkies. I'd finally recognized the other scent rolling off two of the men, and I knew exactly what they wanted. Heroin. While the allure of the drug to humans was a mystery to me, I'd learned a thing or two while living in the domestic violence shelter. The man on my right was dope sick, and I knew he would stop at nothing to make his next score. As soon as this thought passed through my mind, he pulled out a gun and pointed it straight at my face. Anna let out a muffled shriek, a choked, breathless noise that told me she was panicking. Just give it to them, she begged me, shaking my arm. No, this is all I have, I countered never taking my eyes off the man's hand. I could launch the distance between us faster than the blink of an eye, shifting to my wolf form at the same moment. Before he could even realize that I had moved, I would tear his arm off with my teeth in one clean bite. Would that be enough to make his friends flee? I bet it would. They were both laughing and enjoying themselves. It was the man with the gun who was desperate. As I contemplated my options, Barely taking one second of time to process all of this, my eyes fell on Anna. Internally, my wolf gave a brisk, full-body shake. Sanity reasserted itself. I couldn't transform right in front of someone who knew me. I'd be breaking one of the most sacred wolf laws, revealing my secret to a human. The junkies might not be believed, assuming I left them alive. But Anna could never know about my true nature. If she did... If she told anyone, I'd be risking my entire pack. Every pack. And while I wasn't feeling overly generous towards Bardolf and his kin at the moment, I knew that bringing a horde of angry, paranoid humans down on all of the shifters in the Pacific Northwest was not the ideal solution to my current problem. Maybe this'll persuade her. The man on my left said, stepping forward suddenly and snatching Anna's arm. She screamed and tried to pull away, but he wrenched her forward until she was pressed against his body. I could see her standing stiffly, obviously terrified. A flash of silver caught my eye, and before I could move, the man had a knife pressed to Anna's throat. Anger at the unfairness of life bubbled up inside me, feeling like it had been building for months, for years. I was like a volcano, waiting to erupt. My vision turned red at the corners as I took in Anna's petite frame, wide, terrified eyes pleading with me to save her. Her lips pressed hard together, as though she were trying to hold back the whimper of terror that wanted to break free. I lifted my hands in front of me, reaching toward her. My burning eyes flashed to the man with the gun. He was steadying it, still aimed at my head. His finger trembled on the trigger. A blast of wind hit my body. My hair blew wildly around my face, but the wave of pressure didn't stagger me as it did the others. All three of the men fell beneath the onslaught, landing heavily as the wind blew them several feet down the sidewalk. Anna fell to her knees and pressed herself flat against the ground, covering her head as torrential rain burst free from the heavens. The rage continued to burn inside me, 
and I took one deliberate, furious step forward. The men were blasted backwards yet again, flying through the air as if the wind itself obeyed my command. Around me, the screech of folding and tearing metal came from the surrounding buildings, as though the walls were ripping themselves apart. I'd seen similar scenes on the news, after a hurricane hit one of the southern states. Was this a hurricane? I wondered, in some distant corner of my awareness, that wasn't overcome with righteous anger. Was this my hurricane? Six. My senses were on high alert. Anna's slight form still huddled on the ground next to me, trembling. What was happening? I could see the wind's effects, but it didn't seem to pull on me. I might as well have been a tree, with a vast root system holding me fast to the ground as the storm raged around me. The junkies writhed on the ground as dirt, rocks, and bits of debris peppered them. I could still see the knife in the hand of one of our attackers. Another wave of anger ripped through me at the sight of the weapon he'd intended to use on my friend. An instant later, the ground heaved beneath us, as though in answer to my vengeful thoughts. My eyes grew wide. I knew that earthquakes, as the humans called them, were not unheard of, although I didn't think they were a regular occurrence in this area. I'd certainly never felt one while living with the pack. The fresh sound of screeching metal assaulted my ears, but I didn't dare take my eyes off of the junkies. They were still being blown around, tossed to and fro on the heaving ground. Finally, one of them managed to pull himself to his feet, using the light pole near the corner. It was the one who'd held the gun on me, though there was no sign of the weapon now. Run! He screamed, his eyes wild. Run! It's the end times! His companions needed no further encouragement. They weren't shrieking, but their faces were studies in horror. Stumbling and staggering across the ever-shifting ground, they all hurried off without another backward glance. The wind and shaking earth showed no signs of abating, and I began to worry that the nearest structures wouldn't be able to withstand much more of this. The taller ones were starting to sway ominously. Come on, I yelled over the din. We need to get away from the buildings. With a tug, I tried to pull Anna up and away from the danger. Unfortunately, it seemed like she'd forgotten how to use her legs, and she sank to the ground with a terrified whimper after only a couple of steps. I hauled her up with easy shifter strength. In the end, I had to half-drag, half-carry her. We stood in the center of the street, watching the destruction with sick fascination. I took a few deep breaths and felt myself beginning to calm. At which point, the wind eased and the shaking ground settled. Anna's frantic, fearful panting filled the growing stillness instead. Wow, I murmured, looking down at her. That was some storm. In my peripheral vision, I could see the clouds rolling away. For a half a moment, I was sure I saw something else swirling at the edge of my awareness, as though the clouds themselves were whirling around in a vortex the size of a skyscraper. I blinked, but it was gone the moment I tried to focus on it, leaving me unsure if I'd truly seen anything at all. Pushing the odd moment from my mind, I focused on Anna again. Are you all right? I asked. She rose shakily to her feet. Tears ran from her eyes, leaving salty streaks down her face. All right? No, I'm not all right. Ember, we almost died. I nodded and tried to look sympathetic, even though I was confident that those men could not have overpowered us. Probably. At least. Not if I had decided to risk my anonymity and shift form. We walked the rest of the way home in silence except for the occasional hitching, stifled sob coming from Anna. Eventually, she gave a final loud sniffle and turned red-rimmed eyes on me. That weather, what on earth was that? I've never seen anything like it. I had no real answer for her. Um, I hedged, not at all sure how best to comfort a terrified human. Climate change, I guess. To my surprise, however, it seemed like this was the right answer. I guess so, she agreed, shuddering. My God, 
I don't know whether to say we got lucky or not. I shrugged, feeling pretty lucky that I hadn't needed to shift and risk exposure after all. Once I'd walked Anna to her own apartment in our shared building and made sure she was safely locked inside for the night, I jogged to my own door and unlocked it with fumbling fingers. Maybe I was a bit more affected by what had just happened than I'd thought. Even though the wolf inside me recoiled at spending another second in this cramped, run-down place, I still felt a sense of relief to have the deadbolt locked behind me. At least I could take it easy for a few hours before I had to return to work and face humans again. Even so, sleep was a long time coming that night. The following day, some inner voice convinced me to take a different route to work. It only made sense, I told myself. If those junkies were still around, they might be keeping an eye out for me. There was no point in borrowing trouble after all. Anna and I were on different shifts today, so I headed in alone. The walk to the nursing home was quiet and peaceful. Later, as I was cleaning up the residents' breakfast dishes, I overheard one of the nurse's aides muttering about crazy end time stuff under her breath in the other room. I'd learned to disguise my better-than-the-average human senses, so I wandered in as though I'd simply been bored in the kitchen on my own, drying a plate with the clean dish towel in my hands. She was watching the news with a worried scowl on her face. What's going on? I asked, nodding towards the television when she glanced at me. There was some really weird weather last night, not far from here, she said. Oh, I replied, not sure what else to say. She didn't reply, but continued to stare at the screen. On it, a reporter was walking down a very familiar-looking street. The whole area was in shambles, the damage far more striking in the daylight than it had been in the dark. Wow. Had things really been that bad after the storm? Words like microburst and significant damage buzzed at the edges of my brain as the man on the television continued to drone on about it. After the wind and shaking ground had subsided, I'd mostly been focused on getting Anna home safely, distracted by her obvious emotional distress. I hadn't paid much attention to the buildings around us, once I was confident they weren't likely to fall on our heads. Thanks to the local news crew, I was getting a good look at them now. I'd seen images from hurricanes on the other side of the country. This looked much the same. So I take it this kind of thing doesn't happen often around here? I asked, even though I knew the answer. There were no records of a hurricane ever hitting the coast in all of our pack's history. Yet, I still felt the need to ask, to confirm it. Never, she said with feeling. That's why it's such big news. Plus, only a block away, everything is untouched. They're saying it didn't even rain outside of that one little area. And there was an earthquake at almost exactly the same time. Did you feel it? I thought back to the heaving ground, the swaying buildings. Clearing my throat, I said, yeah, I might have felt something, I guess. I was preoccupied for the entire rest of the day. My thoughts swirled in ever tighter circles. Memories of the last time the bullies in my pack had decided to teach me a lesson about being a bastard and the way the wind had howled around me as my desperation rose. It had to be a coincidence, right? What else could it possibly be? With a deep sense of misgiving, I readied myself to walk the same route home as last night. It was my night to leave early, so Anna would have to find her own way. Hopefully she'd beg someone for a ride, since she'd seemed so shaken and upset by the previous night's events. But I had to see the damage for myself. I had to try and figure out what had caused it. When I was finally able to clock out, my nerves were stretched far more tightly than when I'd realized that the men last night had us surrounded. It made no sense. Why would this possibly be more frightening to me than the prospect of being shot or stabbed? Unbidden, a memory of Geneva came into my head. It was from just after I'd been beaten up. Did anything odd happen while this group was attacking you? She'd asked me. It had almost seemed as though she'd known something about me that I didn't even know myself. But what could that mean? Did it mean anything at all? I was nothing. Nobody. The bastard offspring of a mate killer, as far as the pack was concerned. 
I would never know what Geneva had been thinking that day. The ache of loss that I'd held for so long for her and Darby yawned beneath me like an endless chasm. No less painful now than it had been the first day I'd been cast out. My feet carried me closer to the spot where Anna and I had been attacked. Abruptly, I found myself entering a crowd of people. They were all milling about, staring at the buildings. Here and there, windows had been blown out. Glass strewn in glittering shards across the sidewalk. Parts of the metal roofs were bent back on themselves, which explained the screeching noises I'd heard. I approached the edge of the crowd. People gathered just on the other side of a ribbon of yellow police tape. The block where Anna and I had been ambushed the night before was completely roped off. There, the damage appeared truly catastrophic. The images I'd seen on the television at work were a cheap impersonation of reality. They'd been nothing in comparison to this. Several buildings were completely destroyed. Only the fact that it was a largely deserted warehouse district would have prevented mass human casualties. The more I looked around, the more it seemed like there was to see. The road, which had been perfectly smooth the night before, was now buckled and wavy, as though a meteor had landed in the center of the street, with the shock waves expanding in every direction. I noticed that a light pole was bent in the middle, twisted into a bizarre spiral. What could have caused that? Surely that wasn't done by the wind. Even stranger were the pieces of rough wood jutting out of crumbling walls, like they'd been hammered into place by a giant's mallet. They were clearly pieces of trees, although in such a commercial area, the lack of green space was conspicuous. Had the storm pulled up trees from further away and blown them here? Was that even possible when the news had said that no other areas were damaged? Shaking my head, I started to back away. I didn't want to see this anymore. It was too much to take in at once. A deep part of my soul, a part untouched by logic and reason, insisted that this was my fault. You did this, it whispered. You caused this destruction. But that was impossible. I was just one wolf who'd happened to be caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. My feeble mental argument did nothing to erode the growing certainty that something irrevocable had happened to me last night. In some ways, it was like my wolf birth. Once the feeling awoke inside me, there was no going back. I hurried toward home, glad that I'd decided to take a different route to work that morning. I would never have been able to get through the day if I'd had all of these thoughts whirling around inside my head. Through the haze of my preoccupation, I felt something prickle at my awareness. The hair on the back of my neck rose. I tried to shake off the odd sensation, attributing it to my shattered nerves. After a minute, though, awareness turned to alarm. I was being followed. I could feel it. The whisper of quiet breath behind me the soft rustle of clothing. I whirled around. There was no one to be seen. No human could move with such stealth. I was sure of it. They blundered along, slapping their feet carelessly on the concrete. No, I was certain that the creature following me was something inhuman. Again I turned, moving in a slow 360 as my eyes raked my surroundings. This is ridiculous, I thought. Just because you're spooked about what happened last night, it doesn't mean that someone is following you. There's no one here. They're all busy gawping at a bunch of destroyed buildings. The wolf inside me growled, unconvinced by my inner monologue. Certain that I was being stupid, I darted around the next corner, taking a different street than I normally would. If there was something following me, I sure as sin didn't want to lead it straight to my apartment. My wolf rumbled her agreement. As soon as I was around the corner... I broke into a dead run and ducked into the first alley I came across. Glancing around in the low light, I climbed a set of concrete steps and backed into a dark doorway, recessed into the side of a building. I was confident that I had not been seen, and I wanted a chance to be the observer, the hunter, rather than the prey. I would wait here for a few minutes. If no one walked by, I'd chalk it up to my overactive imagination and go home. After the events of the previous night, it was almost certainly nothing more than my own paranoia. Because if it wasn't, and someone, or 
something, really was after me for the second night in a row, I was the unluckiest person in the damned city. Attempted mugging, earthquake, freak weather incident, and now I was being followed by something that didn't feel human? For fuck's sake. Maybe I'd have had better luck staying with a pack after all. I shook my head in disgust, but kept my eyes trained on the street. At first, I could hear nothing, even with my ears straining to pick up the slightest whisper of sound. The longer I stood there, however, the more I became convinced that someone was close on my heels, even now. How was that possible, though? I'd slipped away so quickly that no one could have seen me. Why did I still feel like I was being watched? The hair on the back of my neck was standing up. Something was coming for me. I could feel it. Something with immeasurable power. Cold sweat broke out across my skin. Movement deeper in the alley caught my attention, and I whirled to see a tall figure looming in the darkness. Instinct took over. I snarled and dropped into a crouch, poised to spring at my pursuer. Deep in my soul, I knew this was the creature that had been tracking me all along. My eyes adjusted to the deeper darkness taking him in. A breeze whispered through the alley, stirring locks of long, white blonde hair. I caught a familiar scent an instant later, and my wolf froze, entranced. It was intoxicating, full of a richness unlike anything I had ever smelled before, yet it still somehow felt like home. The animal part of me wanted to run to the man and bury my nose in his neck to get more of that scent, in hopes of understanding what it might mean. Even with this embarrassing realization, I didn't relax my stance. I knew better than to trust some random creature who smelled like the primeval forest made incarnate. And I certainly wasn't going to let my guard down until I found out why he had been following me. He stepped further into the light, revealing sharply sculpted, beautiful features. His intense, pale blue eyes were focused on me to the exclusion of all else, as though he could see directly into my soul. My wolf began to pant as my gaze raked over his perfect body, lean and muscular, wrapped in clothing made of buckskin and linen. He stood still as a stone, regarding me in turn, his head cocked slightly to the side, a look of mild disdain sliding across his features as he took in my appearance. The wolf bristled at his expression, pressing against my control, trying to break free. She wanted to test herself against this male, who both drew her interest and provoked her unbearably. Under her influence, my lips pulled away from my teeth in a silent snarl of challenge. A smile ticked the corners of his mouth upward, though I got the impression it had very little to do with amusement. Well now, little wolf, he said, here we are at last. Seven. Shock rooted me to the spot for the briefest of moments. He'd called me Little Wolf. How could he have known? It was impossible, unless he too was a wolf. Then I supposed he could have scented me. I inhaled experimentally, trying to place the aroma that was making my blood feel too hot in my body. No, there definitely wasn't any wolf scent coming from him. Something about him smelled so familiar yet I couldn't figure out why. I didn't answer him, feeling a surge of energy rising within my wolf form. She could barely seem to contain herself. How could we simultaneously want to fight him, to tear him to shreds, and also to lick every single inch of his lithe, athletic body? It didn't make sense. The wolf itched to tackle him to the pavement and pin him there. I had a sneaking suspicion she was being overly optimistic about our chances against him. These thoughts passed through my mind so quickly that it probably seemed like I'd only paused to take a breath. I opened my mouth and forced some words out. Who are you? I demanded, since that seemed like the most relevant question. The man let out a low sound of amusement. It sounded like the first thaw of spring after a long winter of doubt. My heart raced, but I remained frozen, unmoving. Does my name matter so much to you, little wolf? He countered. I know who you are. I didn't argue. He'd already sensed that I was no more human than he was. It seemed stupid to deny it. 
Why are you following me? I tried, bringing the full weight of my wolf's stare down on him. I had no more patience for this. Apparently, something about my expression convinced him to speak. A wry smile twisted his full lips, and he gave me a faintly ironic half-bow. Since you insist, my name is Tamlane of the Seely. I am here to transport you to the Fey realm of Elfheim. I blinked at him, completely thrown. My people told stories of Elfheim and the Fey folk to their pups, just as the humans had done with their children for generations. There were so many old tales that it was hard to pick out truth from fiction. These days, many in the younger generations had started to believe that the Fey realm was only a myth. Personally, I hadn't been so sure of that, and it looked like I'd been right, since the preternaturally attractive man standing before me seemed real enough. Something Darby had once said shifted to the forefront of my memory. They say that people go mad in the Fey lands, she'd told me her face shining with delight in a mystery. It wasn't unusual for her. Darby had always been fascinated by what she couldn't have. Why do they go mad? I'd asked her, curious and skeptical in equal measure. Her eyes had glowed with fascination. There's too much magic in the fairy realm, she'd said. It's just too strange. Some people can't handle it and they go insane. It's like a sickness. I hadn't truly believed it at the time. We'd been two young pups whispering to each other in the branches of our secret tree, the place where we went when we wanted to hide from the rest of the pack. She'd been leaning back against the trunk, staring at the leaves above us as they rustled in the light breeze. It had been a perfect afternoon, one of the few I cherished from my youth. Of course, at the time I'd scoffed at her. I hadn't known if I believed in Elfheim or not, let alone in the stories of magic and madness. Now, faced with this obviously magical hunter who'd tracked me down in a human city, I had to admit that there appeared to be some merit to the stories. I can't go with you, I told him, my gaze still locked with his. I stood poised and cautious in the alley, not immediately ready to spring, but certainly not relaxed either. Oh, little wolf, I assure you, you can. And you will, he replied. There was so much certainty in his voice that I found myself bristling, my wolf's hackles rising at his confident tone. Excuse me, I snapped, but you don't get to just waltz in here and demand I go somewhere I don't want to go. I've spent a lifetime being yanked around by other people's whims, and I'm done with it. This is my life. I packed as much authority into my tone as I could muster knowing full well that while my strength was more than enough to deal with a human, that didn't mean I could fight one of the fey folk. Tamlane of the Seely was a warrior, a hunter. That much was painfully clear. The fey's expression went stony. One life, yes, he said in a hard tone. A single life, while my entire world hangs in the balance. So, no, given what is at stake, you do not, in fact, have a choice in this matter. What? You're going to kidnap me? I demanded in disbelief. The wolf inside me rose up, incensed, threatening to escape her bonds. Think of it less as an abduction, he said, and more as the next step toward your destiny. I blinked at him. My... what? Your destiny, little wolf. You were always supposed to be in this place here and now, so that I might transport you to where you need to be. I chose to ignore this in favor of something that seemed a bit more immediate. They say people go mad in Elfheim. Even if I believed a word you were saying, it doesn't seem like I'll be much used to destiny if I'm drooling and rocking back and forth in the corner. That will not be an issue, not for you. Tamlane insisted in a cold voice. Now come, we must hurry. Go to hell. I replied, planting my feet firmly. There was no way I was moving an inch with him. I ignored the little voice that urged me to throw caution to the wind and follow him. But all this talk of destiny? I was an outcast. What kind of destiny could I possibly have, beyond trudging back and forth to the nursing home, making barely enough money to scrape by in the human world? Tamlane wasn't a shifter. 
but he seemed to know about us, the unhelpful little voice whispered. Maybe if I went with him, I would have a chance to transform more often. Maybe in Elfheim, I wouldn't have to worry about other shifters coming for me. Maybe I could just be left alone? Don't be ridiculous, I chastised myself. Things don't just work out like that, at least not for someone like me. I studied the man before me, wondering how old he might be. His face and body were youthful enough, well-muscled and smooth-skinned. But something behind his blue gaze appeared incredibly old, weary even. He looked like he'd seen too much during his life. There was a grimness present in him that made me think his white blonde hair might be hiding some gray. Tamlane appraised me silently in return. Suddenly I just wanted to be somewhere else, away from the intense eyes now boring into me. Anywhere else. His blue eyes narrowed. I will not be going anywhere except back to Elfheim, with you, now come. He commanded. My wolf's self-control snapped. Before I could stop it, she exploded into being with a snarl. My clothes ripped as my body twisted, unexpectedly changing form. My hind legs were still tangled in my torn jeans, which gave me just enough of a pause to regain a hair's breadth of control. Had I not been effectively hobbled, I probably would have lunged straight for Tamlane's throat. Instead, I wrested back control from my animal nature long enough to wriggle free of the remains of my human clothing and flee. Scrabbling toward the mouth of the alley, I turned and charged flat out down the street, as fast as my four legs could carry me. Although she was still angry at the loss of control, my wolf rejoiced at the freedom to run. I was stretching my body in ways that I hadn't in a very, very long time. I could feel the asphalt under the pads of my feet as I pushed myself even faster. Mouth open, tongue lolling as I panted, I could taste the air. To my relief, there were no humans nearby. No one would see a lone wolf racing through the middle of town. The fact that this was a bad area worked in my favor. Most people around here only came out for nefarious purposes this late at night. There was no way Tamlane would be able to pursue me at this speed. Not on two legs. I was flying, racing for the trees on the edge of town. I was willing to risk spending more time as the wolf to ensure that I got away from Tamlane. With that distinctive scent of his, I was sure I would be able to smell him coming for miles. As soon as I'd thought it, I became aware of another form coming up fast behind me. Glancing over my shoulder without breaking stride, I saw an eerie white glow. Blinking hard, I let out a growl and squinted back towards my pursuer. It was another wolf. As the glowing white animal closed the distance between us, loping with an easy grace, I caught a whiff and immediately recognized Tamlane's primeval forest scent on the wind. I almost stumbled, so great was my confusion. Wait, so he was a shifter after all? My wolf pushed the thought away, her instinct to fight rising once more, now that flight was obviously impossible. I was running as hard as I could, my breath coming in rapid pants, even as he drew up to my shoulder, as though this was nothing more than an easy stroll for him. Maybe my wolf had a point. With a snarl, I lunged sideways, trying to snap my teeth around the scruff of his neck. I was so angry at this point, I would have liked nothing more than to put him on his back with my jaws around his throat. I wanted to see him grovel on his belly, and then shift back to human, so I could tell him to crawl back where he belonged and leave me the fuck alone. To my surprise, my teeth closed around thin air with a sharp snap. He'd been right there, but the instant I'd moved, He'd leapt away from me as quick as lightning, spinning around and colliding with my shoulder. I stumbled, but managed to keep my feet underneath me. I ran wide before turning back and leaping at him once more, intent on slamming my full weight into his white flank. Again, I met nothing. I landed hard and off balance against the pavement, my claws making a terrible scraping noise against the asphalt as I wheeled around, ready to charge again. To my fury, he was sitting calmly, not even panting as I hurtled forward, my teeth flashing as I opened my mouth wide, trying to grab his leg. He sprang effortlessly straight into the air, while I tumbled over and over across the ground. I landed on my side, 
The wind knocked out of me as a mass of white fur and sharp teeth landed on top of me. I was completely pinned down, despite the frantic scrabbling of my back legs. There was no way I was wriggling free of his incredible strength. My wolf recognized the defeat an instant before I did. With an instinctive movement, she bared our throat, surrendering to him. With a whimper, our gaze dropped. A moment later, I felt his weight shift off me. He was in human form again, his pale hair mildly disheveled after our tussle. He was fully clothed, and unlike his hair, the buckskin and linen clothing looked as fresh and clean as it had in the alley. Crouching next to me, he reached out and placed one hand on my furry head. I had only a second to think disjointedly that it felt kind of nice. Then, a surge of energy passed through my body, and with a twisting wrench, I, too, was back in human form. Unlike him, however, I was lying on the street, covered in bruises from our fight. I thought you weren't a wolf, I accused breathlessly. I am not, Tamlin answered. At least, not unless it is convenient to be so. He seemed entirely indifferent to my plight, as I lay battered and humiliated on the ground. At least he was no longer holding me down. Small mercies. At that moment, it occurred to me that I was completely naked, having ripped my way out of my clothes when I shifted. Apparently, I'd already spent too much time among humans, because I felt distinctly uncomfortable as he glanced over my body with a frown. He reached out again, and I flinched away. At that he paused, his brow furrowing. I have need of you, little wolf, it is true, but not for that, he said, and reached his hand toward me more cautiously this time. I held myself still with an effort. With a complicated gesture over my body, he spoke low words in a language I didn't understand. When I glanced down, my clothing had reformed around me, perfectly clean and undamaged. Thank you. I said cautiously. He gave a single nod of acknowledgement and stood, pulling me to my feet with him. His unexpected kindness surprised me. For as cold as he'd acted, I'd expected him to drag me away naked, even if he didn't intend to actually assault me. Right now, though, I had more pressing problems. If you're not a wolf, then how? I began. But he interrupted me. I told you, I was a wolf because I needed to be. I am Fay. I can change form to suit my needs, but that does not truly make me a wolf or a tiger or an eagle. The words were clipped. I blinked. You can become an eagle? This discussion is not relevant to the task at hand, he said sharply as he raised a hand in front of him. We are leaving now. With a slow, deliberate motion and a muttered word in that same strange language, he passed his hand in a circle in front of him. At first, it looked like nothing would happen, but then a swirling vortex opened up in midair. I shuddered in sudden fear. Were all the myths of my people actually true? The elders had told us stories of powerful magicians who could travel between Elfheim and the normal world, kidnapping shifters and taking them away as slaves to a land that might drive them mad. I had always scorned the notion of that kind of magic. Yet before my eyes stood an impossible portal. I gaped at it, frozen in place. Without another word, Tamlane gripped my elbow and pulled me into the vortex. The swirling currents surrounding me made my stomach churn. I opened my mouth to cry out in fear, but the sound never reached my ears. The rushing wind sucked it into the void the moment it left my lips. I clamped my eyes shut, wanting to throw off Tamlane's powerful grip but terrified that doing so would leave me trapped in this chaos forever. Instead, I clenched my fists tight. As quickly as it had started, it was over. My feet slammed into unfamiliar, soft turf. We were no longer standing on a street in the human city of Rockville. Terror gripped me, so intense that I didn't dare open my eyes. Instead, I reached out with my other senses, trying to understand my surroundings without truly having to acknowledge what had just happened. Wind carried the sweet smell of nature to my nostrils. The scent made me want to breathe it in deeply, and I realized that it reminded me of Tamlane. 
Carefully, I peeled open one eyelid and glanced around. Shock rooted me to the spot, and both eyes shot open, taking everything in. I blinked rapidly, but the vision in front of me remained unchanged. Everything was... so green. The Pacific Northwest was a lush area by any measure, with evergreens standing high on the sides of mountains, marching down to the sea. This made everything I'd seen on Earth seem pale by comparison, a lifeless landscape shrouded in dust. Elfheim was beautiful, not just beautiful, but stunning, in the literal sense of leaving me stunned, speechless. The rich golden light dazzled my eyes, and I found myself squinting, as though I were trying to stare directly into the sun. Everything glowed. The smell of flowers was so intense it was making me dizzy. I turned to find Tamlane standing at my side, watching me watch his world. The question that I had been about to ask died on my lips as he waved a lazy hand towards the open portal. It snapped shut. Wonder at my surrounding faded beneath the growing realization that I was now trapped in this strange, disorienting world of Elfheim. I was Tamlane's prisoner. Eight. Despite the grim realization that I was trapped in the Fey realm, the wolf inside me was overcome with delight. The world around me was stunning, painted in colors I had never imagined, and with sweet fragrances floating on the wind. I wanted to run, wild and free, until my four legs could no longer carry me. I imagined flopping down in the soft grass and letting the sun warm my pelt. No more cold, dreary Rockville skies. I shook my head sharply, trying to banish the fantasy. I needed to concentrate. The human in me knew that I was being held as a prisoner, or maybe more like a hostage. I had to keep my wits about me. Come, Tamlane said solemnly. I have a place arranged where you may stay in safety. He led me towards a tall hill covered in blowing grasses. The shimmering sea of green before us was mesmerizing, and for a moment, all I could do was stare. No, I replied, my eyes never leaving the scene in front of me. I felt him stop and tore my eyes away, taking in his stony expression. No, I said again, my voice stronger. Not until you explain some things. Until you do, I'm not going anywhere with you. You don't have much choice, little wolf, he reminded me. Unless you plan on wandering around an unfamiliar realm with no way to return to the other side. My gaze drifted towards the sky, which was tinged with colors like the northern lights, if the northern lights happened during daylight and came in every shade of the rainbow at once. Maybe I will. It's an interesting place. I wouldn't mind having a look around, I retorted. Tamlane didn't laugh exactly but there was definitely a note of amusement in his tone. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. Stubbornness has always been a shifter trait. Regardless, I said, tearing my attention away from the mesmerizing play of light in the sky. I want to know the truth. What did you mean before, about your world hanging in the balance? What does Elfheim have to do with me? Tamlane stared at me for a moment, appraising. Then he walked over to a large boulder and sat down. Tell me about your control of storms, he shot back, rather than answering the question. That's not... I started to say, but Tamlane held up a hand to stop me. No, no deflection. You know of what I speak. Answer the question, he said. I floundered for a moment, off balance. There's nothing to say. He raised an eyebrow. Nothing? Really? So you've never noticed storms descending when you're upset. And here I thought wolves were supposed to be canny. I opened my mouth to deny it, and couldn't. To my annoyance, there was a knowing look in Tamlane's crystal blue eyes. It made me want to snarl at him. Instead, I shrugged my shoulders. It's nothing. Just a coincidence. What else could it be? I'm nothing and nobody. His lips thinned as he stared at me. When I didn't speak, he gestured impatiently. Then perhaps you can tell me more about these... coincidences. His tone dripped irony. I hesitated. 
But maybe this would be the quickest way to convince him it wasn't the huge deal he seemed to think it was. One time when I was being... I paused, not sure how to explain without sounding like a pathetic runt of the pack. Annoyed by a group of shifters, it got a little windy all of the sudden. We were living on the side of a mountain. The weather was unpredictable. He pinned me with a flat stare. I could tell he knew there was more, and I scowled. Who was this guy? What was he? It felt like he'd seen every corner of my life and already knew all the answers I didn't want to give. Like he just wanted to hear me say it out loud. I couldn't figure out what any of it meant, and I was growing frustrated with the games. Why wouldn't he answer any of my questions? Fine, I snapped. Inside me, the wolf growled low. I was with a co-worker the other day in the human city where you found me. We were attacked by a group of drug addicts. They were looking for money, and they threatened to kill my friend. I was going to transform into a wolf and rip their throats out, but an earthquake and a storm hit at the same time, saving me the trouble. End of story. He nodded slowly, as if I was confirming all of his suspicions. What? I demanded, feeling irrationally defensive. He didn't answer, but continued to nod as he stared out over the horizon, pursing his lips thoughtfully. The other day? He pressed. That's oddly non-specific. All right. Yesterday. I admitted reluctantly. Why are you asking me this? I answered your questions. Now you need to answer mine. He looked into my angry, determined face and sighed. Those were no storms, Wolf. They were Earth and Elfheim colliding. I blinked, in hopes that his matter-of-fact explanation might start making sense if I replayed it in my head a few times. Nope. No such luck. Colliding? I finally asked. What does that even mean? They're separate realms, right? Like, different dimensions? It's impossible. I assure you it is not. You were pulling our two worlds together in your anger, and where they touched, it caused damage. I stared at him remembering how the wind had blown fiercely, but hadn't seemed to affect me, as though I were somehow a part of it. The damage done on Earth yesterday was extensive, Tamlane said in a soft voice. The damage here in Elfheim was catastrophic. I watched him for several long moments, waiting for the punchline of the joke. It reminded me of a stupid show I would put on the television for the nursing home residents, where humans would play pranks on each other resulting in varying degrees of humiliation. He stared back at me, his face impassive. Finally, I shook my head in negation. Bullshit. He cocked his head at me, curious. You think I'm lying, little wolf? I know you're lying. I squared my shoulders. I admit it. I've accepted Elfheim isn't a myth, okay? But the idea that the two worlds in different dimensions can somehow slam into each other, and that I was the one who caused it? That's ludicrous. Faye cannot lie. The words carried the weight of an unbreakable maxim. I am Faye, therefore my words are truthful. In my pack, the pups were told stories about the magical inhabitants of Elfheim. It was true that the fables insisted Faye couldn't lie but the point was to teach youngsters the value of honesty. Not that it was actually real. Then you're just mistaken, I replied. Because, listen, Tamlane, like I said, I'm nobody. I don't think you really grasp that. I'm an illegitimate shifter exile living in the human world, working a dead-end job with too much month left at the end of the money. The only reason why I haven't starved to death yet is that I can go into the forest and hunt rabbits for food. He looked at me without the slightest trace of pity. I'm nobody. I repeated to emphasize my point. Why would someone like me have that kind of power? The only logical answer is that I couldn't. I don't. So, sure. Maybe Faye can't lie. But you can obviously be wrong about things, because you are 100% wrong about me. Foolish wolf, this power is in your heritage, Tamlane said, his tone growing clipped. It's in your very blood. Now I have answered your question, and it is not my concern if the answer is not to your liking. Come with me. 
He rose to his feet and started walking, not even bothering to glance at me to see if I was following. The reality was clear enough. I could either go with him, or I could wander around lost in a dangerous and unfamiliar realm. Bravado aside, that didn't sound like it would go well for me, despite what my wolf seemed to think. The whole thing was insane. Fine. Elfheim existed. It wasn't as though I could deny that part, under the circumstances. But the rest of it? A rustle off to my right made me jump, brushing into Tamlane as I spun to meet what I assumed would be an attacker. A figure moved through the trees, half seen. My wolf's senses prickled in interest. The creature is not concerned with you, Tamlane said, sparing me a quick glance. Do not be concerned with him. Him? I asked, confused. The shape emerged into a shaft of light and I stared in fascination at a large, horse-like beast. Yet how could a horse be that tall? I'd seen human riders in the mountains a few times. I'd even petted a horse once. It had been afraid of me at first, its nostrils flared and snorting. But I'd had some human candy in my pocket and shared a peppermint, making a fast friend in the end. None of the horses I'd seen before had been anywhere near this large. Dark, luminous eyes turned towards me, and that was when I noticed the most amazing feature of all. A large, white horn stood out three feet from the horse's head. It was pearly and spiraled, glistening in the odd light. A unicorn? I breathed in shock. The unicorn stared at me for a long moment, tore off a mouthful of grass, and meandered on his way. Is every myth we were told as pups actually true? I demanded, whirling to face Tamlane. Probably not, he said, and continued on his way. I trailed behind him, letting my gaze wander over large pink mushroom rings and trees with purple leaves the size of my face. Soft, bell-like laughter reached my ears, and I saw glittering figures flying through the air, weaving in and out of the tree branches. They were small, just slightly larger than my hand. Their voices were high-pitched as they giggled and chatted together in a language that I couldn't understand. With my mouth open, I watched as they buzzed around like insects. Do try not to get distracted, Tamlane called in a dry voice. The wolf inside me was jumping around, delighted. I felt the instinct to transform and allow myself to run around, my nose to the ground. I wanted to explore every inch of this world with my heightened animal senses. I couldn't say how long we walked, but we trekked deep into the heart of the forest. The leaves above us were purple and yellow here, complementing each other as the light flickered through them. A deep blue stream, crystal clear, wound its way along the path we were taking. I wondered if it was safe to drink. Could there be anything poisonous in Elfheim? This place seemed so much like heaven that it seemed wrong for anything to be truly dangerous. And yet, I couldn't help wondering how many visitors had felt the same way, only to come to some horrible end. Elfheim drives humans and shifters mad, the story said. We're here. Tamlane finally said, several long minutes later. I looked up, shaken free of my distraction. Ahead of us, a beautiful cottage made of white stone nestled between the boles of two huge trees, they were easily twice as big as any tree I'd ever seen on Earth. The cottage fit so perfectly between them that it was as though it had grown there, right along with the rest of the forest. Okay, wow, I breathed. This will be your safe harbor for now, Tamlane said. He approached without hesitation and pushed open the door without knocking. I hesitated, suddenly nervous, but Tamlane shot me an impatient look. With few other options, I followed him into a cozy, perfect little front room. A fire in the hearth crackled merrily, giving off the perfect amount of warmth. Dianthi, Tamlane said, as though in greeting. With a jolt, I realized we weren't alone. Disquiet flooded me. How had my wolf not noticed the tall figure who rose from a chair in the corner to approach us? She was female and moved with a sort of lethal elegance that made my heart ache. Her long, fiery red hair hung in a simple braid tossed casually over her shoulder. 
Her eyes, a bright green, studied me with the same intensity I was using to study her. This is your wolf? She asked, no expression in her voice. Yes, Tamlane said. Deanthe, this is Ember Valentine, formerly of the Greystalker pack. Ember Valentine, this is Deanthe. I didn't know Elfheim's courtesies, so I lowered my chin in cautious acknowledgement. Deanthe has been a loyal comrade of mine for many centuries, Tamlane explained. She has graciously agreed to assist me in this matter. In other words, he'd be lost without me, Deanthe said, with a wry twist of her full red lips. That's what I'm hearing anyway. Is that what you're hearing? Tamlane didn't roll his eyes, yet somehow his impassive expression managed to convey a sense of fond exasperation. How fortunate you agreed to assist me in that case. His blue gaze returned to me. She will be remaining here with you as a guard. Guarding me from other people? Or guarding me like a prison guard? I asked sharply, once again growing annoyed. And where are you going to be while she's busy guarding me? Seriously, if you were going to kidnap someone from another realm, it only seemed polite not to dump her at the first opportunity afterward. To no one's surprise, Tamlane ignored me. You will be safe here for the time being. I have cast wards around the forest to ensure that there is no surveillance. You cannot be tracked while you are here, and your presence will not be noticeable to the average being. Average being? I echoed blankly, only to be ignored again. Do not set one foot outside this forest, he said very seriously. However, within those bounds, you may come and go as you please. Great, I observed flatly. Tamlane turned towards Deanthe and grasped her shoulder. Take care. I cannot overstate the importance of keeping her out of Oberon's hands, and I want both of you safe when I return. Deanthe raised a wry eyebrow. Of the two of us, I think you face the greater peril, Tam. And okay. That sounded... ominous. Perhaps. Tamlane replied, pensive. He turned to me. Deanthe will be your protector and guide, little wolf. The woods are your haven, but they can still be perilous. I blinked at him. So just to make sure I have all of this right. You break into the human realm. Track me down. Chase me. Fight me. And then ultimately kidnap me into another dimension without a way for me to return. Then, you decide to just leave me here in a cute little fairy cottage with your girlfriend? Tamlin looked mildly irritated but Deanthe smiled widely at me. Her eyes darted back and forth between the two of us. Ooh, I like this earthling Tamlane, she said. I wasn't sure whether to be flattered or freaked out, so I continued glaring at Tamlane instead. This may come as a shock, he drawled. But with my world falling into chaos and you standing at the epicenter, I currently find myself rather busy. There are many important people with whom I must consult. Consult about me, you mean? I shot back. If that's the case, then it seems like I should be there too, don't you think? Tamlane didn't smile. Believe me when I say to call such a thing ill-advised would be a considerable understatement. With an economical gesture of one hand, he opened a portal in midair, exactly like the one that had brought me to Elfheim in the first place. For one wild second, I considered diving through it, just to see what would happen. Before I could act, however, a firm hand closed on my arm. Tamlane stepped through the portal and vanished. It snapped shut an instant later. I slumped, defeated. I'd missed out on my opportunity. Dianthe studied me as she removed her hand from my arm. Are you well? Ember Valentine of the Greystalker Pack? I pressed my lips together, feeling the frustration of the moment building up inside of me. I wasn't really sure how to answer her. I blew out a slow breath. Yeah, terrific. This is just a lot to take in, as you can probably imagine. Who the hell is Oberon? And I mean, what is all of this even about? Deanthe turned and started moving around the cottage, hanging a pot of water over the fire to boil. In his defense, Tamlane truly is very busy, she said absently. He was tasked with obtaining you and bringing you back here. To answer your first question, Oberon is our king. You do know what a king is, right? 
Well, yes, I replied. Obviously. She smiled in relief. Oh, good. Humans and human adjacents are a rather strange bunch, so I never know for sure. Right, I said uncertainly. So, why would this king guy take an interest in me? Is this about Tamlane's crazy theory? Deanthe smiled, but her eyes held disquiet. It is better if you learn the details from him. You must have patience. I eyed her. Well, since I'm trapped in a strange dimension with Fae, a handful of pixies, and one very large unicorn, you can hardly blame me if I'm a little less than tolerant. Deanthe took this in with a nod. I understand. I hadn't expected her to give in quite that easily, so I didn't press my luck about what I really wanted, which was to explore until my wolf was satisfied, and then be allowed to return home. Are you hungry? Deanthe asked. Famished, I told her. It was true. My stomach was aching with hunger. Then let's go find some food, she suggested. Sure, I agreed, in the absence of better options. I started towards an area of the kitchen and opened one of the shelving doors, only to have a huge puff of dust hit me in the face. I coughed and sneezed, waving my hand around and trying to clear the air for me to breathe better. No, no, my dear, Deonthe said with a laugh. I was thinking something a little fresher. I wrinkled my nose against the dust. What do you mean? You are a wolf, are you not? Do you feel up for a hunt? She asked, a twinkle of excitement kindling in her green eyes. My wolf perked up in response. That sounds... good? I said cautiously. Inside, however, the wolf was excitedly dancing the canine version of the conga. The wild part of me was so excited and eager to shift that I could feel the ripples through my body. I was about to burst from my clothes and I needed to pull myself together. This could be useful, I told myself. I could do a little bit of exploring this way. Reconnaissance, for lack of a better word. I nodded my agreement. Okay then, I told Deanthe, more enthusiastically than before. Let's hunt. The glint of enthusiasm shone brighter in Deanthe's eyes, and she grinned at me. Her teeth looked a little sharper than human, and I couldn't help but smile tentatively back, recognizing a fellow predator when I saw one. Let me show you where you'll be staying first, she said, waving for me to follow her. We walked down a narrow hallway with field stone walls. I could feel the drastic change in temperature from the warmer front part of the cottage. I ran my hands along the rough edges of stone, wondering who had built this cottage here in the heart of a fey forest. The unfinished rock felt the same as rocks on Earth, yet the whole structure had a distinctly magical feel. This is where you'll sleep, Dianthe told me, pushing open a heavy wooden door. You can undress here before you shift, since I know you only have one set of clothes with you. Something about the door reminded me of the jailhouse I'd stayed in the night before I was exiled, and I had to repress a shudder. Thanks, I managed, and disappeared inside. Fortunately, the inside of the room was cheery and bright, completely different than my earthen cell, even if it was also a prison of sorts. After changing out of my clothes and into my wolf form, I padded out of the room, using my nose to push open the door. In this body, the scents surrounding me were overwhelming. It was nothing like Earth, and I longed to explore more of it. In some ways, it was harder to control the instinctual desires of the wolf now that I'd ceded physical control to her, but I pushed forward and found Deanthe standing at the front door. She was armed with a bow and a quiver of arrows. She stared at me as I stalked forward, giving me an approving nod. I cocked my head at her. You'll do, she said, and led me outside. Without any further warning, Deanthe launched across the carefully tended yard and plunged into the trees. My claws tore into the ground as I streaked after her, feeling a wild happiness as the brightly colored forest blurred around me in a dizzying display of hues and fragrances. The hunt was on, and my wolf was exactly where she wanted to be. Nine. I closed distance between us as Dianthe circled around a clearing, 
her body crouched low to the ground. Even to my wolf senses, she was barely making a sound. I panted silently, tasting the air and taking stock of the animals in the vicinity. Although things on Elfheim were similar to Earth in some ways, the differences were still significant. I could hear animals that resembled squirrels scurrying up and down the trees, leaping above our heads from branch to branch, yet they remained in the air far too long. Everything here breathed magic and power. We had tracked a beautiful golden panther for a long time through the trees, until Dianthe got a good look at the creature and shook her head. Too powerful, she'd whispered to me, turning away. In my wolf form, I stared across the riverbed, separating us, watching the massive predator slip away. I let out a soft whine and Dianthe laughed. You'd be turned into panther food in two seconds, my piebald canine friend, she informed me, jerking her head in the opposite direction. I could hardly argue that, especially given how little time I'd spent in wolf form as opposed to human form. It felt amazing to stretch my legs, to really give free rein to my abilities and my senses. I'd spent so much time terrified of being discovered as a wolf that I had only hunted when it was unavoidable, taking only enough prey to keep from starving and no more. This was different. I wanted to speak to Dianthe, but transforming back into a human would mean I'd have to stand before her naked. There was something so coolly intimidating about this fey shield maiden that I couldn't bring myself to do it. But I really wanted to hunt a unicorn. Not for food, not to kill. Just to see if I was good enough, strong enough, powerful enough. As though my thoughts had transferred directly into reality, Elfheim provided. We walked towards the river, and I could hear galloping hooves on the other side. As the herd passed us by on the opposite side of the water, I could only stare. The brilliantly white creatures with pearly horns tossed their great heads, manes flowing easily down their necks. The magic around them was palpable. I watched them go, twitching a bit as Dianthe raised a hand in a clear gesture to stay hidden. In my human thoughts, I knew she was right. Like the golden panther, they were too much for a lone wolf and one fey hunter. In the end, we tracked a herd of ordinary deer. Well, I say ordinary. Their coats were deep red, the color of autumn leaves. With an economical movement of one hand, Dianthe gestured me to skirt around the clearing. I crept away, my belly almost touching the ground as I made my way to the back of the herd. She hadn't said a word, but I had grasped her plan immediately. It felt as though we had hunted together for years. We were two parts of the same whole working seamlessly together on the hunt. It was almost like being part of a pack again. Out of nowhere, the loneliness that I had suppressed for months reared up. I longed for the sense of wholeness that came from being a part of something larger than me. I reminded myself forcefully that I was a prisoner here on Elfheim, held against my wishes. These were facts I knew as a human, but as a wolf, it was more difficult to keep priorities like that at the forefront of my thoughts. I became more instinctual, working on emotion rather than logic. Centering my thoughts, I shook myself and heard the soft sound of my fur rustling in the still air. One of the deer looked up, and I froze. Eventually, it lost interest since I was downwind and went back to its meal. I needed to focus, or we would lose this kill. After several long minutes, I was finally in position, directly behind the herd. I gathered my powerful hind legs underneath me, teeth bared in anticipation. With a powerful lunge, I sprung forward. I was flying through the air, my front paws outstretched as I landed a mere yard or two from a large deer at the edge of the herd. It startled in surprise and bounded away. An instant later, the entire herd scattered in terror, but most were headed towards Dianthe, still hidden among the trees. As I pressed them forward, I saw her swing around and release an arrow. It pierced the heart of a young buck, and the animal was dead before it hit the ground. My tongue lolled out appreciatively. It wasn't a cheeseburger, but it would do. I was so hungry that I could have gorged on the entire carcass myself. But I sat back on my haunches and watched as Dianthe field-dressed the meat. Her hands were quick and deft, completely sure of every cut. 
After spilling the contents of the chest and abdominal cavity, she reached out with bloody hands and held up the heart to me, steaming in the humid air. I tugged it free of her fingers delicately and wolfed it down in one swallow. She smiled at me as I wagged my tail, licking my lips. I thought about sitting up on my haunches, just as I had seen dogs around town do when they wanted something. It would be good to make her laugh. Maybe it would mean we could be friends. My wolf definitely felt like we were bonding over the experience, especially when she offered me the liver next. The organs were packed with nutrients, which, as I'm sure Dianthi knew, had been absent from my diet for many months. I knew I was a shadow of my former self, thin and drawn from near-constant hunger. Wolves aren't meant to be alone, I had often thought whenever I'd gone to bed with an empty belly, wondering if my failure to provide for myself meant I'd failed as a human as well as a shifter. With the meat properly dressed, Dianthi swung the heavy carcass over her shoulders, tied together at the feet by a length of rope. The cottage is this way, she said, satisfaction at a good hunt evident in her tone. I trotted after her, leaping up to sniff at the delicious aroma of the meat she carried on her back. She laughed at me and swatted at my nose. Stop that or I'll make you carry it, she threatened, a half-smile lifting the corner of her full mouth. Despite the heart and liver I'd eaten, my stomach was rumbling again by the time we made it back to the cottage. My hunger had even driven my fascination with the forest out of my mind as I trotted quickly back to my room. Once there, I closed my eyes and took a deep breath, mentally pulling my human skin back over myself. Muscle, bone, and tendon crackled and shifted. I stood up on my two human legs and hurriedly grabbed my clothes. I examined them thoughtfully, remembering the way that Tamlane had waved his hand and made them reappear on my body. These clothes barely fit me. I'd gotten them from the shelter I first lived at when I landed in my human life. They were thin from frequent washing, but they smelled as fresh and clean as if I'd just pulled them out of the dryer at the laundromat. Tamlane's powers were very... odd. Impressive, certainly, but still odd. I slipped on the clothes and walked out into the hallway, spying a small washroom with a basin of deep blue water. The same sweet smell that clung to my clothes hung in the air, and I splashed water on my face and neck. I rinsed out my mouth, never quite having gotten used to the aftertaste of raw meat as a human, and dried with a towel I found, rolled up on a set of low shelves. I ran my fingers through my black and white hair, trying to loosen the worst of the tangles. Feeling somewhat refreshed, I walked back to the kitchen, where I found Dianthe chopping up small roots that resembled potatoes and dumping them into a pot. She'd lit a fire in the low grate. Strips of venison were sizzling and popping as they cooked over the flames. The smell was delicious, so much better than the pathetic meals I served the residents of the nursing home. There were unfamiliar herbs floating in the pot of water, which hung next to the meat over the fire. This smells amazing, I said sitting in a chair near the fire. I wasn't cold, but there was something comforting about the familiarity of a merrily burning hearth in such a strange land. I'm not as good of a cook as many of my people, but I think you'll find this satisfactory, Dianthe said with a nod. The bread is a day old, so it may be a bit stale. I didn't care. Stale bread or not, this was a feast. I sat, watching Dianthe work. She was silent except for the occasional sound of an absently hummed tune. It wasn't uncomfortable, exactly. I could sense that this fay simply preferred the quiet. Dianthi, I finally said, my thoughts long ago having strayed back to my predicament. What am I doing here, really? She lifted her eyes casually to me, and then turned back to her stew. With a pair of tongs made of green wood, she carefully transferred the strips of meat into the boiling pot. What do you mean? She finally answered. You are here because Tamlin thinks this forest is the safest place for you. You know what I mean, I replied, frowning. Tamlin tracked me down on Earth to bring me here. He came to an entirely different realm for the sole purpose of kidnapping me, on the basis of a story that sounds totally crazy. I waited, 
hoping that my silence would prompt her to speak. To my surprise, it worked. He already told you that our world is in peril, and that you are in a unique position to save us. Countless lives are at stake, Wolf. So he says, I said, waving my hand in the air. But no one will say how. She glanced up at me before returning her attention to the food. I'm sure Tamlane will explain everything when he gets back. You think so? I countered. Don't you think I have a right to know now? I was brought here against my will in case you've forgotten. Her eyebrow flickered, though she didn't meet my gaze. Let's just say, I think this is a cause you'll be willing to get behind once you understand. That's a pretty bold assumption, I snapped. And one that's getting less likely the longer I'm kept in the dark? Deanthe sighed and pinched the bridge of her nose between her thumb and forefinger. I am not the person to explain it to you, she said, looking me squarely in the eye. It's not my place. Tamlane must be the one to explain about your heritage. My heritage? I scoffed. I'm a disgraced wolf. That's it. That's my heritage. So what? Deanthe shrugged and took the large pot full of steaming stew off the fire. Pouring me a bowl, she tore off a chunk of bread and handed everything to me, along with a spoon. I huffed in frustration, but it was like trying to get information out of a brick wall. I felt like we had the potential to be friends, but obviously... We were nowhere near the kind of friendship that included confidences like, why the hell did your crazy hot boyfriend bring me here? For lack of any better options, I started on the stew. After one spoonful, I was shoveling large bites in my mouth as fast as I could chew and swallow. Deanthe stared at me, but I ignored her, intent on getting as much food into my stomach as I could in the shortest amount of time possible. After all, there was no way of knowing when I would have another meal this good. When the edge of my ravenous hunger started to dull, I made a few more attempts at probing her with questions, but got nowhere. I finished my stew, thanked her for the meal, and returned to my room in irritated silence. It wasn't fair. How dare that fey bastard kidnap me, hold me here, and not even give me any answers about how I was supposedly going to save their world. I was just me. I couldn't even save myself. Had Tamlane not noticed that I was barely surviving as a human? There was no way that they could, or should, trust the fate of their entire world to me. I needed to understand more. I needed answers. I kept my clothes on, but took my shoes off and placed them neatly next to the bed before climbing in. With a sigh, I rolled so that I was facing the small window with my back to the door. My breathing grew slow and deep. Yet all the while I was listening intently to Deanthe with my heightened wolf senses. I could hear her every movement in the kitchen as she cleaned up her cooking utensils. I heard her take the rest of the stew down into the cellar of the cottage, where it would be cool enough to keep it from spoiling for a day or two. After she was done with that, she stood silently for so long, I wondered if I hadn't missed her leaving. The sun had long ago set behind the hills multicolored stars winking in the dark sky, visible through the gaps in the trees. Deanthe finally made her way down the hallway into the washroom. A few minutes later, she stopped outside my door, and I heard the slight creak of the hinges as she pushed it open. I stayed perfectly still on my side, my back still to the door. I let my breath ease in and out of my lungs, slow and deep like a real sleeper. She stayed long enough that I started to wonder if she could tell I was awake. To my relief, she finally backed out of my room with a sigh and softly pulled the door shut. I waited until her footsteps disappeared into the other bedroom and the door closed behind her before I sat up, still fully dressed under the blanket. Okay, screw this. It's past time for some answers, I thought, removing my clothes and standing naked in the middle of the floor. I couldn't leave yet. Deanthe would hunt me down in no time and drag me straight back here, I was sure. So I sat on the bed and counted slowly, waiting until I was certain the Fay Huntress was asleep. When I reached 5,000, I held my breath and listened for any sound of movement in the house. There was nothing except for the slow, steady breathing in the room next to mine. Deanthe was soundly sleeping, 
perfect. The bedroom window would be small for my human form, but the wolf could wriggle through. Thankfully, there was a latch on the inside, and the hinges made only the faintest of creaks as I swung it open. There was an interruption in the soft breathing next door, but it resumed again, moments later. I counted to a thousand again, just to be safe. Once I was fully confident that Dianthe hadn't woken, I transformed silently into the wolf, gritting my teeth against the discomfort of the shift. I leapt nimbly onto the bed and through the open window. When I dropped onto the earth, I looked around with my enhanced senses. It was quiet except for the chirp of insects and the scrabbling of small night creatures. My wolf was wildly excited. Twice in one day, her joy was intoxicating, but I rolled my eyes at my own ridiculousness. I shouldn't get used to having the freedom to transform at will. It would make returning to Earth that much more difficult. And I would be returning to Earth. I trotted away from the cottage, my ears cocked for sounds of pursuit. There weren't any. Problem number one. I didn't know where to go. I had a vague notion of doing some serious reconnaissance, but nothing more useful than that. Mostly, I couldn't stand the idea of being caged, even if it was a very comfortable cage. Sitting back on my haunches, I looked up at the sky to study the two large moons hanging above me. I suppressed a thoroughly self-destructive urge to throw my head back and howl for my pack. There were no other shifters here, and if there had been, they wouldn't have helped me. I was still exiled, even in this strange land. Tamlin and Dianthe said that I had to stay within the bounds of the forest for my protection, I mused. I wonder if that was a lie. Maybe they just don't want me to see what's beyond the forest? I had no idea what that might be, but in my mind's eye I pictured a large city. Could I disappear in a crowd? Find someone who would help me get back where I was supposed to be? Or would Tamlane sense me and track me down again? Did he already know I was gone? But that kind of speculation was pointless. I couldn't sit here worrying about Tamlane finding out I'd snuck away. He knew that I was a rebellious wolf. If he was smart, he probably would have expected something like this, which would make the rule about the forest that much more plausible. I shook myself sharply and took off, following the same track we'd taken to go hunting earlier. There had been a point where the trees had grown thinner ahead of us before we'd changed direction, and I thought I'd been able to see light peeking through. I returned to that spot, tracking our scents. To my wolf nose, the trail was as clear as day. Once I saw the thinning of the trees ahead, I left the path that Dianthe and I had used and crept forward, seeking the edge of the forest. To my surprise, I was only a hundred yards or so from where the trees came to an abrupt end. I stayed back, still hidden among the underbrush, and considered my options. There was nothing stopping me from following along the edge of the forest, just to see how far my confines went in every direction. Despite my frustration with being a captive, I was, in fact, hesitant to set foot outside of the warded forest. Tamlane hadn't explained, not properly. But he'd made it clear that I would be in danger if I left. I stared out through the trees, noticing flickering lights in the distance. Maybe they were campfires or torches. Tamlane hadn't really explained the living arrangements of his people. Were they city dwellers? Rural? Did they build castles? All of the above? None of the above? There was something on the horizon. That much was certain. A large structure that glittered with many flickering lights near the foot of a mountain. Or maybe it was just the cliff face reflecting the light of the two moons. I didn't think so, but I couldn't tell for sure from this distance, and curiosity was starting to get the better of me. Whatever it was, it was mesmerizing. It felt like the lights were calling to me. I inched my way forward, step by step, leaving the trees behind me. Despite the lure of the distant fires, I felt horribly exposed beyond the edge of the tree line. The hackles on the back of my neck stood up in alarm. I had the unpleasant feeling that I was being watched. No sooner than I'd decided to turn around and head back to the cottage, two loud electric noises ripped through the air. A pair of magical portals opened before me, and I backed away, 
crouched low and growling. Two male fae stepped through, each holding something that resembled a crossbow. I froze as both weapons were leveled at me. The threat was obvious. If I moved a muscle, I was dead. This was almost too easy, one of them said, sounding delighted. I'd heard shifters were little more than dumb animals. The other purred. His smile was more like a leer. Looks like it's all true. They stretched out their free hands, weapons never wavering as they muttered words I couldn't understand. A shining blue net appeared faster than a blink of an eye, surrounding me on all sides. I leapt sideways, trying to force my way over or through, but I couldn't get past it as it shrunk around me like a shimmering cage. Don't try to transform, Wolf, the first man advised with a harsh laugh. It'll be worse in your human form. Stupid, stupid, I swore at myself, looking around in desperation for a way out. There was none. The net had even stretched over my head. I wondered for a brief instant if I might be able to dig my way out, but that would take far too long. A female shout of anger echoed from the forest behind me. I turned to see Deanthe launching herself from the trees. Her mighty leap carried her in a graceful arc above me, her arm stretched behind her. Her hand held a blazing dagger, and her face was focused with determination as she sliced it across the top of the trap. It crackled and sizzled, like an electrical transformer that was about to blow up. With a flash that nearly blinded me, the strands of power forming the cage disappeared, fizzling to nothing. Deanthe landed in a crouch beside me. She pulled out a longer sword blade from a sheath strapped to her back. Wielding both blades at once, she stepped forward, drawing herself up to her fullest height and facing my would-be captors without a trace of fear. I was in awe, but before I had even a moment to consider what to do, Deanthe spoke over her shoulder, never taking her eyes off of my attackers. Don't let them catch you, Ember. The survival of both our worlds depends on it. Ten. A flash of light flooded the grass and trees around me, illuminating the brilliant colors for just a moment before the world faded back into the muted gray tones of nighttime. In the next instant, both of the blades in Deonthe's hands were ablaze with an icy blue fire. Run! she shouted charging forward and meeting the first blow. I wheeled around and darted back into the trees, trying to remember the rules about the protection of the forest. Would it hold now that they knew I was here? I wasn't so sure. With no better options, I stayed back, hidden by the darkness, peeking around the large base of a tree to watch as the fight went on and on. One of the attacking fae was armed with a heavy sword and the other with a spear. Deanthe moved as gracefully as a dancer, ducking and parrying every strike. A growl rumbled up in my chest. I wanted to be out there, helping her. Despite my questionable status as a prisoner here in Elfheim, I still felt the fragile bond of friendship with Deanthe tugging at my instincts. My wolf was eager to rush to the aid of my new fey packmate, but the human part of me knew that I would only make things worse by emerging from the questionable protection of the woods. The wolf huffed in irritation, as our eyes remained glued to the battle in front of us. Deanthe was a powerful fighter, but the two-on-one battle was stretching her capacity, especially since she was constantly trying to reposition her body between her opponents and my position hidden among the underbrush. The fay with the spear used the base of his weapon to launch himself high into the air, like a pole vaulter. At the top of the arc, he jerked his spear around so the point was aimed directly at Dianthe's heart. With a spring as fast as lightning, Dianthe flipped backwards, her arms and legs extended in graceful flight. The thrust fell short, but it was far too close for comfort. I held my breath. It felt like everything around me had turned to slow motion. Even the pounding of my heart sounded sluggish in my ears. Dianthe's feet touched the ground, and she raised her flaming blades in a flash. I blinked as time sped up again, sucking in a gasp. Deanthe rushed forward, her hair flying behind her, slashing at the air where the Fay's head had been a moment before. He dodged away from her, 
but nowhere near as gracefully as she had done. His spear remained lodged in the ground, now several feet away from him. As I watched, his face fell and he registered that he'd been disarmed. He leapt backwards again, in full retreat now. Instead of pursuing a weaponless opponent, Dianthe fell back, moving closer to the edge of the forest. I couldn't see the expression on her face, but her hands were tight on the hilts of her blades. She held them up, crossed defensively in front of her. You will go no further, she said in a low, commanding voice. Traitor! The remaining Fay hissed. You defy our king. You will die upon my sword, and then we will take your wolf. Dianthe let out a low, musical laugh, a sound of pure derision. My admiration for her courage swelled, even as my humiliation at my own cowardice grew. What kind of predator was I, huddling here in the forest while my new friend fought for both our lives? So I'm to die on your blade, am I? She said with false sweetness. You know, it's actually kind of cute how you think you can catch me. With that, her remaining attacker snarled and lunged for her. Dianthe swung her blades to block every strike of his sword, spinning the blows away from her body with sharp motions. In the next instant, the other fay appeared behind her. He was using magic, I was sure. I hadn't even seen him move. Too late, I howled out a warning. But Dianthe had already sensed the movement at her back and ducked the fae's recovered spear thrusting inches above her head. Before the two fae registered what she was doing, Dianthe rolled to her right through the grass, coming up on her feet. You have betrayed Oberon! One of the men yelled, his face darkening with anger. An orange glow like flames lit his eyes from within. I am loyal to Elfheim! She snapped. Can you say the same? Why do you fight for a mad king bent on an unwinnable war? I gaped at her from my hidden position. A what? God damn it. I seriously needed to drag some answers out of these people. All I know is that there are traitors in our midst. The first face snarled. All who betray Oberon will pay the price. The pair attacked again. Dianthe leapt between them, barely evading the blows they tried to land. I was starting to wonder if Fay ever got tired because the battle had already dragged on long enough that I was exhausted, merely from watching. The powerful blows continued to rain down, and I wondered how long Dianthe could withstand them. As though my thoughts had summoned the reality, Dianthe gradually began to flag. Her flips were slower, and when she landed, she staggered a little before righting herself. The spearman, too, seemed to be wearing out, and his attacks went wide as often as they landed true. Despite her growing exhaustion, Dianthe finally landed a slash across his chest. With a cry, he fell backwards, stumbling as he clutched at the injury. A look of shock painted his features, as though he hadn't believed she might actually best him. The other face shouted in rage. After a crushing sword blow that Dianthe barely managed to parry in time, she spun away from her attacker and tried to kick out, only to be caught in the air by her outstretched foot. The Fey swordsman brought her down to the ground with a horrible, fleshy thud. The breath caught in my throat when she did not immediately fight free and roll to her feet. Get up, I willed her silently, fear flooding my chest. Get up. With my sensitive wolf ears, I heard a low moan escape from her lips. She kicked out weakly, but her flailing attempts to rise were useless and uncoordinated. She got the wind knocked out of her, I thought fighting against the urge to race to her side. Or maybe a concussion? Her entreaty not to let myself be caught, no matter what, was the only thing that held me in place. The survival of both our worlds depends on it, she'd said. The other fay crouched over her prone body as she writhed, sneering down at her. The one she'd injured had his hand clamped across the slash in his chest. He murmured low words, and a golden glow emanated from the wound. A few moments later, he dropped his arm. There was no sign of the ugly gash except for the drying bloodstains on his tunic. You won't catch her, Dianthe rasped weakly. The one on the right laughed at her. Oh, I think we will, traitor. Yes. The formerly injured one agreed, hatred twisting his features. 
You see, we've just figured out the right bait to use. He reached down and grabbed a handful of Deanthe's hair. She choked on a cry of pain as he jerked her head back with a violent motion, exposing her throat. I watched, horrified as the other fay lifted his weapon. The blade of the sword swung down toward her neck, stopping a hair's breadth from her skin. The fay's hate-filled eyes trained on the trees where he knew I was hiding. Wolf, he called, his voice echoing around the forest. Come out now, or I'll cut her throat while you watch. We'll see just how long it takes for her to bleed out from the jugular. The other fay crouched over Deanthe, laughing down at her as he held her in place. She was panting rapidly through her mouth, her expression unafraid, but gray and pinched with pain. Such a fierce little traitor, he observed. A pity you strayed from the path. Oberon could have used a warrior like you. Come out now, wolf, the other snapped, his grip tightening on the sword. Or I will hack off this traitor's head. I couldn't stand another second. I charged forward, heart thundering with fear and anger, pulling my form inward until I rose on human legs and stumbled out of the woods. Stop! I cried, emerging from the trees with my hands raised. Deanthe jerked, struggling against her captor's grip. No, Ember, get back! I ignored her and walked forward slowly, my breathing ragged. My hands held at shoulder height, unthreatening. This was the wrong thing to do. I knew that. But I couldn't just stand by while these face sliced my friend's throat open. What would I tell Tamlane? Don't hurt her, I said. I'm here, okay? Just let her go, please. The fay with the sword sneered at my naked human form. Not much of a predator now, are you? Let her go, I said again, unable to keep my voice from shaking slightly. You've got me. You don't need her. The swordsman let out a harsh bark of laughter. Deonthe's glassy eyes burned into mine. Run, her expression said. Don't do this. I'm right here, I said desperately. I'm the one you want, right? There's no reason for anyone to die. No reason? The fay pinning Deonthe said in an incredulous tone. Traitors die, wolf. No other reason is needed. I met Deonthe's gaze, feeling like all the air had been punched from my lungs. She was staring at me with large, reproachful eyes. There was something accusing there, and it was obvious that she thought I was a fool for giving myself up. What did you expect me to do? I tried to communicate with my expression. I couldn't just stand back and watch them kill you. Deonthe gave a tiny, frustrated shake of the head, and I wondered for a crazy instant if she could somehow understand my thoughts. The fay with the sword stepped toward me, his face alive with malice. He raised his free hand and murmured an incantation, his fingers curling in the air. My arms and legs froze into rigid stiffness, locking me in place. The magic net fell over me again, but this time my invisible bonds grew tighter and tighter until I was gasping. What did you do? I demanded, relieved to find that at least my jaw still worked. A little something to ensure you can't escape again, the Fay explained. Don't fight it, wolf girl. It will go the worse for you if you do. I ignored his words, struggling to no avail against the magic trapping me. To my horror, the Fay lifted his sword once more, poised to bring it down on Deanthe's neck. For the briefest of moments, Deanthe turned her head so that she and I were looking at each other. There was resignation in her eyes that frightened me. I continued to fight the bonds holding me in place as the sword began its downward arc toward Deanthe's throat. No! I screamed, channeling all my strength into that single cry of negation. Complete silence fell over the forest for the barest instant, as though the very rocks and trees were holding their breath in anticipation. The fay halted his swing, his head jerking up. An expression of alarm slid over his features. For a brief moment, I had no idea why. But then I felt the wind around us pick up. It tugged at the fay's clothes, which snapped and blew in the sudden gale. What in Mab's green garden? The crouched Fay murmured, looking around with clear apprehension. I gritted my teeth, 
anger pulsing through my body. My hair flew wildly around my face. Around us, the grass blew flat against the ground. The wind surrounded me, placing me at the eye of the storm. Eyes burning with rage over what had almost been done to my friend, I allowed more and more anger to flow through me. The storm intensified in response. Trees uprooted and flew through the clearing, some of them missing us by mere feet. In the next moment, the Fey were knocked backward by the force of the gale. My two attackers tumbled through the air, hitting the ground with heavy force. The roar in my ears grew deafening, even as the magic holding me captive snapped. I narrowed my eyes, watching with something very like glee. The ground beneath us trembled and heaved. I rode it like a surfer cresting a wave, but Dianthe rolled and tumbled across the grass for several moments before she managed to push herself unsteadily to her feet. She swayed as the earthquake raged on, but made her way towards the other fay, both of whom were being tossed around like rag dolls. The ground heaved and split, and she went tumbling again. For some reason, the earthquake barely seemed to touch me. I crossed to Deanthe's side and helped her to her feet once more. She clung onto my arm, keeping herself upright as she stood on unsteady legs. With an explosion of noise that made us all look around, a crackling portal opened up before us, and a blinding white figure stepped through. The light was so all-consuming that I had to shield my eyes. Cease this at once, a familiar voice thundered. Squinting up, I followed Deonthe's tug on my arm as she pulled me down to the ground. As I lifted my face to the brilliant light, I recognized the silhouette as Tamlane, descending on us like an angry god. Oh, shit, I whispered, meeting Deonthe's wide-eyed gaze with my own. Eleven. Tamlane crossed the short distance separating us without so much as losing his footing on the heaving ground. He crouched and grabbed me by the throat, shocking me so badly that I didn't even think to resist as he pulled me upright. I was vaguely aware of Deanthe rising as well, placing herself between us and the Fey guards who'd attacked us. Tamlane's blue eyes snapped fire in the moonlight as he yanked me forward until only inches separated us. If you cannot control your emotions, I will kill you where you stand, he said with frightening coldness. My lip curled, as my barely controlled wolf contemplated snapping at his face. She still responded to him with the same contradictory mix of aggression and interest, neither of which was terribly helpful when my human half was abruptly aware of how big and male and close he was, coupled with how exceptionally naked I was. I gulped my throat working against the pressure of his hand. As though a switch had been flipped, my panicked fury over the threat to Dianthe's life drained away. Around us, the wind began to calm. The earth beneath our feet quieted. Better. He spat, his hand jerking away from the skin of my neck as though I'd burned him. He made a sharp, irritated gesture, and the familiar fabric of my clothes melted into existence around my body. I looked down, took in what had just happened, and looked back up to take stock of the situation. Horrible thoughts lurked just below the level of my consciousness, and I didn't dare examine them directly. Not yet. The two Fey had managed to regain their feet. Both of them were looking at Tamlane open-mouthed. The one with blood on his tunic spoke, disbelief coloring his tone. It's true, then. I could scarcely credit that Oberon's greatest general had turned traitor. You serve one Fey king, Tamlane said. I serve our entire world. You are harboring property that belongs to your ruler, said the other Fey. The words pricked at me. I knew they were important. I should have feelings about them, about being called property but I couldn't focus on them past the growing sense of horror that seemed to be opening up beneath my feet like a pit. Several things happened all at once. Deonthe gave a warning cry as the fay with the spear reared back to hurl it. At the same time, the other one called forth a ball of fiery magic and blasted it toward us. I had no idea if they were aiming at me or at Tamlane, but he swiped his hand out with a growl, and the magic slid past us to the side. The spear missed us by inches in the other direction, 
its owner toppling to the ground as he clutched at the hilt of Deanthe's short blade, now protruding obscenely from his chest, where she'd hurled it. Meanwhile, a terrible chill had crept over me, and I barely registered it when the second fae cursed and called a portal into existence. Stop him, Deanthe cried, flinging her sword at him an instant too late. The portal snapped shut, and he was gone. The blade buried itself in the ground a few feet past where the hole in reality had been an instant before. Damn and blast! She shouted, the sound echoing around the suddenly empty meadow. She whirled on Tamlane. He'll report straight back to the throne about this. Tamlane could have been carved from ice. I left you in charge of watching her. You knew she was unlikely to stay where she was supposed to. The tone was caustic enough to strip paint. And I was only seconds behind her. Deanthe shot back, equally cold. You might have mentioned that Oberon had guards monitoring the wards and ready to strike at a moment's notice. Had I known that was the case, I most certainly would have. Tamlin bit the words out. Under any other circumstances, I might have been mildly amused, or at least temporarily entertained by the sight of the two powerful fey bickering like an old mated couple. As it was, I couldn't stop looking around us at the scene of destruction. Destruction I had caused. There was no more avoiding it. I might have been able to delude myself back in the Packlands, and again in Rockville, when the junkies had threatened Anna. But apparently the third time was a charm when it came to my brain and its powers of self-deception. My knees stopped holding me up, and I sank to the ground, staring wide-eyed at the torn earth, downed branches, and crazily tilted trees surrounding us. Both of the Fae had turned to look at me when I collapsed beneath the weight of what I'd just done. What am I? I asked, barely recognizing my own voice. What's happening to me? Panic prickled at the edges of the numbness blanketing my brain, and the wind around us rose in muted threat. Deanthe hissed out a breath and came to crouch in front of me. Her strong hand closed on my shoulder in what felt like reassurance. She craned to look up at Tamlane. Enough of this, she said. You cannot expect her to understand if you will not speak. Speak of what? I whispered. What's going on? Why is all of this happening, Tamlane? The Fae still looked angry enough to spit nails, but after a long, pensive moment, he breathed out a sigh. It seems like a cruelty to place this on her shoulders when she is not truly responsible for her own actions, he said, directing the words to Deanthe. But perhaps you are right. All I could do was stare up at him, still lost to the horror of the thing. The damage done on Earth yesterday was extensive, Tamlane had told me after Rockville. The damage on Elfheim was catastrophic. Come, little wolf, he said, extending a hand down to me. He still appeared to be reining in his temper only with difficulty. Except now. I thought that his anger might not be directed at me, but rather at someone or something else. I let myself be hauled onto rubbery legs, supported between his grip and Deanthe's. A moment later, he opened a portal large enough for all three of us to enter. The two fae led me through, steadying me when I stumbled over uneven ground. The glowing ring snapped shut behind us, and I had to blink away the afterimages before I could make sense of the panorama before me. Elfheim's two moons illuminated a vast wasteland, stretching out into the distance. It was barren and churned, resembling nothing so much as the aftermath of an attack by an angry giant that had crushed everything into rubble. I stared at the jumble of rock and bare earth, my mouth agape. You are a child of two realms, Ember Valentine. Tamlin's voice was grave. He stretched a hand out to indicate the carnage covering the land. And this devastation is your legacy. Twelve. A child of two realms? I blinked out across the wasteland of destruction, feeling like I'd been hit over the head by a brick. This was nothing like storm damage spread over a few city blocks, or branches and trees damaged in a single section of forest. What does that mean? I demanded. Damn it, Tamlane! No more beating around the bush! You already know what I am, 
I'm just a wolf without a pack, an outcast. I don't have a fucking legacy. I didn't want a fucking legacy. Not if it looked like this. Tamlane appeared suddenly as old as the ravaged hills in front of us. He sat down heavily on a flat-topped boulder, staring out at the devastation the same way I was. You are not just a wolf, he said, the words falling to the ground between us with the weight of exhaustion. Tell me what you know of your father. My sire? I took a step back, a sick feeling roiling in my stomach. I don't know anything about him, except that he was a no-good loser who thought it would be fun to break up my mother's mate bond and then disappear afterward. Deonthe swallowed a choked sound, but when I looked, her face could have been carved out of marble. He has killed people for lesser insults than the one you've just leveled, Tamlane said, still in a monotone. I caught my breath, because Tamlane spoke like it was someone he knew personally. My father... is Fay. Try as I might, I couldn't make the words settle into place in my mind. Little Wolf, Tamlane said, Your father is the king of the Fey. That was enough to drag my eyes away from the lifeless wasteland. I gaped at him, my jaw hanging loose. You are harboring property that belongs to your ruler, one of my would-be kidnappers had said to him. The king of the Fey? King? Oberon? That... Makes absolutely no sense, I managed. The Fey King has nothing better to do with his time than pop across the Vale to Earth and play homewrecker with a female shifter? It's a bit more complicated than that, Tamlane said. Anger began to rise from beneath the sea of my confusion and disbelief. My mother's mate committed suicide when he found out she was pregnant with me. A sigh. Tamlane lifted his hand fingers squeezing at the bridge of his nose as though the entire conversation pained him. Oberon has long possessed a cruel streak. This entire fiasco began as nothing more than petty revenge. Revenge against who? I demanded. Revenge for what? Against his wife for protecting the child of a friend, Dianthe said, disgust evident in her tone. So he has a mate too? I asked in disbelief. With a sharp shake of the head, I muttered, of course he does. Why respect someone else's mate bond if you don't even respect your own? Our king respects very little, Tamlane said grimly. Because there is very little that he does not feel is beneath him. Titania, his queen, saved a female shifter who'd been exiled from her pack while pregnant. Deonthe said, taking up the story. They became friends of a sort. She took the shifter into her household as a servant and close confidant, and I imagine Oberon resented that fact. Our esteemed ruler desired to take the shifter's pup as a slave. Tamlane continued. A plaything so that Titania would not possess something that he did not. But she genuinely cared for her servant. She hid the babe away as soon as he was born. I know not where. Neither does Oberon, evidently. The pieces began to fit together, slowly revealing a picture. My stomach roiled, the wolf circling restlessly inside my mind. He decreed that if he could not have the slave he desired, he would create his own. Tamlane looked thoroughly disgusted. Two birds with one stone, Deonthe said, face dour. With a single act, he humiliated Titania for her moment of rebellion, while also bringing into being that which he so selfishly desired. I watched them both unblinkingly. You're telling me the King of the Fey sired me because his wife wouldn't hand over her friend's newborn pup for him to use as a slave? The words emerged flat. It felt like I was hearing myself speak them through a tunnel. Yes, Tamlane said simply. That is what we are telling you. I shook my head slowly back and forth. But that's... I began, only to trail off. What does any of this have to do with storms and earthquakes and huge fields of broken rocks? I flung a hand toward the destruction. Tamlane sighed again. It should not come as a surprise that Oberon had no interest in actually raising a child. Doubtless, if he'd acquired his original prize, he would have pawned the infant off on someone else until he was of age. The king was content to leave you on earth with your pack, though he did send a spy to watch over you until he was ready to pluck you away to Elfheim to serve him. An icy chill trickled down my spine. 
What spy? I asked, dreading the answer. Tamlane shrugged. Her name is Pavia, an oathbreaker with little choice but to perform any function the king asks of her, lest she be cast out and thrown to the wild hunt. I do not know what identity she took in your pack. He might not, but oh, I did. And the realization had me about two breaths away from puking up the remnants of Dianthe's venison stew. Geneva, I breathed. The mother figure who'd kept me from starving or freezing after my mother had been exiled, but who'd always seemed so odd and distant. Had she ever really cared for me at all? My entire history was crumbling around me, like the broken rocks in the wasteland before us. Ah, clearly you have an idea, Tamlane observed. But whatever the case, Pavia was tasked with keeping you safe until you came into your shifter powers, after which she would report back to the king that you were ready to take your place as his slave. Growing horror slid through my veins like icy flames. I staggered to another convenient rock and sank onto it. My breath was stuck in my throat, but around me the wind rose, tugging at Dianthe's clothing and Tamlane's long, pale hair. The female fay crouched before me and took both my hands in hers. Her skin felt warm, or was mine cold? Her wide green eyes bored into mine. Ember, she said. You must control your anger and fear. It's better to know the truth, even when the truth is painful. With a jolt, I remembered that when my emotions took over, I caused things like the wasteland before me, like the torn and gutted forest behind me. I swallowed hard, my breath releasing with a gasp. You still haven't explained about the destruction, I rasped. Tamlane nodded reluctantly. Originally, Oberon was only interested in his trifling revenge against Titania, but then Pavia reported back to him about your strange powers. A small, punched-out noise escaped my chest. Geneva! She'd seemed so interested in the odd windstorm that had appeared when the pack of bullies cornered me on the road. When Oberon heard her story, his plans changed. Tamlane looked grave. He thinks to use you as a weapon, a threat against Earth, unless the shifters and the humans submit to his rule. The Fae closed his brilliant blue eyes, his head bowed. I have served my king faithfully as his general for centuries, but now I am convinced that Oberon is going insane. I swallowed, licking my lips to moisten them. So you decided to kidnap me and hide me away, to keep Oberon from getting his hands on me? I asked. He nodded. I was tasked with retrieving you and bringing you to his palace. But doing so would place a weapon that can destroy worlds in the hands of a madman. I don't understand, though, I said. If that's the case, why bring me to Elfame? Why not hide me on Earth? Tamlane looked me in the eye, unblinking. Because you are growing stronger and because your emotions pull the worlds together. Wherever you are when you exert this pull, there is damage, but in the other realm, there is... He indicated the barren wasteland. This. Elfheim is our home. Deanthe said softly. If such damage must be done, we chose for it to be done. Elsewhere. It felt like Tamlane had closed his fingers around my throat again. So, just now, I made something like this happen. On Earth? I could barely get the words out. Yes. Tamlane said simply. I had thought that perhaps bringing you here would negate the effects of your powers. It hasn't. Instead, it has merely shifted the destruction elsewhere. I stared at him aghast. So what happens now, since that hasn't worked? His face was granite. I am consulting with those I can trust in hopes of finding a solution to the problem. However, if none can be found, I will kill you myself before I allow the two realms and all of their inhabitants to be destroyed by your powers. Thirteen. Tamlane's threat should have frightened me. Instead, I found myself gazing across the wasteland again. Every living thing had been crushed and buried, condemned to die in the blind destruction that I'd unknowingly left in my wake. 
I will kill you myself before I allow the two realms and all of their inhabitants to be destroyed by your powers. The Fey warrior's words echoed in my mind, and for that moment, I didn't care about the very real threat to my life. Of course he would kill me, rather than see worlds die. There were people here? I asked shakily. People? Lived here? I read the answer in Tamlane's expressionless face. Bitterness surged in my throat, a scream too large to claw its way out of my mouth. I covered my face with trembling hands, breathing heavily. How many people died in this destruction? I demanded, not caring that my voice quavered. Tamlane and Dianthe glanced at each other, a look passing between them. For some reason, the silent exchange made me even more afraid of the answer. The precise number does not matter, Tamlane replied, brushing some dirt off his sleeve. I could tell that he didn't want to have this conversation, and that was fair. Neither did I, but still... My voice was barely a whisper. I want to know. Silence fell for a long moment. Knowing the answer will not help you. Tamlane replied eventually, in a tone of finality. Those deaths were not your ethical responsibility. The blood is on Oberon's hands. The number must be huge, I realized with growing horror. If it had only been a handful of people, he would have said. Wouldn't he? Swallowing back my nausea, I looked away from Tamlane and Dianthe, not wanting to see their expressions of censure or compassion. My whole life had been a lie. I'd truly thought that Geneva had been the closest thing to a mother that I would ever have, but now I could see that she was just a pawn. She was just another tool used to orchestrate the horrors in my life. I'd been told for as long as I could remember that I was a waste of space, I was the product of something shameful, a stain on the pack. I was a bad influence on the legitimate, honorable pups that had been born after me. My only friend was another outcast, barely higher in status than I'd been. In that moment, I wanted nothing more than for Darby to be here, so I could fall into her soft arms and weep for everything I'd just learned. How many times had my tormentors insisted that it would have been better if I were never born? It was too many to count. And as my eyes roved over the pits of broken ground, the burned and torn remains of large trees with round trunks sticking up like abstract art, for the first time in my life, I truly agreed with the sentiment. It would have been better if I'd never existed. I wondered how many lives would have been saved if Oberon had never barged into our world and ruined my family forever by siring me. There was my mother's mate, for one. He would not have committed suicide because I'd been conceived. My life had brought the world nothing but suffering. A chill swept through me, so cold that I imagined my body turning to a sculpture made of ice. I couldn't move, could barely draw breath. Through it all, my heart beat traitorously in my chest, a steady drum that spelled life for me, but doom for others. I'm in shock, I thought a detached portion of myself taking stock of the strange sensation of cold. That's strange. With difficulty, I dragged my gaze back to Tamlane's haughty face. He was looking down at me, his expression unreadable. Maybe he was debating killing me here and now. It would probably be the safest course of action in his mind. I don't blame you, you know, I murmured. It would be the right thing to do. His brows drew together. What are you saying, little wolf? I didn't answer. My eyes strayed to the distant horizon, barely illuminated by the light from the two moons. A moment later, Tamlane stepped close in front of me, blocking the mesmerizing vision. I jerked in surprise, leaning back to put more space between us. What would be the right thing to do? Tamlane demanded again. I blinked, having no choice but to look at him. He was... So beautiful. Deanthe was a lucky woman in many ways. It would be right for you to kill me, I said in a monotone. My life is not as important as the lives of all the humans and fae I might accidentally kill. Their safety means more than mine. Plus, killing me would mean that Oberon couldn't have his crazy war. 
Tamlane cocked his head to one side, his expression unchanging. Something complicated kindled behind his blue eyes. When he spoke, his words were measured. That is true. No. Deonthi's voice was steely. Don't say things like that, Ember. We will find another way to fix this. When neither of us moved or spoke, she sighed and crossed her arms, glancing back and forth between us. Well, I think the first thing to do is obvious. I blinked. Is it? She glared at me. Very. You, little wolf, need to learn self-control. If the situation had been less dire, I would have snorted. Shifters in general were not particularly well known for their emotional self-control. And I didn't even have the support of my pack to help keep me on an even keel. That seems a rather significant undertaking. Tamlane observed, his tone dry as dust. I frowned at him, annoyed despite myself. Perhaps. Deonthi agreed. Yet it is straightforward enough. Ember needs to avoid getting angry or frightened at all costs, even when provoked. Sure, no problem, I thought. I'll get right on that. Tam Lane appeared similarly skeptical. She is a shifter. Self-control at that level isn't really in her nature. Even though he was right, I still threw Tam Lane a dirty look. He ignored it. You don't give her enough credit, Deonthi observed, staring pointedly at me. Does he, Ember? I turned my scowl on her. Yeah, it's no biggie. I'll just hang out here in a completely different world after being kidnapped from Earth, contemplating the fact that the King of the Fae wants to use me as a weapon in a massive war between the realms. I mean, there's no reason at all for me to feel anger or fear, right? Dianthe narrowed her eyes at me. Very funny. I glowered back. I'm not laughing. Neither am I, she said. We glared at each other for a long moment. Tamlane cleared his throat with the air of someone whose patience was running dry. I don't think either of you realize the bigger problem that we face. Bigger than her temper, you mean? Deonthi asked, jabbing her thumb in my direction. I growled at her, probably not helping my case. Tamlane only looked at her. You are forgetting Oberon. Deonthi winced. I could tell she understood what he was implying, even if I didn't. What about him? I asked, resigned. By now he knows of my deeds, and he will name me a traitor to the realm. He certainly knew already that you were here on Elfheim. The fact that guards were posted at the edge of the warded forest is evidence enough that he expected to find you here. You think he'll send more guards to search for her? Deonthi said. I imagine those two were just a test. Tamlane continued. Neither of them were particularly powerful, but they worked well enough to flush us out. He will send specialists next time. I cringed a bit at Tamlane's careful emphasis on the word. I had no idea of the extent of fey magical powers, but I suspected that I'd be happier not knowing what a specialist was capable of doing. I was beginning to understand that the king would stop at nothing to get what he wanted. Namely, me. I shivered, rubbing my hands up and down my arms. He won't give up, will he? I whispered. Both Tamlane and Deanthe looked at me, something like pity in their eyes. Is there nowhere that's safe? I asked, glancing back and forth between them. Nowhere at all? Deanthe looked uncomfortable, and Tamlane sighed again. It was answer enough. I thought back on my life, wondering how it was possible that it had been demolished so thoroughly in such a short span of time. Was it really only a couple of days ago that I was minding my own business, going to work at the nursing home? Was it only a few months ago that I'd still had my place, such as it was, among my pack? My pack. I hadn't allowed myself to really think about them during my months of exile. It was too painful to be separated from others of my kind. Now, though, my grief was tainted with something else. Betrayal. I thought of Geneva. I thought of all the years that she had protected me, insisted that I was fed and cared for, even in the most rudimentary way. I owed my life to her, and I'd thought it was because she'd cared for me. Now I realized that she was trading my life for her own. I didn't recognize the burn in my stomach, 
or the heat that flooded through my body until the wind around us started to pick up. Wolf, control yourself. Tamlane snapped, but I was already taking deep, steadying breaths. Within seconds, the wind retreated to a mere whisper. I looked around, distraught. What would a gentle wind here be like on Earth, though? I think we should return to Earth, I blurted, as though I hadn't just nearly destroyed the world again. Dianthe sucked in a breath between her teeth. Tamlane scowled. Why? He asked me, skepticism written all over his face. I took another calming breath, feeling my emotions ebb and flow inside of me. None of my mysterious power spilled out, though, and I felt safe enough to speak. We can question the King's spy in the Greystalker Packlands, I said, trying to sound reasonable. Geneva Padfoot, the one you call Pavia. We need to know exactly what she told Oberon and what her orders were. That way we can at least know what he knows. Tamlane looked grudgingly impressed. It's not a completely terrible idea. I shrugged, striving for an air of indifference. Do you have a better one? No. Tamlane said. At this point, I'm sorry to say I do not. Then I think it's our best option right now. He nodded silently, his expression growing thoughtful. Will you be able to control your emotions when faced with reminders of your past? I stared at my feet. For a moment, the pain and rage of my exile threatened to overwhelm me. But instead of the wind whipping around me, I felt the hot sting of tears behind my eyes. I blinked them away. These fae would not see me crying like an injured pup. I understand the consequences now. I assured him when I could be sure my voice was steady. I will not fail. I know there are lives at stake. He tilted his head to the side, studying me for a moment before he nodded. I suppose it's the best plan we've got right now. I'll stay here, Deanthe offered. I can try to gather as much information as possible from my contacts at court. My presence will draw less attention than either of yours would. In a hurry to get rid of me? I asked, trying for lightness and falling far short. The terror gripping my stomach was threatening to take control again, and I couldn't afford to let it. Oh yes. You're the worst shapeshifter I've ever shared a cottage with by far. Deanthe replied. Deadpan? I managed a slight smile for her. Really? How many others have there been? None. She said promptly. You're the only shifter I've ever met. Her gaze flicked to Tamlane. Are we agreed on this course of action, then? Tamlane nodded. Yes, I will contact you in the usual way. The... usual way? I asked, confused. You two do this kind of thing often, then? Tamlane didn't answer. Instead, he raised his hand and cast a portal into the air in front of us. For a moment, I stared into its depths trying to make out the world of my birth through the foggy mists. All I could see was a swirl of green and flashes of bright blue, the same color as Earth's sky. Abruptly and achingly, my heart longed for home. Despite my fascination with Elfheim and my deep desire to explore the new world I had just discovered, I could feel the call of the forest in my very soul. Go, Tamlane said. There is little time. I wanted to growl at him for being so cold and harsh all the time, but instead I turned to Deante, unsure what to say. She had nearly sacrificed herself to save me, and I needed to thank her. I couldn't bring the words to my lips, however. She smiled at me, a little sadly, and raised her hand in farewell as I let out a sigh of defeat and stepped through Tamlane's portal. As before, it felt like I was being dragged forward through space and time, the air sucked out of my lungs. As soon as my feet found dirt again, I gasped for breath, looking around at the shockingly familiar setting. I was indeed home. I recognized the path twisting through the tall trees. I had been forbidden from returning to the Grey Stalker lands under pain of death. Would they believe me that there was a traitor in their midst? Would Tamlane's glowering presence at my side convince them of the truth? Somehow I doubted it. But before I'd formed any conclusions regarding the best course of action, 
He stepped through the portal behind me and closed it. I wasn't sure you'd really bring me back. I admitted to him, my gaze wandering over my surroundings. As soon as I looked toward the west, my heart skipped and stuttered. Where there had once been a thick forest marching down the slope toward the coastline, there was now a deep scar gouged into the earth. It was plain to see what had happened here. This was another place, just like on Elfheim, that had been destroyed in one of my fits of rage. I stared around with wide eyes. Acrid bile rose in my throat. This is why you must learn control, Tamlane said tightly. I did this, I breathed. My God, how could I have done all this and not even known? You draw the two realms together with your fear and rage. Earth and Elfheim were never meant to inhabit the same reality. I shook my head slowly, as though in negation of his words. So this happened when... When you believed that Deanthe was in danger. All the trees, I murmured, my eyes feeling hot all of a sudden. All the wildlife that was here. Did I kill them all? Tamlane's blue eyes slid closed for an instant. When he opened them, they were burning with conviction. As I said earlier, you are not to blame. Well, I can't really blame Oberon, can I? I demanded, my shocked gaze still snared by the fresh destruction. You should. I certainly do, he said in a hard tone. This never would have happened if my king had not behaved selfishly and thoughtlessly. Or if I had learned some self-control in the beginning, I replied. You're young yet, Tamlane said. He, on the other hand, sounded old and exhausted despite his youthful features. I swallowed hard. It's hard not to feel responsible when the desolation is right in front of me. To that, he had no reply. We stood shoulder to shoulder in silence for a long moment, staring out over the sea of flattened trees and cracked boulders. How could I ever make this right? Fourteen. The enormity of the task felt like a boulder dropping into the pit of my stomach, leaving me breathless and reeling. Tamlin must have seen my reaction. His voice was gruff as he stepped close to me. His large frame loomed in my vision, blocking the destruction that lay beyond. Remember, you must maintain control. He grasped my arm with one calloused hand. Unlike the previous times he'd grabbed me, there was no threat in the gesture. It was almost like he was trying to remind me that he was there, that I was not alone. I took two ragged breaths and nodded, ruthlessly blinking back the tears that tried to well up. Okay. I said hoarsely, when I finally felt in control. I'm okay. I'm fine. Tamlane nodded his approval at my show of control and let me go, stepping away from me. I dragged my attention away from the destruction, wanting to shield my inner wolf from the horror of it. Somehow the idea of protecting her from all of this steadied me, so I clung to it. I could do this. I could maintain control. With a deep breath, I oriented myself to the rest of my surroundings. This patch of wilderness was familiar to me. Relief poured through me, turning my legs to rubber. These were not the Greystalker homesteads. This area would have been entirely devoid of human or shifter habitations. No one lived here, I said. Unless someone happened to be out here hunting, no people will have died. I don't think. Tamlin regarded me for a beat then offered a silent nod. All the wildlife, though, I said, my throat clenching painfully. It was stupid being upset like this over rabbits and birds that my wolf would happily have eaten for lunch. But the shifter mentality was so deeply rooted in my heart that I couldn't help it. We treated every animal with respect, even when we were hunting them. It did not escape us that we were part of a delicately balanced system, one where we paid for a life with a life. It was sacred, even down to the smallest living creature. Tamlane lifted a hand to his brow, massaging his temples as though they pained him. You didn't know. You couldn't have known because I chose not to tell you. I blinked at him, a bit shocked that the stubborn Fay would say something like that. His hand dropped to his side. 
I should have explained things sooner. My jaw clenched, but I couldn't afford to let the anger escape. Yes, I bit off the word. You damn well should have. In a way, it was his fault. His and Oberon's both. Too bad that didn't actually change anything. It's still a tragedy either way, I managed. He nodded. It is, yes. I turned to face the mountains, trying to focus on the immediate task in front of me. Standing very still, I reached out with my wolf senses, attempting to get my bearings in the forest. I recognized the general area, but everything looked and smelled different with the earth churned up behind me. Even so, I could hear the faint sound of rushing water, so I pointed in that direction. We need to go that way, I said, not meeting Tamlane's eyes. And while we're walking, we need to discuss our next problem. He raised a slanted eyebrow. Oh? Which one shall we start with? I'd never heard Tamlane make a joke before. Not even a dark one. The most immediate one, I told him, and led the way deeper into the trees. Large ferns brushed our hands and arms as we passed. The vibrant purple flowers scattered along the forest floor reminded me of Elfheim's forest, albeit a less spectacular version. I've been exiled from my pack, I explained patiently. We'll have to be stealthy about this. If they realize I've returned, then Bardolf, the pack alpha, will kill me. He will not. Tamlane replied, as though that were the end of it. I turned on him, and he came to an abrupt halt to avoid walking into me. Damn it. Why was he following me so closely? Uh, yeah. I said flatly. He will. You can't just break exile. Nobody does that, ever. Tamlane's brows drew together. You need not fear, little wolf. No harm will come to you. Says the guy who just threatened to kill me half an hour ago. I'm not scared, I said through gritted teeth, ignoring the little voice chanting, Liar! Liar! His unblinking blue gaze pinned me. Yes, you are. After everything you've learned in the last day, how could you not be afraid? I considered his words for a moment and whirled away rather than answering. We walked in silence until finally I couldn't stand it anymore. Maybe you're just saving yourself the trouble of having to kill me personally. The words were out of my mouth before I could second guess them. Don't worry. Tamlane replied tartly. If I decide to kill you, you'll know it. Until then, I will not permit anything to happen to you. I wasn't quite sure what to do with that reply, so I stayed quiet. We passed the next hour or so in silence, winding our way alongside the river, getting closer and closer to the Greystalker settlement. I was now in familiar woods, seeing places that I had explored with Darby in the early years of my life. Back when I knew nothing of the way the world worked or of my own destiny, Nothing about Faded Mates or Elfheim or Oberon. Nothing of my terrible power. I could practically picture us running through the trees in our blissful ignorance, laughing and sharing secrets in the uninhibited way that only wolf pups can. My heart ached for Darby. She was my best friend in the entire world, and I'd left her alone in a place she hated. All because of the stupid fate mark. I wondered if her life might have been better without me, though. Had things been easier for her after I'd left? Self-loathing rose up in me, and I felt unwanted power crackling through me. Before Tamlane could notice, I redirected it inward. Think, don't feel. That would have to be my new mantra from now on. I glanced back at him, scanning his impassive face. My eyes started drifting lower, across the muscular planes of his chest. I quickly turned away, facing forward. Those feelings were just as distracting, albeit less destructive than the anger and rage I'd felt earlier. I needed to concentrate, despite the powerful Fay following at my heels. Besides, Dianthe would probably kick my ass if she caught me ogling her boyfriend, even if the pair weren't exactly what you'd call demonstrative. He said he'd protect me. Despite my best efforts, a little seed of something was germinating in my chest. He also said he might kill you, I reminded myself firmly. 
Irritated, I gave myself a little shake. The internal debate was pointless. I needed to move on. If I could just change into a wolf, everything would be simpler. We hadn't tested to see if my powers to draw Earth and Elfheim together still worked in my wolf form. Everything seemed tied to my emotional state, which was raw and unbridled as a human. As a wolf, things were much more straightforward. My wolf felt anger and fear, but it was different. While human thoughts still passed through my mind, in that form we lived very much in the moment. The problem was, how did you test something like that without risking more destruction and loss of life if the theory was wrong? I didn't know the answer. Still, being a wolf would make this whole thing easier. As I considered shifting, I remembered that I only had one set of clothes, and I didn't want to have to ask Tamlane to do some more clothing repair magic. I wasn't sure how many times a fae could remake one set of clothes before they randomly dissolved into oblivion. And I sure as hell wouldn't be showing up to see my old pack naked. I'm half fae, right? I asked suddenly, inspired by my dilemma. Yes, Tamlane replied cautiously. I hesitated, wondering how to word my question. Do I have fey magic? His footsteps slowed for a moment as he considered this. Then he started walking again. Beyond your destructive powers? I really have no idea. Why? I was just thinking about your ability to repair things and summon clothing through the ether, I said. It seems very useful for a shifter. He hesitated. We can attempt to find out, if you like. Surprised by his offer, I glanced back at him. Do you mean it? I am Fay. He replied. We do not lie. But perhaps now is not the time for such experiments. My heart sank, as I realized how close we were to my old home. Despite Tamlane's reassurances, I suspected there was no way I would be getting out of this completely unscathed. With nothing else for it, I pressed on. This had, after all, been my idea in the first place. I just assumed we'd be doing more sneaking and less casually walking in like we owned the place. We reached the outskirts of the settlement, not far from the jail where I had spent the night suffering through the destruction of my mate bond with Kai. The memory made me shiver as we approached the building, my keen ears alert for the sound of any of my packmates. No one's around, I said, keeping my voice low. He nodded his understanding, his sharp eyes scanning the trees. Ushering me forward with a hand barely brushing the small of my back, he indicated that we should continue deeper into the settlement. His body so near mine did not make it easy to keep my mind on our task. We have to find Geneva. Focus on that, Ember, not the hot fay who promised to protect you from your former pack. As we approached the main gathering place where I'd had my wolf birth ceremony, I felt unfriendly eyes on my back and froze. Spinning around, I saw a figure dart off into the trees in wolf form. I thought I recognized the wolf's coloring, but he was off so quickly I couldn't be sure. Well, I said conversationally, I expect the shit will hit the fan shortly, if that's what you are after. The fae gave me an odd look. Maybe they didn't have rotating fans on Elfheim. Too bad. I'd always found that human expression rather evocative. We continued along the main path at a purposeful pace, and I looked around the Greystalker settlement with new eyes. In many ways, it was as though I'd never left. Everything appeared just as I remembered it. I was the one who'd changed. Surprised muttering followed us. The pack was shocked to see me back breaking the terms of my exile. They were probably just as surprised, if not more, by the presence of the powerful fey warrior at my side. More and more people followed in our wake. They mostly hung back on the winding path behind us. Some crept through the trees in near-silent wolf form, pacing us. Still think there's nothing to worry about? I asked through gritted teeth. Tamlane gave me a haughty glance and didn't deign to reply. We just reached the center of town when a low growl met my sensitive ears. I froze in place. Tamlane stood at my side, the picture of unconcern as a large figure burst through the trees across from us, flanked by several people. It was Bardolf, 
the Pack Alpha himself. The one who'd exiled me, who'd ordered my fate mark burned from my chest. His rage upon seeing me was palpable, and had I been in my wolf form, I would have been on my belly in front of him, groveling. Still, Tamlane showed no evidence of concern as he stood next to me, shoulder to shoulder. My attention fell on the group of shifters that had entered the square behind Bardolf. I recognized some of his lieutenants, as well as a white-faced Kai. I didn't need the sickening lurch in my stomach to remind me of our destroyed mate bond. And he seemed every bit as viscerally aware of my presence as I was his. I tried not to take vicious satisfaction in that fact. In fact, the Alpha's son looked like he'd just seen a ghost. I studied his stricken face, a surge of conflicting emotion rising as my wolf stirred in response to his proximity. Despite everything that had happened, she still longed to race to his side and try to comfort him in any way that she could. She found it maddening to be separated by the rocky square and the crowd of angry shifters. But with Bardolf standing between us, we might as well have been in different realms. Oh, the irony. Unhelpfully, my damaged fate mark decided that this was the moment to flare to life. I could feel the echoes of our bond, still not dead despite Bardolf's and Kai's best attempts to kill it. My wolf practically leapt with joy at the connection's resurgence. My human heart leapt with anger. No! No! I thought, frantic to keep my emotions in check. I had no idea what that kind of primal, soul-deep betrayal would do to Earth and Elfheim. I took several deep breaths, exhaling slowly as I controlled my trembling. Tamlane looked down at me sharply, sensing my emotional upheaval. His eyes darted around to the trees nearby, but thankfully, they remained completely still. He gave a barely perceptible nod of approval at my control, and it shouldn't have meant as much as it did to my shattered nerves. All of this happened in the space of a few heartbeats, and none of the pack noticed a thing. Bardolf stormed forward. Several of his shifters stalked after him, awaiting his command. Death in their eyes. My death. Well, I thought in resignation, taking in just how badly outnumbered we were. I did warn Tamlane this would happen. Approach no closer. Tamlane commanded his powerful voice rolling around the town square. A part of me couldn't help but admire his appearance of utter nonchalance in the face of the Alpha pack leader and his enforcers. I knew all too well what a pack of determined shifters could do when they worked together. Shock of shocks, no one listened to the phase command. Several of the men threw off their robes and transformed into their wolf forms, snarling at us in clear threat as they closed in, ready to spring. Tamlane sighed and waved one hand in a casual gesture. Fog swirled from his fingers, whipping around in a gray vortex above his head, before descending on everyone in the approaching group. Or rather, everyone except Bardolf. The attacking shifters stumbled and fell to the ground, humans and wolves alike. I gaped at the bodies around us, all of them lying still and silent, Kai among them. Are they... I broke off abruptly, as a loud snore emanated from one of the men in human form. Asleep. Tamlane assured me dryly. He raised his voice to be heard all around the square. And asleep they will remain, Bardolf Greystalker, until our business is concluded. Bardolf looked astonished for the briefest of moments. If I hadn't been staring at him, I would have missed the expression. Then his features hardened into lines of fury. I took a reflexive step backward, eager to put some distance between myself and the enraged Alpha bracing to attack. It was as though Tamlane's display of power meant nothing to Bardolf. Or maybe he was too furious to think rationally. Either way, instead of pausing to consider his options, his eyes fixed on Tamlane, glowing copper gold with rage. How dare you! He growled his deep voice echoing off the trees and cliffs. The shifters who had followed us at a distance were still hanging back, unaffected by Tamlane's spell. They too seemed to sense that their leader had lost control. Not a comfortable notion for a pack. Bardolf couldn't back down now, or he'd lose his dominance over the others. 
And indeed, he brought his hands to his chest and ripped his ceremonial robes off, exposing a muscular, gray-haired chest. With a bellow of rage, the Alpha dove forward. His wolf form exploded into being mid-leap, huge and grizzled, slavering with rage. He snarled, saliva flying through the air as he snapped his powerful jaws towards Tamlane, a clear challenge. Tamlane gave the giant Alpha a cynical half-smile, stepping forward to close the distance separating them. An instant later, an explosion of light burst from his body. I cried out and shielded my eyes against the dazzling glare, but not before the image of a white wolf and a dark wolf clashing in the center of the square burned its way into my retinas. Fifteen. In the middle of the town square, Tamlane and Bardolph's wolf forms crashed together in the explosion of light. Bardolph's wolf was a black silhouette within the flare of brilliant magic. By contrast, Tamlane's wolf was a blinding, vivid white. Together, they became a blur of ripping teeth and flying fur as they tumbled over the rocky ground. Their enraged snarling made the human part of me want to cover my ears against the cacophony as the sound echoed off the nearby mountain. My inner wolf, on the other hand, was crouched as though to spring forward into the middle of the brawl. Bad idea, I told her firmly. Bad, bad idea. Literally, the worst idea ever. My eyes darted to Kai against my better judgment, and away again an instant later. It was desperately painful to be this close to him, like the wound where my mark had been burned away was fresh and blistered again. He, like the other guards, was still fast asleep on the hard ground, utterly undisturbed by the terrible noise coming from the fight. Dragging my attention back, I watched in something like awe as Tamlane bit and tore at Bardolph's larger wolf form. I'd seen him fight before. Hell, I'd fought him myself when he'd first tracked me down in Rockville. Now I realized that he'd purposely used his magic during that scuffle to gain the upper hand over me without hurting me. Well, without hurting anything except my pride, at least. That was decidedly not the case now. Every move Tamlane made was clearly intended to cause as much damage to Bardolph as possible. He body-slammed the Alpha Shifter into a tree, smashing him between the unforgiving wood and Tamlane's own teeth and claws. The Fey warrior tore mercilessly at Bardolph. His white muzzle streaked red with fresh blood. It hit me rather abruptly that Tamlane was King Oberon's top general, or he had been, before his betrayal to save both Elfheim and Earth. He could well have been ancient beyond measure. His experience was obviously giving him the upper hand. But his utter ruthlessness held hints of something more personal, too. It felt like he was unleashing all of his tightly controlled frustrations on the unlucky Greystalker Alpha. Bardolph's counterattacks grew less fierce, and his lunges less precise. He tore free of the Fey, and the two wolves circled each other warily. Tamlin snarled, his teeth bared. Bardolph panted hard, clearly approaching the end of his stamina. Despite the fact that my ex-mate lay on the ground about thirty yards from me, I couldn't help the way my gaze played over Tamlin's powerful wolf form. His coat was glossy, light shining off of the individual strands that fluttered gently in the breeze. Just as in his human form, smooth muscle rippled beneath his white pelt, bloodstained though it currently was. Caught between two males she desired, my inner wolf whimpered in longing. I clenched my jaw and mentally shook myself. Tamlane was obviously with Deanthe, even if they weren't exactly into public displays of affection. I couldn't let my feelings run away with me. No matter how impressive Tamlane's wolf was as he lunged again, seizing Bardolph by the scruff of the neck and whipping him around before tossing his larger opponent away. Blind with rage, Bardolph pushed to his feet and barreled straight into the shifted fay. I frowned seeing the alpha wolf I'd always feared in a completely different light than I ever had before. Bardolph simply lost himself to the battle. There was no strategy, no higher thought process. He was just hurling pent-up aggression at a superior foe. And he was losing. Badly. Had he always been like this? Had he always been so pathetic? 
Why had I never seen it until now? These questions made me uneasy. It was against my nature to question an established alpha wolf. It simply wasn't done in shifter society. The only time anyone challenged an alpha was if they were willing to fight him for dominance. Possibly to the death. Bardolph's lack of strategy was turning the fight into less of a battle and more of a beating. Tamlane's viciousness startled me. More than winning, he seemed to delight in the chance to cause even more injury to the Alpha. With a final ferocious lunge, Tamlane pinned Bardolph on his back by the throat. The Alpha lay bleeding from several torn spots on his body. There was a piteous moan, and then finally, stillness. It was over. Tamlane shook his massive wolf form. Magic swirled around him, healing the few blows that Bardolph had managed to land early in the fight. When it faded, Tamlane's white fur flowed smooth and pristine, completely unmarked. It was as though the injuries had never existed in the first place. I couldn't keep my mouth from dropping open in shock. I would never cease to be amazed at Tamlane's abilities. Could I learn to do that? It sure would have been a handy skill to have when I was younger and constantly getting kicked around by the pack. Talk about missed opportunities. I blinked, and Tamlane shifted back into his fey form. He hunched over Bardolph's crumpled body, still pinning him down by the neck. You. Tamlane said in a steely tone. We'll transform to your human form, now. Alpha or no, it was a command, not a request. Bardolph looked up at the Fae with fear shining in his dazed eyes and shifted back into a man. Tamlane released his hold on the Alpha's neck with a sneer of disdain, but Bardolph did not get up. He raised a bleeding arm to swipe at the mud and blood on his face. The Fae stood, towering over the former Alpha's prone body. The power difference between the two was so drastic that it brought a strange lump of feeling to my throat. Bardolph had led our pack, yet in the end, he was weak. Turning in a slow circle, Tamlane searched the faces of the wolves and humans in the crowd for any signs of imminent attack. There were none. The others hung back at a safe distance. Here is your alpha, the Fae said, still in that same cool voice. Lying beaten in the middle of your town square with all of his lieutenants, defeated by a single man, there was a slight rustling of discomfort, but no one moved or objected. Tam Lane gave a careless shrug before turning his attention back to me. The skin at the back of my neck prickled under that blue gaze, and my wolf gave a delicious shudder. Thoughts of Kai, lying insensible with the others, instantly brought me back to reality. I chewed on my bottom lip, suddenly nervous. Clearing my throat, I said, Actually... I think you should release Kai, the Alpha's son, from the sleeping spell now. I gestured towards my former mate, who was curled up like a pup taking a nap. Tamlane raised an eyebrow. I blushed furiously. He probably knows where Geneva is, I hurried to add. I didn't have to explain further, but the way that Tamlane gazed at me made me feel like I was naked again. During our brief acquaintance, I hadn't shared the details with him. But was it possible this Fae knew the story of my exile? The whole story? If you insist. Tamlane said after a long moment, his tone studiously indifferent. With a casual wave of his hand, Tamlane reversed the spell. Kai immediately began to stir. He blinked several times and pushed himself to his feet, staring at the carnage around him, his eyes growing wide. I drew breath to say something but the words died in my throat. Kai's gaze narrowed, taking in the crumpled, bleeding figure of his father, still on the ground at Tamlane's feet. Slowly, he raised his head, his disbelieving gaze falling on the fae. Tamlane lifted his hand, examining his fingernails as though he didn't have a care in the world. If you would like to fight me too, Wolf, that can be arranged. Kai straightened to his full height at Tam Lane's words, but he didn't attack, demonstrating far more sense than I ever would have expected from him. No, he said. Perhaps we should go somewhere quiet and have a conversation instead of a battle. 
Tamlane smiled, that cynical half-twist of lips that I'd seen several times now. How terribly civilized of you. I see that you do not take after your sire. Kai's jaw muscles clenched, but he didn't rise to the bait. Instead, he gestured toward the prone figures. What about my packmates? Have you harmed them permanently? The Fae made a tiny scoffing noise. Please. They will awaken just as you did once I release them from the spell. Kai gave him a guarded nod and turned towards the crowd. Many of them were clustered together, whispering into each other's ears. You and you, he said, pointing at two men. Take my father to the healer's den. Without a word, the pair hurried forward and hauled their fallen alpha to unsteady feet. Even though he was clearly in pain, I could tell that Bardolf was furious at being sent away from the situation. I wondered what Kai made of all this. Bardolf had lost the fight fair and square, though. An alpha who lost to another was no longer an alpha. He had no right to attend this meeting. I felt torn watching Tamlane and Kai move closer together, preparing to depart the scene. It was horribly conflicting to see them like this, as if two parts of my life were crashing together, past and future, old and new. Please, Kai said courteously, dipping his gaze before the Fae who had bested Greystalker's leader. Allow me to conduct you to our den. Tamlane gave a single regal nod of acknowledgement. We walked through the town with Kai. My sensitive ears picked up several members of the pack trailing behind us, murmuring to each other. I wondered for a moment if Darby was one of them, and without warning, my heart began to ache for my sweet friend. I pushed the thoughts away. If she'd been among the crowd, she would have called out to me. I was sure of it. Besides, this was not the time for personal concerns, as much as I might wish it was. By the time we reached the Alpha's extravagant dwelling, night had fallen. Kai opened the door for us, and I was surprised that no one greeted us at the entrance. Although I'd never been inside, I knew that there were members of the household guard that served as protectors for the Alpha's family when he was away. There were also servants. Kai, however, didn't miss a beat at having to play host without support. Let me take your things. He accepted Tamlin's cloak and hung it up in the hallway before offering us refreshments. We murmured our thanks, and he led us into a large sitting room. The richly furnished space included several comfortable chairs situated around a fireplace carved into the natural stone of the mountainside. As he efficiently nursed a fire to life, I caught Kai throwing glances in my direction from time to time. His eyebrows were drawn together in thought, or perhaps concern. At one point, our eyes met, and Kai quickly turned away, saying something about returning with food and drink. My stomach rumbled hopefully at his words. The meal that Deonthe and I had shared seemed like a lifetime ago. He returned a short time later with a platter heaped with simple honey cakes, blocks of cheese, and fruit. Kai set it before us and went to pour us large, cold drafts of water from the mountains. I drank deeply and stuffed food in my mouth, hunger and thirst overpowering my curiosity about Kai's oddly obsequious behavior. Not to mention any desire I might have had to appear either dignified or polite. With his host duties completed, Kai sank into a chair across from us. Why have you come here? He asked Tamlane. His gaze flickered to me and away again. Why bring her? I probably should have been offended. Instead, I took another giant bite of honey cake. Tamlane steepled his fingers together, a thoughtful gesture. Perhaps Ember should be the one to explain. I froze, my hand halfway to my mouth as my eyes flew to the phase accusingly. How was I supposed to explain this situation to Kai? Wasn't it meant to be a secret? Besides, I barely understood it myself. How on earth was I going to convince him? Replacing the food on the plate, I swallowed a gulp of water and sat back in the chair, considering what to say. The silence stretched for a long moment, growing heavy. Finally, I steeled myself and looked straight into Kai's eyes. 
The ghostly burn of the mate bond bubbled up in my chest again. By the strain I could see in Kai's face, I guessed he was experiencing something similar. Good. It served him right. Earth and the Fey realm of Elfheim are on the brink of war, I began. There's a lot to explain, most of which I barely understand, but I'll try my best. I paused again, cleared my throat, and continued. The story that the pack tells about my birth isn't the whole truth. I'm not some random shifter's bastard. My father is the king of Elfheim. Kai blinked, an expression of disquiet sliding across his handsome features. Who told you that? Your father was a lone wolf who shattered the mate bond with your mother. You're the result of a crime against nature. These words had been hurled at me my entire life, but hearing them out of my mate's mouth stung. I had to cover a flinch, gritting my teeth to keep from snapping at him. No doubt that is the story you've been told, Tam Lane said. It is not, however, the truth. Kai's gaze shifted back and forth between us. I found that it was hard to look him in the eye. Tamlane seemed content to let me explain, so I gathered myself with difficulty and continued. The Fey King Oberon grew jealous of his wife Titania, who was friends with a shifter and her pup. But shifters can't travel to... Kai cut in. I glared him into silence. It felt good. Yeah, so people say. But I've been there, and anyway... The how and why of a shifter being in Elfheim with her pup isn't important. The point is that they were. Kai looked like he wanted to argue more. In his defense, the notion was a pretty wild one, but he gave a curt nod and lapsed back into silence. I continued before anyone could come up with another interruption. Oberon wanted to take the pup as his personal slave, but Titania hid him away to protect him. So the Fey King came to Earth and impregnated my mother as a way to get some kind of twisted revenge against his wife for her interference, while also getting what he wanted, a shifter to keep as his own. He was indifferent about me as an actual daughter, so I guess he left me here with the pack until I became old enough to be of interest to him. Anger, confusion, and bitterness warred inside me as I spoke, fighting to spill out. But there was too much at stake. I refused to let them rest free of my control. Tamlane was looking at me with a satisfied expression, presumably at my unexpected emotional mastery. When he caught me staring back, he gave me a fleeting smile and a nod of encouragement. I took a deep breath. While I was with the pack, Oberon sent a spy to report back about me. Turns out, she gave him some very, very valuable information and now Earth and Elfheim are on the brink of war. Because of me. Why? Kai asked. He'd gone pale again. I couldn't help noticing. I shifted uncomfortably in my chair, glancing at Tamlane for help. He jerked his chin toward Kai in a way that said, I should just get it over with and tell him. Right. Because apparently I have fey powers and shifter powers, since I'm from both worlds. The kind of power that destroys things. Kai looked alarmed, and I wondered if he was thinking of the ravaged forest at the edge of the Packlands. What does that even mean? I smiled grimly. It felt like a rictus. You know exactly what destruction I'm talking about, Kai. The forest. Kai breathed. The Council has been meeting about it. The humans are saying it was caused by a meteor, a rock falling from space and exploding on impact. No, I said simply. There was also a terrible storm not far from here. Kai went on. They seemed to strike at random. Well? I grimaced and dragged a hand over my face. Not entirely at random. That was you? He looked positively ill. I shrugged helplessly. Sort of. When I get angry, Earth and Elfheim get pulled together, and somehow that causes the storms and the destruction. I only just learned about this myself, I added with a pointed glare at Tamlane. Indeed, he said, rather unhelpfully in my opinion. Anyway, now that I know, my glare intensified. I'm doing my best to prevent it from happening again. Kai's complexion was the color of curdled milk by this point. I saw him swallow convulsively like he was fighting back nausea. 
The bond between us throbbed painfully. We both reached up at the same moment to clutch at our chests, where the marks had been burned out of us. As soon as he noticed the mirrored motion, Kai jerked his hand away and clasped it firmly with his other. He appeared angry at his own lapse. I let my hand fall slowly to my side. Was he as drawn to me as I still was to him? He clearly felt the ghost of our bond, just as I did. There were so many questions that I wanted to ask him. At the same time, I could feel my inner wolf straining to reach out and nuzzle into Kai's neck. She desperately wanted the bond, even now. And I couldn't afford to think like that. I couldn't. With so many questions swirling around in my head, I reached for the one that was most important, and least likely to plunge me into emotional quicksand. I told you Oberon sent a spy here, I said. We need to speak with Geneva Padfoot right away. Where is she? His eyes widened in understanding, and his breath escaped in a huff. Geneva Padfoot? He said blankly. She's gone. What? I exclaimed, surging to my feet. You let her go? He only stared at me. What grounds would we have had to stop her? Besides, she just disappeared. It was right after the destruction that hit the edge of the Packlands. Tam Lane and I exchanged a look. My expression was horrified. His was grim. Sixteen. With a snarl of frustration, Tamlane rose to his feet and glared down at Kai. Did she take anyone with her? Is anyone else missing? He demanded, tension rolling off him in waves. Obviously out of his depth, Kai glanced at me for the briefest of moments. He steeled himself to meet Tamlane's burning gaze, squaring his shoulders. Just one other, a young low-status shifter who used to hang around with... His voice trailed away as if my very name burned his lips. Instead, he gestured lamely and said, With her. I blinked at him. My mind was frozen in denial, but my body felt like it was in free fall. A young, low-status shifter who used to hang around with me. Who used to hang around with... me. The words played inside my head on an unhelpful loop, drowning out everything else. I could feel myself starting to tremble, and Kai's next words seemed to come from a long way away. Her family has been searching for her, but they haven't had any luck finding her. Darby? The name escaped my throat as a whimper, so low and soft that I was sure neither of the two men could hear me. I was wrong, however. Tamlane's face filled my vision. He gripped my shoulders with firm hands and gave me a sharp shake. I blinked his blue eyes into focus, barely able to think past the horror and rage growing inside me. Stop. Tamlane's voice demanded my attention. Ember, this person is obviously important to you, but my homeland and the lives of my kinsmen all rest on your ability to control your emotional reaction. I dragged in a gasping breath as the sense of his words registered. Even as I continued to tremble beneath his warm grip, I remembered the barren wastelands I had seen on both Earth and Elfheim. I could not be responsible for more lives lost, more lands destroyed. My emotions were burning me from the inside out, but I took another longer, steadying breath and pushed my feelings down deep, burying them inside a vault of iron control. The whisper of breeze blowing ominously around the room stilled. My eyes were damp with frustrated tears. I let the air in my lungs out slowly, nodding at Tamlane when I felt like I had regained control. Good, he said, rubbing gentle circles on my shoulders with his thumbs. Thank you, little wolf. A low growl sounded from behind me. I twisted in Tamlane's grip to find Kai on his feet now, as well. The ghost of the wolf in his gaze, alight with possessive jealousy. Jealousy? I looked at my former mate in sheer disbelief. How dare he? How dare he act as though he still had some claim over me, after what he'd done? The shock of it was enough to temporarily banish the lingering terror and anger that I felt for Darby, as I stared him down. Tamlin, too, had heard the noise rumbling in the back of Kai's throat. 
The Fae narrowed his eyes in menace. It was very clear that he would have welcomed the chance to deliver the Alpha's son, the same kind of beatdown his father had just suffered at his hands. We didn't have time for this. Enough, both of you, I said. Didn't they see that we had more important matters to deal with than a pissing match over who held some ridiculous claim over me? Anger tried to rise again. Anger over the fact that I couldn't even control my own damned life. But that wasn't helpful either. Tell us everything you know about Geneva and Darby's disappearance, I demanded. There must be something that can help us find them. I kept my emotions under control, but I couldn't hide the intensity in my voice and body language. I, a lowly, exiled lone wolf, was demanding answers of the presumptive alpha of my former pack. But maybe that was the point. He wasn't my alpha. Not anymore. Maybe he never really had been. There's nothing more I can tell you, Kai said. He too seemed to be working hard to control his emotions. Their possessions were untouched. No one saw them go. They just disappeared in the dead of night. No reason to think the disappearances were connected, except for the timing. Darby's family has been making inquiries, thinking that maybe she ran away and joined another pack. Darby, who is she to you exactly? Tamlane asked, turning towards me. She was my best friend, I responded without expression. I could say no more without threatening the shaky control I held over my feelings of horrified dread. Tamlane nodded his understanding and turned back towards Kai. It's as I feared, then. You, tell me everything you know about Geneva Padfoot. It was clear that Kai didn't appreciate being ordered around by the Fae, even after seeing what had happened to Bardolph. He scowled and folded his arms. What makes you think I know anything of use? She was an outsider, a wanderer who settled here and mostly kept to herself. My own growl rose in my throat. You're lying! Kai, I swear I will let him tear off your limbs one by one if you don't tell us every single thing you know. I barely recognized my own voice. It held an unaccustomed power that I'd never heard there before. Kai clenched his jaw, but something in my expression seemed to convince him to speak. It's true that I did speak with Geneva a handful of times over the years, mostly about you as it happens. It sounded like the words were being pulled from him. The wolf inside of me perked up at the idea that he'd thought about me over the years, but I did my best to ignore the feeling. About me? He nodded. She warned me that you were... different. Explain. Tamlin demanded. What exactly did she say? She wouldn't tell me any more than that. Kai replied, shaking his head. All she would say was that you were special in some way that was related to magic. I admit that I didn't take her seriously at first. She was just this crazy old lady that lived at the edge of the village. I didn't have a reason to investigate her outlandish claims. He sounded defensive, but I hardly noticed. I felt a fresh wave of anger building at the idea that so much had been kept from me all these years, and shoved it down hard. She called you a threat to the status quo or something like that, he said. I do remember that part. My head snapped up, and my bewilderment must have been etched across my face. Kai gave me an apologetic look and continued. She always encouraged me to look out for you, to protect you. She said it was important that your differences were never discovered. Tamlane tapped his fingers thoughtfully on the table. That is telling. What did you do? Not very much, really. Kai admitted. I did my best to keep the pack from being too harsh with her. As the Alpha's son, that was my duty, regardless. He turned to look at me. But you didn't really seem to need protecting from much else. Hold on a second. Your duty? I spat. You thought keeping the others from beating the shit out of me was your duty? Kai grimaced. You were just a pup. Hell, Ember. We both were. What was I supposed to do? Let them beat you for having the misfortune of being born a bastard. Why would Geneva ask you of all people to watch over me? I retorted. Because newsflash, you did a terrible job at it. 
But that wasn't exactly true. As I thought back through the early years of my life, I remembered many times that Kai would seem to magically appear and distract the bullies from their attack on me. He'd come onto the scene just as I was being bloodied up and demand that they go hunting with him, or he'd order them away and shuffle me off to Geneva. Even as recently as the eve of my wolf birth ceremony, Kai had been instrumental in stopping the attack that resulted in that first strange windstorm. Maybe I was being unfair. The realization stung. As though he could read my thoughts, Kai's face flushed pink and he said, I did the best I could. Geneva always said the most important thing was that you needed to avoid close scrutiny, otherwise you'd end up dead. But why did she ask you? I pressed. His skin turned an even brighter shade of red, and he glanced away, breaking eye contact in a very un-alpha-like manner. Tell me, I demanded, leaning forward to press my unexpected advantage. I was desperate for any information that might give me answers. Geneva knew my secret, Kai said, still looking away. Your secret? I asked, even more confused than before. My feelings for you, he said reluctantly. He rubbed his forehead as he spoke, pinching the skin together as if it was causing him pain. She could tell when I looked at you that I was attracted to you. The swooping sensation in my stomach nearly made me gasp aloud. It felt like the solid flagstone floor had suddenly dropped out from underneath me, and I was in freefall. Tamlane had been quiet, letting me pull the story from Kai one painful word at a time. Ah. He breathed, in the tone of one experiencing a revelation. It was probably a different revelation than the one I'd just experienced. Y you were? I stammered. Tamlane shifted next to me, but I ignored him. My eyes bored into Kai, willing him to speak. Yes. The word was a hiss. During your ceremony, when our mate bond was revealed, I panicked, all right? I knew that we could never be mates. Talk about scrutiny. Every aspect of your life would have been picked apart and examined. I didn't know what else to do, so I rejected the bond to protect you. If ever I were going to fly into a rage, this would have been the appropriate moment. I took several deep breaths and pictured the destruction that I'd already caused willing myself to stay calm as my pulse thundered unchecked in my ears. It was also completely and utterly ridiculous. Why would Kai believe Geneva in the first place? She wasn't even a part of the Greystalker pack, not really. She'd always been an outsider, tolerated because she had a business that sold trinkets people wanted to buy. Why would Kai believe her so easily? Why had he let her manipulate him so transparently? And why hadn't he simply told me the truth instead of having me banished from the pack, from my home? These questions battered at me until I felt a throbbing headache bloom between my eyes. I pinched the bridge of my nose, trying to stay calm. Why? I breathed, the single word encompassing all of my questions. I was afraid, Kai said, sounding defeated. I didn't know if what she was saying was true, but I couldn't risk it. Not with you. But you could have told me, I snapped. So much of this could have been avoided if you'd just talked to me. It was my life you were playing with. Tamlane laid a warm hand on my arm, reminding me again of everything that was at stake in that moment. I gritted my teeth and pulled in the power that had started leeching out of me as my temper flared. Was it getting easier to do so with practice? I couldn't tell for sure, but I supposed the absence of wind rising around me boded well. I don't know why I didn't tell you, Kai said. His brow furrowed, but his eyes were vacant and distant as he spoke. It makes perfect sense now that I should have, but at the time I just couldn't. Tamlane snorted. No mystery there. You were fey touched. Simple as that. Kai and I both turned to him in surprise before glancing at each other uncertainly. Faye touched? I asked, prompting him to explain. Tamlane gestured towards Kai and said, Pavia needed this one to comply, so she told him her story and wrapped it up in a spell to bind his mind. 
She did what to my what? Kai demanded, looking genuinely alarmed. What did she tell you would happen if Ember's secret was ever discovered? Tamlane challenged, his eyebrows raised. Kai fell silent, but a queasy expression slid across his face. She said, my father would kill her on the spot. And you believed her? Tamlane replied curtly. Because it played into your deepest fears. The spell needed a place to land in your mind, so she wrapped it up in a story that you deemed plausible. That's how she was able to take such a firm hold on you, overriding your rational thinking. So it was the power of the spell that convinced you to have me banished? I asked Kai tentatively. Tamlane replied before he could. Yes and no. He might have chosen some other response, but it still would have been something in line with the suggestions Pavia, or Geneva if you prefer, planted in his mind. Kai bristled. I don't appreciate all this talk of someone controlling me, Faye. I'm not some weak whelp to roll over for an old woman. An emotion washed over me that wasn't anger, exactly. Rather, it was an odd sort of supreme confidence in both my own rightness and Kai's utter cluelessness. I channeled that feeling into my burning glare. Instantly, he backed down, almost shrinking in his seat. His eyes darted away. I was aware on some level that I should never have been able to cow the Alpha's son with a single glance. But that was a concern for another time. Tamlane shot me a speculative look. I cleared my throat and tried to redirect the conversation to the most important topic. I get why Geneva would leave. She has to report back to Oberon. But what does Darby have to do with any of this? I asked the Fae. Please tell me her disappearance is just a crazy coincidence, I thought, already knowing it wasn't true. He gave me a pitying look, and I knew then that whatever he said next would be bad. Tamlane sighed heavily. My best guess is that Geneva has already told Oberon that your powers are triggered through powerful negative emotions like anger and fear. She will also have told him about your friend's existence. I suspect that she took Darby straight to Oberon to use as leverage against you. I staggered backward into the chair I'd vacated earlier. Tamlane lifted his hands in a calming motion, but I didn't need his wordless warning. I could feel power coalescing inside of me. Ice and fire were blending together inside my soul, forming a growing sea of energy. I didn't let it spill over to pull Earth and Elfheim together. No wind picked up outside, yet I could feel the terrible, raw power expanding under my skin, as though my body might split open and pour it all out in a wave of unstoppable destruction. Ember, you must stay calm, Tamlane said. Many lives in both realms depend on it. I know. My voice sounded strange in my ears. Resonant. Kay's expression was half horrified half fascinated. Your eyes, he said. They're glowing. I blinked, taken by surprise. The buzzing sensation that had filled my body faded and vanished. Just like that, I was me again. My body slumped heavily in the chair. A great weariness pressed me down, but I needed to know the truth. What will Oberon do to her? What's his plan? I looked up at Tamlane pleadingly, demanding answers. Tamlane crouched in front of the chair and took my hand. He squeezed my fingers as though to impart courage. If Oberon succeeds in capturing you and bringing you back to Elfheim, he will use Darby to force strong emotions from you, pulling on the earth and causing widespread destruction here. You are the weapon he covets, the one that will give him dominion over both realms, or at least, whatever is left of them when he's done. Your friend is the lever. You are the weight that needs to be moved. But what does that mean? I whispered. Tamlane shook his head, his eyes narrowing in sympathy. There are many ways he could use her against you. Just as the threat of Deanthe's death during the battle caused you to lose control, so might a threat against your childhood friend. A threat, or worse. Ice crawled through me as his meaning became clear. With Darby as a hostage, Oberon could master me. He could force me to do anything he wanted. If the choice was between destroying the world of my birth or standing by as Darby was tortured or killed, which would I choose? Seventeen. We have to go rescue my friend, I insisted, 
my throat growing tight. Kai shifted in his seat and threw a look at Tamlane, as though he couldn't believe his ears. But the Fae only gazed at me steadily, giving a single, slow blink. That will be impossible, he said. I laughed bitterly and replied, Oh, hell no. It's definitely not. If I've learned anything over the last few days, it's that nothing is impossible. Maybe that was stretching things a bit, but Tamling got my point. I'd been dragged between realms, discovered that I was the daughter of the Fey King Oberon, and also that I had the power to destroy worlds with my emotions. He tilted his head in grudging acknowledgement of my words, but didn't back down. While the last few days seem to have pressed the boundaries between possible and impossible, I assure you that rescuing this shifter from Oberon is not feasible. Why not? I demanded. Tamlane sighed in frustration. You clearly don't understand what it means to be Oberon's captive. Your friend will be kept in the deepest dungeons at the very heart of the palace. She will be heavily guarded by the best warriors in the realm, not to mention all the rest of the security around the entire royal complex. Which you know all about, I take it, I said, my voice icy. I trained most of them. Tamlane snapped, biting off the words. I designed Oberon's defense strategy. Then you should know exactly how to get around it, I pointed out. He didn't look impressed. There is no such thing as a perfect defense, but if there were, it would be that design. That castle is functionally impenetrable. I tapped my chin for a moment thinking about my next argument. Fine, I conceded. But not trying isn't an option either, since Oberon has basically figured out that he can use her as emotional leverage against me. Tamlane stared me down. Clearly. In case you hadn't noticed, he's doing so right now. I ignored that. Doesn't matter. Think about the big picture. We don't want him having that kind of control over my emotions, do we? No. Tamlane agreed. We don't, which doesn't negate the fact that it has already happened. The other thing, I said, trying to keep the fear bubbling up in my stomach at bay, is that we can't forget how easy it was for you to find and capture me on Earth. His brow furrowed. Your point being? It was nothing to you. You didn't even break a sweat. Practical upshot, me being here is no safer than me being on Elfheim. If Oberon wants me, he'll just send someone to come and get me again. Kai turned towards Tamlane, scowling. You captured her and took her to the Fey Realm? You could have driven her mad. He glanced at me. Well, matter, anyway. I waved him off, still focused on my argument with Tamlane. Shut up, Kai. I'm half Fey, apparently. My sanity wasn't in any danger. Now focus. We can't just sit here and do nothing. Darby is my best friend. I simply will not give up on her like that. Tamlane blew out a breath, obviously annoyed by my stubbornness. The best I can do is take you back to Elfheim and keep you in hiding there. I will make contact with Dianthe and find out what she was able to discover from her acquaintances at the palace. After which, we will discuss our next steps. I smiled despite the anger boiling inside of me, showing teeth. It wasn't a nice expression. No. That was not enough. I would not surrender Darby to Oberon's cruelty so easily. It's a start, I replied sweetly, knowing both men saw the hardness beneath the facade. Kai looked between us. And what do you expect me to do now? In case you've forgotten, you just deposed the Pack Alpha and threw our clan into chaos. Tamlane and I shared a mystified glance. I don't expect you to do anything, Welp. Tamlane said. Your petty shifter power struggles hold no interest for me. That's the point I'm trying to make, you sanctimonious fey asshole. Kai said through gritted teeth. Because apparently, I accidentally contributed to the world maybe ending soon. Not to mention the fact that one of my pack members is now the prisoner of a psychopathic fey king who wants to start a war. I'm asking if you want me to come with you. Wait, you do that? I asked, taken aback. Kai shrugged. The pack will be in an uproar after my father's defeat. The power vacuum will lead to problems, it's true. But that's my father's issue, until and unless I decide to make it mine by challenging him for control of the pack. 
I will come with you if you ask. He stared straight into my eyes as he said the final words. The intensity of that amber gaze sent a shiver down my spine, rousing my wolf. Warmth spread through me despite myself, starting from the pit of my stomach. Tamlane gave Kai a pitying look. You'd go insane the minute you set foot on Elfheim, pup. My pleasurable bubble burst abruptly, reminding myself that Kai was still the asshole who'd rejected our bond and sent me away. I pushed everything down, determined to stay focused on Darby. The hazy memory of her face swirling in my mind made my stomach churn. If shifters went crazy on Elfheim, was she already lost to me? I shook the unwanted thoughts away. It didn't matter if she'd succumbed to the Fey Realm's magic or not, I would not abandon her to the whims of Oberon. She was still my friend, even if he'd already broken her. Kai remained focused on me, ignoring Tamlane's dismissive words. It's your choice, Ember, he said, his gaze never wavering. For a moment, it felt like we were the only two beings in existence. Stop, I told myself harshly. Think. It was too much, after all the betrayals I had suffered. I tore my eyes away from him despite my wolf's silent howl of protest. He didn't deserve to see into my heart like that. He didn't deserve to see how much pain I was hiding. There was no way I would allow him that kind of connection with me. Not now. You should stay here, I said, as though it meant nothing to me. There will probably be a lot of alpha wannabes running around, right? Can't let leadership of the Greystalker pack fall to some random asshole with a chip on his shoulder. Kai might as well have been turned to stone. When he finally answered, it was through lips that barely moved when he spoke. If that's what you want. Had my rejection upset him? Oh, the irony. You'll need to keep the pack from splintering, I told him. That is, assuming you're ready to challenge your father for his place as an alpha. And you probably should. I hadn't given it much thought until today. Kai admitted, his voice low. I never considered that he might lose his status in such a... He trailed off, not finishing his statement. Stupid way, I suggested, not pulling the punch. Well, just do me a favor. Try not to lose any more pack members like you lost Darby. With that vicious parting shot, I stalked towards the front door. Tamlane was a silent shadow at my shoulder. I was determined to escape my ex-mate's presence after getting the last word. Then, I would put him out of my mind for good. Yeah, right, I thought sourly. Ember, ah. Uh. Kai said, before I could make good on my hasty exit. Damn. I stopped, but couldn't bring myself to turn around. My shoulders were a tight line of tension as the silence stretched between us. I didn't know what to say, so I shook my head without looking back and slipped outside. Let's just get back to Elfheim, please. I told Tamlane, surprised by how steady my voice sounded. Tamlane's expression gave nothing away as he waved his hand in a slow, circular motion. The portal opened right on the doorstep in front of us. I stepped through the magical gateway and felt the disconcerting lurch as I landed in the Fey realm. It took my eyes a long moment to adjust to the sudden darkness of my surroundings. My last visit to Elfheim had been in a part of the world that was bright and colorful. The vibrant hues slightly muted during the hours of darkness, but no less distinctive. This, however, was entirely different. The landscape was shrouded in a heavy black mist, and a faint smell of sulfur hung in the air. I hadn't heard Tamlane step through the portal behind me, but his low voice came at my shoulder an instant later. Let's go, little wolf. I gestured around us. Go where? What is this place anyway? There's nothing but darkness and mist in all directions. And shadows, he answered gravely. One mustn't forget the shadows. He seemed to know where he was going, despite the lack of visible landmarks. With little choice, I followed him through the disorienting landscape. As we passed through the mist, every glimpse I got of our surroundings looked nearly identical to the last one. Tamlane, seriously, what is this place? I asked again, pressing closer to him. 
Out of the corner of my eye, I saw one of the larger shadows shift between the trees, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. My wolf whined, and I could feel my heart thrumming nervously against my ribs. There is a place nearby, he said. Deanthe and I used it to pass messages to one another, back when we were both young. It's a very large tree, old and full of magic. Oh? I asked. Another formless shape moved, somewhere off to my left. The wolf growled in alarm, her hackles rising. Trying to keep the conversation moving to hold my fear at bay, I jabbed Tamlane with my elbow and said, I still don't understand why this place is so different from the other forest I saw. It's a different part of Elfame, Tamlane replied evasively. It's not really important for you to know every single detail about the magic of our world, but not all of this world is drenched in light magic. Some of it is dark. I couldn't really argue with that logic under the circumstances, since I knew nothing about how magic actually worked. I was, however, eager to keep talking. I'd noticed another shape rising up in the darkness, and irrational fear was clawing at my throat. I pressed on. Fine. In that case, tell me how long you and Deanthe have been together. We're trying to save two worlds, and I feel like I barely know you. Tamlane stopped so suddenly that I nearly crashed into him. I beg your pardon, he asked, sounding incredulous. Uh, I said, looking at him in confusion. It's a simple enough question, surely. You and Deanthe, how long have you two been lovers? Tamlane stared down at me in the murky darkness, looking at me as though I'd grown a second head. We are not lovers. We are cousins. We grew up together. I stared right back at him, trying to reset my brain to take this new information on board. Cousins? Tamlane let out an annoyed sigh. I am certain that humans and shifters also use that term. It means that our mothers... Were sisters? I finished for him, astonished. Precisely. He was still peering at me, his face an almost comical picture of offense. You really thought... I let out a huff of shocked laughter. I thought you were together, yeah. You've got that whole old mated couple vibe going on. He made a disgruntled noise. Hardly. Don't be offensive. Still wrestling with this unexpected revelation, I fell silent as we continued our trek toward Tamlane's mysterious destination. Curious, I allowed my gaze to flit over the powerful Fey guiding me through the darkness with sure, confident steps, watching him from the corner of my eye. He had protected me, so far, at least. At times, his blinding power frightened me, but that had more to do with the scope of his abilities. I didn't feel like I was personally in danger with him. Stupid of me, probably, since he'd said outright that he would kill me if that was the only way to save the realms. And yet, he'd also promised that if it came to that, I would know it was coming. I believed him. I studied his face with covert glances, comparing his noble appearance to Kai's rugged features. By contrast, the Fae was ethereally beautiful, an enigmatic combination of youth and great wisdom. At last, the gloom parted as we approached a massive, twisted tree that rose high into the air. It was far taller than the tallest tree I'd ever seen on Earth. I gaped upwards, trying to see to the top in the weak starlight. Okay, I managed. That is a huge freaking tree, all right. We used to play here as children. We were the ones who left the silks, Tamlane explained. He gestured to the lowest branches, where strips of fabric in all colors hung. Some were faded and dirty, obviously having been exposed to the march of time. Others were brighter, more recent additions. Baubles and glittering bundles were also there, some with only a dull shine remaining to them. Tamlane moved to the nearest branch and untied a blue silk sash from around his belt. This will let Deanthe know that we have returned without letting anyone else know, he said, tossing it over one of the branches and tying it into a complicated knot with the ends hanging free. A moment later, he froze. His right hand moved in a flash, reaching for the blade sheathed at his side. Quick as lightning, he stepped between me and the base of the tree. 
Starlight flashed on his polished iron blade as he whipped it out and brandished it towards the darkening shadows at the base. You. He breathed as I peeked around his shoulder. To my utter astonishment, Geneva Padfoot stood where the shadow had been a moment before. She regarded us coolly. Wind rose, whispering through my hair, and I took deep breaths to calm my flare of anger. I had to remain in control. The breeze quieted. Everything was totally silent for a beat. Then, she moved with a swiftness that was astonishing for such an old woman. Darting forward, she spun past Tamlane, who swung his blade through the empty air. It whistled, but did not find its mark. Geneva lunged straight at me, her hands held in front of her, balled into fists. I staggered away from her, the suddenness of her attack throwing me off balance. In a flash, she tossed a handful of dust in my face. It coated the inside of my nose and mouth as I gasped in shock. Coughing and choking, I tried to expel it, but I couldn't avoid inhaling the particles. I expected pain, because surely this had to be some sort of weapon meant to hurt me. Was it poison? Some kind of chemical? What I did not expect was the cloying sweet smell and taste, or the low liquid heat kindling in the pit of my stomach. What the fuck? I sputtered, frantically trying to wipe the dust from my eyes and mouth. I charged after her clumsily, gritting my teeth to keep my emotions in check. I knew that she had information about Darby, and I was damned well going to drag it out of her, whatever it took. I didn't care. Geneva's betrayal of me still stung, and I wanted answers. Maybe a bit of revenge, too. Had it all been a lie, I longed to ask. Did you ever care for me at all? My voice didn't seem to be operating properly, because rather than words, all that emerged was a deep growl. This all happened so quickly that I never saw Tamlane move. I had been blinded by my desire to lay my hands on Geneva, not to mention by the sparkling dust. So I didn't realize that Tamlane intended to use his magic to capture her. As he was conjuring his spell, I crashed into him. The net that had been forming in the air imploded into green sparks that faded before they even reached the ground. A sudden crackling noise rent the air, and I looked up from where I had sprawled on the ground at Tamlane's feet. Geneva had just opened a portal and was already halfway through it. Her expression was triumphant as she paused and looked back. Oh, well done, General. You should know that after inhaling the dust, our little half-wolf will be in heat within the hour. I trust you'll be a good mate to her, Tamlane. Make Oberon proud. With a final cold smile, she disappeared from view. The portal snapped shut with a crackle, and an ominous silence fell across the clearing as Tamlane and I stared at each other in shock. Eighteen. With dawning horror, my hand dropped to my belly, where the heavy warmth was spreading outward moving steadily throughout my body. Heat, she'd said. As a female shifter, I was subject to heat cycles, but I'd never had one. It wasn't unusual for the cycles to begin only once they'd been triggered by finding a mate. My mate bond had been damaged the moment it appeared, so I'd been able to enjoy my new adulthood without the strain of undergoing mating cycles. Until now, apparently. The dust must have been imbued with some sort of magical property that forced my body to begin the process. No, I gasped, wrapping my arms tightly around my stomach, as though such a simple denial could stop what was happening. Oh, Tamlane said blankly. I'll admit I did not foresee this. I stared at him, wondering how he could remain so calm, and simultaneously wanting to smack him for it. For the first time in what felt like days, my simmering anger entirely vanished. Now the only emotion I was trying to control was a very primal kind of fear. I'd never done this before. And if childhood gossip was to be believed, in the absence of a mate to satisfy me, the experience would be akin to physical and emotional torture. To make things even worse, the bond with Kai had sprung to life right after the dust began to take effect. Unthinkingly, I tugged the front of my shirt away from my chest and glanced down. 
Impossibly, the triangular fate mark had reappeared in the exact shape and location as before. It was as though Bardolph had never burned it out in the first place. How could this be? Panic welled, pushing me to the breaking point. Only the knowledge of what would happen if I succumbed to my fear allowed me to keep control over the power flowing through me, threatening to spill out in the form of destruction. Thankfully, with practice, it was becoming easier to keep it within my command. Otherwise, this would have meant chaos back on Earth when my control shattered. I couldn't allow that. I could not. Pavia's actions make no sense. Tamlane was still staring at me, his expression intense. After a long moment, he turned back to the tree and finished tying his sash to the branch. Unless... Unless what? I asked, my voice cracking from the strain. I have a theory. Gods above, I was going to strangle the man. Okay, I prompted. Such a magical attack might be logical, but only if Oberon believes that mating you will seal the protection for the world that your mate inhabits. Perhaps forging that connection with a Fey ensures you cannot become a danger to the Fey realm. I stared at him. That's crazy. He only raised an eyebrow, and the desire to punch the expression off his smug Fey face now warred with the desire to lick him. Not good. Is it? He asked. It would also explain why Pavia, or rather Geneva as you know her, worked so hard to prevent you from mating that shifter whelp whose fate mark you carry. If you had, your power would be primarily linked to Earth, and only Elfheim would be in peril. That would make you worse than useless for Oberon's plans. It would make you an active threat. I probably would have been super interested in hearing all this, about 15 minutes ago. Now, Tamlane's detached, scientific interest in my shifter mating biology was too much. Within minutes, the insatiable lust of a heat cycle would take over my body. I'd be helpless with the instinctive need to mate. I would need relief more than I needed to breathe the air around me, and the only one present to help was Tamlane. Tamlane, the gorgeous and powerful fay who had fascinated my inner wolf from the very beginning. These thoughts made the heat in my stomach spread like wildfire. I couldn't do this. I needed, with terrible immediacy, not to be here with this man. The thought of seeing him pull away in disgust when I threw myself at him was unbearable. Mindless instinct shrieked at me to escape. Wide-eyed, I whirled away from him and ran, shifting into a wolf form mid-stride. Clothing ripped and tore. I struggled free of it and ran blindly around the massive tree, disappearing into the dark, mist-shrouded woods. Light flashed behind me, and my animal senses picked up the sound of another wolf hot on my trail. I longed to turn around to meet him. Instead, I ran faster. In the tiny part of my mind that was still my own, I knew that I needed to get far, far away from Tamlane. If he was right about this, I would have to ride out my first heat in solitude or risk playing straight into Oberon's hands. The urge to turn around and throw myself at Tamlane's glowing white wolf form was nearly all-consuming. With my instincts at war, I did the only thing that my wolf knew to do in such a moment. I kept running. So did he. We ran together through the shadowy woods. On some level, I knew Tamlane's magical prowess could have ended the chase at any time. Perhaps he sensed my need to expend some of the nervous energy that was coursing through my body. Whatever the case, he let me run, my paws flying over the uneven terrain. I could sense him right behind me, nipping at my heels. Eventually, though, his patience wore out. The glowing white wolf surged forward, shouldering into me. We had been running at such a great speed that we crashed together through the trees, our bodies rolling together in a tangle. The wind was knocked clean out of my lungs as we came to a stop, but I fought to get my paws back underneath me. Tamlane seized me by the back of the neck and pressed me to the ground, growling softly against my fur. The hunger inside of me sparked to life. His warm body pressed on top of mine, holding me down as I writhed against him. Without warning, the pressure let up, and he transformed back into a man. His strong arms wrapped around my wolf form, 
preventing me from immediately fleeing again. I'm not having this conversation with an animal, he said, grunting with strain as I tried to wriggle free. Shift. Back. The moonlit clearing where we had crashed was warm. The fragrance of flowers hung over the bushes and mossy earth where we had fallen together. I whined, afraid of what would happen if I changed form. Panic was lurking beneath the desire. Would I be able to control it? I'm here, little wolf. Tamlane murmured, sending a frisson of need down my spine. All will be well. I will not allow it to be otherwise. Just... please. We need to make a plan while you're still able. I closed my eyes and pulled inward, reaching for my human skin and realizing too late that I would reappear naked beneath him. And so I did, face down on the soft cushion of moss with his strength pinning me in place. The sensation was delicious, but I didn't have a chance to stop and enjoy it. Tears trickled down my face as the blazing heat under my skin became unbearable. Please, I begged, pressing my body against his. I wanted his clothes off so that I could feel his hot skin against my back. Would I be able to feel the tingle of his magic between us, flesh to flesh? Tamlane's grip gentled, his weight lifting away from me. His large hand settled against the center of my back, a reminder not to flee. I couldn't bring myself to turn and look at him. I don't know what to do, I whispered as the tears streamed down my face. I'm a virgin, and I've never done this before. His hand moved away quickly. Ah, he said. Of course. Your mate bond was destroyed. Stupid of me. I had assumed... The words cut off with a sharp huff. Never mind. If only my mate bond had been destroyed. Instead, it was wide awake and throbbing like a fresh wound inside me. Tamlane moved to crouch in front of me. My fingers gouged furrows in the mossy earth beneath me as I clutched at it to prevent myself from fleeing or shifting again. I forced myself to look up at him, but I couldn't speak. I was lying in a naked heap on the ground, within arm's reach of the most beautiful creature I had ever seen, and my hormones were raging. Slick heat pulsed between my thighs. My head swam. Worst of all, through the throbbing connection with Kai, I could tell that he was aware of the change in me. I was sure I could feel his answering arousal ghosting through our bond, even though we were in different realms. In some part of my frenzied brain, I could sense that he'd gotten to his feet and was pacing restlessly back and forth, frustrated anger blazing inside of him. I shook my head sharply, trying to clear it. Please don't leave me like this, I begged. Please help me. It hurts. For the first time since I had known him, Tamlane appeared completely caught off guard by events. My frustration and terror spilled over the wind rising around me. Ember, he said, that single word reminding me yet again of everything that was at stake. Keeping my powers under control was like trying to hold water cupped in my hands while also missing a few fingers. But after a few deep breaths, the wind died down. My stomach lurched at the thought of the devastation I might have just caused on Earth. Tamlane seemed to read my mind. It was only for a moment. It's all right, little wolf. Perhaps you spawned a thunderstorm on Earth. That's all. I squeezed my eyes shut and nodded, hoping desperately that he was right. I can't fix this with magic, said the Fay. His warm hand closed on my bare shoulder. So strong, I thought hazily. His hands were calloused. I wondered what they would feel like, trailing up my legs. After hours had passed in an endless, hazy cycle of need and release, the compulsion began to ease. In its place came bone-deep exhaustion. With a final moan, I went limp, curling onto my side in the starlight. A soft rustle of shifting cloth came from behind me, and I felt the heat of a body as Tamlane seated himself next to me, a few careful inches of space between us. Tamlane? I slurred scooting back until my spine rested against his thigh. Yes? He asked. What is it, little wolf? 
I swallowed and licked my lips. Thank you. He said nothing, and before long, sleep stole across my awareness. I wasn't sure if the feeling of rough fingers stroking my hair away from my face was real, or my imagination. Nineteen. Consciousness returned slowly. First, before I ever opened my eyes, I could feel soft, fragrant moss underneath me. Was I back in the Greystalker Packlands? But that didn't seem right. All of my memories were jumbled together, nothing making clear linear sense. Oh, wait. I remembered the storms, the revelation of Geneva's betrayal, and Darby being captured. A series of flashing images from the day before assaulted my brain. I remembered Geneva's magic powder and my spontaneous heat. I remembered Tamlane's dutiful assistance, even though my humiliating condition had seemed to disgust him. He hadn't let me suffer, but my heat hadn't touched him as a male. Shame pressed heavily on my soul. I moaned and stirred fitfully, my body still hot and aching. Try to rest a low voice murmured nearby. My eyes flew open and I looked around the clearing, not having sensed Tamlane's presence nearby. At first the bright sun blinded me, and I wondered how I'd managed to sleep through its piercing light. When I could finally focus my eyes, I saw the Fae sitting upright and regal on a large boulder a few feet away. He looked neat and composed, in contrast to my perfect representation of a hot mess. Even his hair was smooth and sleek, though my grasping hands had pulled at his intricate braids like they'd been all that was tethering me to the world. Clapping those same hands over my face to hide the stain of embarrassment on my cheeks, I rolled over and groaned. How am I supposed to rest? I asked, my voice muffled by the moss. That was awful. It had been awful and wonderful. Gods above, somebody please kill me now. Tamlane's reply was hesitant. Well, I suppose Fay and Shifters differ in what is, um, pleasurable to them. I didn't realize, but I'm sure that there are biological differences between... When I finally realized what he was jabbering about, I pushed myself up and glared at him from my undignified spot on the ground, sticks and leaves no doubt tangled in my hair. Tamlane, I said holding up my hand. Stop, please, just stop. He looked nearly as embarrassed as I felt, which was saying something under the circumstances. I groaned again. It's not that it wasn't, uh, good. I started, pushing myself to my feet and feeling sore muscles scream in protest. It's just that, well, oh, never mind. So lame, I thought, cringing inwardly. Way to play things cool there, Ember. As I tried to brush the mud and dirt from my aching body, I realized I was wearing Tamlane's gray linen tunic. He must have slipped it onto me after I fell asleep. Although my imagination temporarily went into overdrive picturing that moment, I couldn't afford to dwell on it. I might have wanted it to be a tender gesture, but it was more likely he was just repelled by my nakedness. Thank you for this, I said plucking at the long garment. And for everything else, too. He nodded in acknowledgement and didn't answer. I was grateful to him, but mostly, I never wanted to speak of the incident again. I'm going to bathe in the river, then I'll need my own clothes back, please, I said, turning and walking through the trees. Of course, Tamlane said. The face stayed nearby but out of sight giving me privacy while I undressed and lowered myself into the stream. The water was icy cold, easing the pain radiating through me from head to toe. I shivered as I plunged my head below the surface and scrubbed my tangled, matted hair with my fingers. It took me a good ten minutes to pluck out all the debris and pull apart all the tangles. By the time I was done, I was shivering violently, and every joint was stiff from the cold. I climbed out and lay on the fresh, clean grass in a patch of warm sun. This place that had seemed so dark and threatening at night was a lot more agreeable in daylight, happily. It seemed rude to use Tamlane's borrowed tunic as a towel, so I air-dried instead. 
Letting the water evaporate off of my naked body took longer than I thought. By the time I was dry, my skin was warm and pink beneath the sun. I stood up and called for Tamlane, my bi-colored hair tickling my shoulders in the breeze. He came walking through the trees, glancing at me and quickly away. I saw him swallow hard and wave his hand through the air. My clothes rematerialized over my body, yet again. What was this? The third time he'd done that? The fourth? I wrapped my arms around myself, feeling the familiar fabric against my skin. Thanks, I breathed in relief. You're welcome. Tamlane replied neutrally. He still looked slightly awkward, but was obviously fighting to keep his voice normal. Come, we must move on. Move on? I asked, falling into step beside him. We aren't meeting Deanthe at the tree? Its location and significance have been compromised. We can't risk remaining here. Pavia or Geneva, if you prefer, will probably return at some point to see if her mission was accomplished. I wish I understood what that mission was, I muttered, irritation bleeding through in my voice. I think the theory is fairly straightforward, Tamlane observed. I shot him a side-eyed glance, pushing aside a bush as we walked through the trees under the bright sunshine. Is it really? Tamlane sighed. I'm sorry. I should explain from the beginning. Yes, that would be helpful. I agreed, making no real attempt to hide my sarcasm. Geneva meant for us to mate last night. I sent him an incredulous look. Yes, I already got that part. Thanks. Tamlane let out a huff of frustration. When two shifters mate, a strong psychic connection forms. This connection is powerful enough to transcend the physical realm and leech into the spiritual realm. Fae are not exactly the same, but we still form deep bonds. By mating me, it's possible you would have formed a connection to all of Elfheim, channeled through my psychic connection to this realm. So our bond would live within us and also within this world? I asked, my eyebrows furrowed in confusion. Exactly. I believe Oberon is counting on such a bond protecting our world from your powers since a part of you would be one with Elfheim. You do not harm yourself during those outbursts of energy. That's why you can withstand the wind and earthquakes unharmed. Thinking back to the first big storm that had developed around me on Earth, I remembered standing firm as things were destroyed, my hair flying, but my feet planted beneath me while other people were tossed around like dolls. Holy shit, that's true, I whispered. Tamlane shook his head. The storm is around you, not within you. The emotions pull the two realms into each other, but you are not crushed between them. The reverse of that is kind of how I control it. It's hard, though, like trying to hold back a hundred sneezes at once. Tamlin huffed and pushed his way through some thick undergrowth. Sneezes? Little wolf? Perhaps we should work on your similes. I scowled at him. We walked in silence for several long minutes, each of us absorbed in our own thoughts. Tamlane's theory made a certain amount of sense, but there were still holes where the picture didn't seem complete. I shook my head. Despite his insight into Oberon's state of mind, I still felt woefully in the dark. It doesn't make sense, I admitted, continuing the conversation as if we hadn't just walked in silence for such a distance. Not completely, Tamlane shrugged. It's just a theory, although it's one in which I'm reasonably confident. I expect you're probably right. I stated, but what does this have to do with me as a weapon? Isn't that Oberon's ultimate goal? Yet, having me form a mate bond would make me... My voice trailed away, and I felt the flush erupt across my cheeks again. I busied myself brushing some stray burrs off of my clothing as if this could cover up the awkward moment. Tamlane took my shoulder and stopped walking, turning to face me. I couldn't meet his piercing, beautiful eyes. What? It would make you... What? He asked. I don't know, I said, raising my hands and letting them fall back to my sides. I was going to say happy, but that's stupid. I was just thinking that if I was content... I wouldn't make a very good weapon when my powers are fueled by rage and fear. His brow furrowed. 
I pushed past him, not wanting to continue this conversation. He let me go, silence again stretching between us as we walked. This time it was Tamlane who broke it. He still has your friend, he said in a low voice. I threw him a sharp look, but he was right. Of course he was right. The crux of it all is that with you bound to this world in such a deep and permanent way, Oberon believes that your powers would protect this land while still allowing him to decimate Earth. He continued. My stomach soured. I wasn't quite ready to admit his theory about mating was correct, but it was still a horrific thought. I'll never escape his slavery, will I? I asked quietly. Not while I'm alive anyway. That is yet to be seen. Tamlane replied. I didn't want to face this next part. What does all of this mean for Darby? I don't know. Not exactly. I grabbed Tamlane's forearm and pulled him around with a snarl. Although I was several inches shorter than him, the ferocity of my grip yanked him to within a few inches of my face. You're lying by omission, Faye. I snapped, the air around me starting to whip my hair past my face. Again. I reeled in my power before it could escape my control. There seemed to be more of it to hold back each time I tried. While the wind faded to nothing within seconds, I maintained the grip on Tamlane's arm, my fingers digging in like claws. No more secrets, I said flatly. Just tell me. But Tamlane was examining me with a thoughtful frown. His eyes dipped to my hand on his bicep. Your powers continue to grow. You are becoming stronger with each day that passes. But I wasn't ready to be distracted. Tell me about Darby! His lips thinned. Oberon's mind is twisted and dark. I fear once you are in his power, he will torture your friend in such a way that it will make you lose control entirely. I gritted my teeth, jerking my head in a swift nod of understanding. I'd asked, and he hadn't pulled any punches. It wasn't as though his answer was unexpected. Why does my power impact the other realm more than the one I'm currently in? I said, trying to distract myself from horrible thoughts about my friend. I cannot answer with certainty. I glared at him darkly. Have a guess. Tamlane sighed. You are entirely unique, Ember. My guess is that it's because you are part of both realms, but not fully connected to either one. Keep talking, I said. I am Faye. Tamlane explained. Elfame is my home as well as a part of me. My power grew from this world, but you. You are both Fae and Shifter, not fully belonging to either world. You are a piece of both, but your connection shifts depending on which place you currently reside. Right now you are on Elfame, so your connection to Elfame takes precedence. When you pull the realms together, the same power that protects your physical body also offers a degree of protection to the world with which you're more connected in that moment. You've really considered this at length, haven't you? I said. He eyed me cautiously. It was a long night. A fresh surge of blood rushed to my cheeks, heating them. The idea that this whole thing was somehow linked to my pathetic sex life was unbearable. Doubly so, when something new occurred to me. Tamlane had been desperate to save Elfheim. So desperate, in fact, that he'd insisted on bringing me to his world, despite the obvious danger of having me in the same realm as Oberon. And what if Oberon had been right about the mating bond? Tamlane could potentially have saved his entire world and all of his people by mating with me last night. Had he taken me and claimed me as his own, Elfheim might have been protected from my powers for good. Why had he refused? It didn't seem consistent with the cold-blooded, self-sacrificing soldier I was coming to know. I couldn't make sense of it. As I allowed Tamlane to resume walking, leading me further into the darkness of the trees, I studied his back. Was I really that repulsive to him? Crap. Emotions swirled inside of me. Confusion and hurt. Yes, I was attracted to Tamlane, damn it and not in a just recovering from a chemically induced heat sort of way either. My wolf had been intrigued since the moment she scented him. That sense of connection had only grown as time went on. He'd stuck by me too, even when I was crawling all over him trying to get him to mate with me. 
If ever there was a time to abandon his mission to keep me out of Oberon's hands, that would have been it. Yet he hadn't. He hadn't mated with me, true. But he also hadn't run screaming for the hills. The pain of rejection combined with gratitude for the help he had given me, warred in my chest. As I wrestled my emotions back into obedience, the mate bond that was supposed to have been destroyed throbbed painfully awake. Oh yeah, I thought sourly. And then, there's that. I can hear you thinking, little wolf. Tamlane's resigned voice called back to me. Why don't you simply ask your questions rather than choking on them? I blinked, looking up to find Tamlane some distance in front of me. Evidently, my pace had slowed to a crawl as I mulled my growing collection of problems. Why didn't you mate me last night? I blurted before I could lose my nerve. He stood completely still for a moment, then retraced his steps to stand in front of me. Why would you ask such a thing? His tone was wary. I shook my head in frustration. Just listen. If it's true that mating me would have protected Elfheim, he blinked down at me. That's only a theory. You're convinced it's true, I accused. You had an opportunity to seal protection around your world. All you had to do was mate with me, and that would have been it. Why did you hold back? Fear? Disgust? Why? My voice wavered. Tamlane's lips curled back, showing gleaming white teeth that could have easily pierced the skin of my neck to seal our bond. You demanded that I be truthful with you, yes? His eyes burned. Yes, I said emphatically, while thinking maybe I didn't want to know the truth after all. Tamlane regarded me, forcing his expression back to its normal, cool facade. I have learned that you do better with the truth. So, tell me, I insisted. He drew breath and paused before speaking. You were forced into heat by means of magic. It wasn't natural. You could not give consent, and though I may be a killer when it's called for, I am not a rapist. Yet, I could not bear to watch you suffer, so I aided in what way I could, but without tying you to me permanently. I stayed silent, digesting his words. Also, he continued, it would have played straight into Oberon's hands. I will not give Elfheim's Mad King a weapon to cause havoc across other worlds. But, I began only to be cut off by a sharp shake of his head. My loyalty may be to Elfheim, but that doesn't mean I'm ready to stand by and watch Earth be destroyed and subjugated. No, I could not give him that power. He really was the most bizarrely noble creature sometimes, I reflected. I still had trouble believing it wasn't some sort of act that he put on. It couldn't be, though. Not when the stakes were so high. At that exact moment, an idea struck me from out of the blue terrible and wonderful in its simplicity. What is it? He asked, frowning at me. You've gone pale. Nothing, I replied quickly. It's nothing. Let's keep going. Thank you for, uh, for answering my questions. As we walked, I clenched my fists at my sides, trying to think things through. Would it be possible? And could it really be so simple? I couldn't answer my own questions. The idea that had so forcefully knocked its way into my brain was essentially the reverse of Oberon's plan. If he could bind me to Elfheim by forcing me to mate with someone here and thereby protect his world from my powers, then logically, I could mate with someone on Earth so that Elfheim would be the only world in jeopardy. If I were mated to someone from Earth, then Oberon wouldn't dare harm Darby. Doing so would risk destroying his own realm. He'd have to let her go to appease me. I could threaten him, tell him that I would unleash the full wrath of my powers against Elfheim if he didn't immediately release her and return her safely to Earth. Any attempt to manipulate me would immediately be turned against him. I couldn't let Tamlane know about my idea, though. Just because he didn't want to mate me if it meant Earth's destruction, that wasn't to say he'd stand by quietly while I put his world at risk instead. I needed to figure this out on my own. So I allowed my mind to wander down the path of this new possibility. As far as I was concerned, Kai could fall into a deep, dark pit 
and rot there for all I cared, even if my inner wolf whimpered at the idea. If I were going to mate, it would have to be someone else. But who? I wasn't any keener on the other male shifters I'd grown up with than I was on Kai. It didn't have to be my pack, though, did it? It could be, well, anyone, really. This might even be an opportunity for a fresh start. If I was really going to do this, I would have to find passage back to Earth without Tamlane's help. There was no way he would go along with this plan voluntarily. As he'd said earlier, his first loyalty was to Elfheim and his people. It always would be. No, Tamlane would never agree to this. I'd have to sneak back somehow and hope that Darby could hold on a little longer until I could find someone who would be willing to mate with me. As we continued walking into a part of the forest that appeared to be growing rockier, I tried to come up with some cover story for returning to Earth, especially after I had insisted on coming to Elfheim in the first place. If only I'd thought of this plan yesterday. If only I'd known. Eventually, Tamlane slowed. We're here, he said, the first time either of us had spoken in nearly an hour. I glanced around, confused. Okay? Uh, what's here exactly? He jerked his chin toward the jagged cliff face to our left, leading me toward an outcrop of rock that stood about ten feet high. On the ground in front of it lay a small ring of stones, half buried in the dirt. It appeared to be an old fire pit, long disused and abandoned. I wouldn't have even noticed it if I hadn't tripped on one of the stones. Tamlane, this is even less sheltered than the tree was, I pointed out. Not inside he said, and slipped out of sight. From my position by the fire ring, it almost looked like he disappeared. Frowning, I walked around the face of the rock until I reached the place where Tamlane had vanished. The rock wall was smooth, except for a bundle of vines draping from the top of the outcrop down to the forest floor. Tamlane? I called uncertainly. His face appeared through a gap in the vines. They were not growing against the rock face, as it had first appeared. Instead, they efficiently camouflaged a split in the stone, just wide enough for someone to shimmy through if they pushed the vines aside. Wow, I said, after I'd squeezed inside to find a small cave with a soft dirt floor. There was a second fire ring inside that looked much more recently used than the one outside. In an alcove near the back, a small stash of supplies was visible, blankets and cooking vessels. Okay, I take it all back. I leaned against the wall, searching for a way to bring up my need to return to Earth without giving away my plan. So, I've been thinking, I began, only to be cut off by an electric crackle a few feet behind me. I whirled around as a travel portal opened right inside the cave. Deanthe stepped through it, her face grim as she glanced around and registered our presence. Cousin, what is it? Tamlane demanded. You obviously have news. What have you learned? Deanthe took a deep breath, her eyes falling on me. I couldn't read her expression, but something about it made my stomach dip. I've received word from one of my contacts in the palace, she said. Oberon has issued a new decree. Ember is to appear in the public square before dusk tomorrow. Otherwise, he will publicly torture and execute the shifter female known as Darby Adelwolf. My eyes slid closed in horror the breath exiting my lungs in a rush. 